It seems the production skill acquired in another world is the strongest. Volume 3 Prologue. Here's the chapter. Enjoy. Ed. Blast. Prologue. Departure from Seria. One day, I, Kokosaka, was suddenly transferred to another world. With the help of the creation and dexterity cheat skills I was given at that time, my life as an adventurer began to develop, and then a major incident occurred. The Black Dragon of Extreme Destruction. The existence that drove the ancient civilization of this world to extinction 4,000 years ago, the Calamity, has resurrected. I managed to defeat it and received a commendation from the Adventurer's Guild headquarters in the Royal Capital, and I left the city of Un with Iris, a dragon folk female adventurer. Our journey was fraught with trouble, with the appearance of a devil treant in the city of Tu and another great calamity with the gluttonous dragon in the city of Surya both of which we somehow managed to defeat after fierce battles, especially in the battle against the gluttonous dragon, it was thanks to the help of Lily, a priestess of the god of war religion and a god of war's shrine maiden, the damage was reduced to zero. It was truly an unquestionably happy ending. A few days later than originally planned, we were leaving the city of Syria. Many people came to see us off at the city gate, including Count Maillard, the lord of the city, and Gal a D-rank adventurer. We were very grateful to them, even though they must have been very busy. I will never forget what you did for us. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you ever need anything, you can always count on us. Count Maillard said and held out his right hand to me. I shook his hand and replied. Thank you for your concern. By the way, will you be at the awards ceremony in the royal capital? Of course. I will be there. I have to tell His Majesty the King about your heroism. As soon as I am ready, I will leave immediately." Count Maillard replied with a smile on his face. After shaking hands with the Count, a wheat-skinned female adventurer girl, called out to me from the side. See you later, Kukai. Don't forget about me. Yeah, you too. Of course. You really make an impact, don't you, Kukai? I mean, you're the god of impact, you know that? Even if we have amnesia, we'll still remember you. Something like that? No, that's excessive, isn't it? No. That's just how it is. You think so too, don't you, Iron? A. Iris was standing right next to me, but she didn't expect the conversation to turn to her, and for a moment, she sounded puzzled. By the way, Iron is a nickname Cal gave her. Well, yes. Iris replied with a small nod. Ku does some pretty spectacular things everywhere he goes, and he makes a big impact. I was really surprised when he summoned the Black Dragon. Come to think of it, there was a time when that happened. In the battle against the gluttonous dragon, I used their, calamity summoning, skill to summon the black dragon of extreme destruction. The situation of a former strong enemy fighting with you as a friend. Is a typical situation in anime and manga, but it is still very heartwarming. When I was thinking about this, the back of my left hand became hot for a moment, and a crest that looked like a frontal image of a dragon's face floated up and then vanished. I felt it as if the black dragon was saying to me, I am looking forward to working with you in the future. I am glad to work with you too. I called out to the black dragon inwardly while turning my gaze to the back of my left hand. Our means of transportation was a huge carriage called the Grand Cabin. Its overall length exceeded 15 meters, giving it the appearance of a mobile fortress. Normally, more than 10 horses would be needed to move such a large carriage, but in my case, I had solved the problem by other means. We're leaving. Dest's voice echoes from outside the Grand Cabin. Dest is a kind of nickname, and his official name is the Destroyer Golem. He was now integrated with the Grand Cabin by Golem Combined Eggs and was acting as a substitute for the horse. About 30 minutes after we left Surya, we gathered in the living room on the first floor to discuss our future plans. Our next stop is Fort Port, right? It was Lily, sitting on the sofa across from me who first spoke up. She was holding Zurara, the helper slime, in her lap and hugging him tightly as if he were her favorite stuffed animal. She looked like a little girl and was quite adorable. If I had a younger sister or daughter, she might be like this. Yeah. I nodded and answered. The next stop after Surya is the port town of Fort Port. From there, we'll take a boat to the royal capital. Wow, a boat trip. Zurara shouted happily. Have you ever been on a ship before, Zurara? No. It's my first time. Well, of course, it is. Zurara was born 4,000 years ago, during the time of an ancient civilization. Until this trip, he had been in the underground city, so this would be his first time on a boat. Swing, 
swing. The boat is going to swing, swing, swing. Zurara's eyes twinkled as he hummed an impromptu song. Just looking at his innocent appearance is enough to make you feel relaxed. Foo foo. To my left, Iris was smiling. She was probably thinking the same thing I was. There are two main routes from Surya to Fort Port. One island a direct route through the mountains and forests, and the other is roundabout route that goes through several inn towns while veering off to the west. Since there is a ferry schedule from Fort Port to the royal capital, we decided to take the direct route this time. Since there were no inn towns along the way, we stayed overnight at the Grand Cabin. The Grand Cabin is fully equipped with a bath and kitchen and Zurara, a slime, takes care of everything for us. It's a perfect place to stay. Since we are the only ones on board, we don't have to worry about other guests. It was the ultimate comfort. When it was getting late, we decided to go to bed to prepare for the next day. Good night, then. Until tomorrow, Ku. Good night, Kusan. See you later, Master San. There are three bedrooms in the grand cabin, one for me, one for Iris and the last one for Lily and Zurara. I went into my bedroom and lay down on the bed, but my eyes were still somewhat dim. I had been lying around for about 30 minutes, but I didn't feel sleepy at all. Dot maybe I should experiment with my skills. After the last battle, I have acquired two new skills, the first is their, spatial manipulation, and the second is their, limit break. Since I have the time, why don't I try out the effects of these skills? Okay. Let's do it. I made up my mind and jumped out of bed. In my mind, I open their, item box, and select full battle gear. A blinding light enveloped my entire body, and in an instant, my armor was equipped. My body was covered in layers of armored bear armor and a Fenra coat, and both of my arms were protected by black spider gauntlets. The gauntlet on my left arm was half destroyed during the battle with the gluttonous dragon but it was now completely restored to its original state. It seemed that weapons and armor created by, creation, were automatically restored when stored in their, item box. What a convenient feature. Now that I had finished changing my clothes, I was ready to leave. It would be nice to leave the room normally. But wait. There, spatial manipulation, is the power that I took away from the gluttonous dragon and by consuming magical power, I can interfere with space and cause a variety of events. One of them is short-range warp. It is a skill that twists space and allows one to move to another location in an instant. Let's try going outside with warp. When I mutter this, there, full assist, automatically activates, and a voice echoes in my brain. Short distance warp by, spatial manipulation is performed. Please specify the destination from within your field of vision. I opened the bedroom curtains and looked out the window. This is a hilltop with a great view, a short distance from the street. A full moon shines in the sky, and the wind gently caresses the grass. It was a perfect night for a walk. I set a spot about 20 meters away from the grand cabin and activated, spatial manipulation. I felt my body float and my vision was momentarily distorted. I was standing on a grassy field. Looking back, I saw the grand cabin parked at the top of a hill. Ahead of me, I could also see Dest, which had dismounted. Dest is a magical weapon and does not require sleep. This makes him a perfect night watchman. He has been acting as the horse of the grand cabin for the entire trip, and I would like to give him credit for that at some point. Dest seems to have noticed my appearance, leaves the grand cabin and walks over to me. Master, are you going out? Yeah, I'm going for a walk. Understood. Please enjoy your walk. Dest saluted me and saw me off. The way he moves is very human-like, and I chuckled to myself. While I was walking on the grassland for a while, 30 seconds had passed, which is the cool-down time for spatial manipulation. After that, I tried several short-distance walks but the maximum distance I could warp was about 30 meters. It seems that I can warp quite a distance. I felt like I was getting something out of this. While I was thinking about this, I heard the inorganic voice of, full assist. I have created shortcuts for the three abilities included in, spatial manipulation. Thereafter, you can activate each of the abilities by reminding them under the names of, short distance warp, invisibility, and, spatial restraint. Oh, wow, as expected of, full assist, he is an excellent assistant. It may be a minor change, but on the battlefield, a split second difference can mean the difference between life and death. In that sense, it is quite an important change. Now, let's see. So much for the verification of, short distance warp. Let's try, 
invisibility, next. This is the ability to slip through enemy attacks by distorting space. If possible, I would like to try this out in a real battle, but I wonder if there are any monsters around. Share. Oops, as luck would have it, I heard the cry of a monster. Since I'm here, I'll let it accompany me in my invisibility experiment. I focused my attention on my ears and activated Armored Bear Armor's granted effect. Hearing enhancement day. I picked up the surrounding noises and headed for the monster's location. It was in a forest a little off the main road. After running through the dense foliage, I eventually came to an open area. Kisha. There, a huge scorpion was waiting for me. It was about the size of a light truck. It had sharp scissors on its left and right front legs from which lightning bolts were gushing out. It looked quite strong. I activate, appraisal. White scorpion, a large scorpion-shaped monster. It is highly intelligent, ferocious, and brutal. It can shoot lightning bolts from its left and right shears. The paralyzing venom secreted from its tail is extremely powerful, so be careful. It is at odds with the black spider and is sometimes seen fighting with it. The eyes of the white scorpion turn toward me with a glare. Then, Raising the shears on either side, it roars violently, its entire body filled with murderous intent. Shear. It's incredibly loud. Why is this white scorpion so excited? Is it because of my equipment? The gauntlets on both of my arms are made of black spider. As for white scorpion, it may be under the illusion that an irreconcilable rival has appeared. Well, never mind. It's convenient for me that the white scorpion is turning against me. I can experiment with. Invisibility. Kisha. The white scorpion closed the distance with the speed of a gale, lifted its tail, and delivered a series of stings like a torrential downpour. Dot it's pointless. I activated, invisibility. As a result, my entire body becomes translucent, and all the white scorpion stabs slip through. Dot I wonder what in the world is the principle of this. According to the explanation of, full assist, by manipulating space. It creates a state of being here but not being here. Dot I see. I don't understand. Anyway, I was now in a kind of invincible state. The white scorpion had given up attacking with its tail and now fired lightning bolts from its left and right shears. However, it only passed through my body and scattered the trees behind me. At this point, about three seconds have passed, and my MP is down to just over half. The maximum duration of invisibility is about six seconds. Next. Let's try, spatial restraint, dot I was going to try it, but, I changed my plans a little, the reason is that a girl was lying by a tree a short distance away, she did not seem to have any noticeable external injuries, but she was unconscious, if she has been poisoned by the white scorpion's paralyzing venom, she should be treated as soon as possible, in order to do that, I first need to get rid of the white scorpion in front of me, sorry, but I'm going to have to end this now, I open my, item box, and take out the magic sword gram from there. <laughs> then, in one fluid motion, I slashed at white scorpion with a single vertical slash. One then two slashes, the white scorpion splits in half and dies. Its corpse vanished in a flash due to the effect of, automatic collection. It was a trivial enemy. I put gram back in my, item box, and headed for the girl. The girl is still unconscious lying on her back on the ground. She was probably around 17 or 18 years old. Her clothes are undisturbed, and she has no noticeable injuries. Her face was beautifully shaped, and her long golden hair glistened in the moonlight. If I had to sum up the overall impression in one word, I would say that she is a young lady or a princess. Clearly, she did not have the air of a commoner. She was of certain status. Are you alright? I asked shaking the girl's shoulder. She immediately opened her eyelids. Ara. After blinking a few times, she looked at me with deep blue eyes. Who are you? I'm just a passing adventurer. Are you okay? A. Yes. The girl slowly gets up as she answers. After looking around, she turned to me and said with a serious expression on her face. Kind adventurer, this place is dangerous. Leave me alone and run away. What's the matter, all of a sudden? A white scorpion is living in this forest. Even if you were an A-rank adventurer, you would not be able to defeat it alone. That's alright, then. I already defeated it, eh? The girl showed a bewildered look on her face. You're kidding, right? No, I'm not. I have the proof right here. I told her that and went to take out the white scorpion corpse from my, item box. Dot no, wait a minute. The corpse split in half on both sides is indeed too stimulating, isn't it? 
The other party is a young woman, so a milder method should be used. I thought about it for a moment and then activated, dismantle. The target is, of course, the corpse of White Scorpion. As a result, I got the shell, scissors, tail, and poison bag. Now, which of these would be the easiest to show as evidence of my subjugation? I would have to say the shears. When I pulled out a pair of White Scorpion shears from my item box, the girl's eyes rolled back in her head, and she let out a cry of surprise. This big, white pair of scissors surely belongs to White Scorpion. Do you believe me now? Yes. There is no doubt in my mind with this proof. The girl nodded and looked up at me. Adventurous Anne. I'm sorry to ask you this, but could it be that you are Kakauzika? Yes, I am. Dot have we met somewhere before? No, we have never met. I only know you unilaterally. I am sorry for the delay in introducing myself. My name is Letitia Demetia, and I am an A-rank adventurer. Please call me Letitia. With these words, the girl stood up picked up the skirt of her dress with both hands, lifted it lightly, and bowed. Her gesture was very refined and showed her good upbringing. I have heard about your past accomplishments, Kusama. Even though you have only been an adventurer for a short time, I hear that you have accomplished many great things. Perhaps the word hero refers to someone like you. That's an overstatement. I don't know what kind of stories you have heard but none of them were made possible by me alone. It was all thanks to the help of my friends. For example, the battle with the gluttonous dragon would have ended in a cruel defeat if it had been just me, Iris, Lily, and the tens of millions of souls that were sacrificed by the Elder Lich. I believe it was a victory supported by many things. Fufu. Letitia put her hand over her mouth and smiled. You are as humble as the rumors say. I love it. Dot is that so? I can't help but feel embarrassed when I am praised directly. I decided to change the subject while looking away from Letitia. By the way, why were you lying in such a place? Come to think of it, I haven't told you what happened. Have I? Letitia coughed and began to speak. The actual fact is, in the past few days, there have been a series of sightings of large monsters in the vicinity of this area. I was visiting the forest to investigate, and I'm ashamed to say that I was caught off guard by the white scorpion. So you were knocked unconscious? Yeah, something like that. Dot I see. I look at Letitia again as I give her my opinion. She is tall, with long, slender arms and legs. As for clothing. She is wearing a classy dress with green as its base color. It is a fashion that would not normally be appropriate for a forest inhabited by monsters, but it is strangely appropriate. A beautiful woman looks good no matter what she wears. However, there was one thing about the way she stood that that was not right. I asked her, choosing my words carefully. Is the white scorpion considered a strong monster? It's an A plus danger level and I think it would take at least eight A-rank adventurers to defeat it. If there are less than that number of adventurers, they will most likely just be eaten. Let me make one more confirmation. Letitia, are you physically injured? Please don't worry about me. I'm fine, as you can see. Letitia said that, and then she spun around on the spot with a graceful twirl. The hem of her skirt fluttered round. It was as if she was dancing. The way she moved, it was probably true that she was uninjured. If so, it was too unnatural. How could she have lost consciousness during the battle with the monster and not suffered a single wound? Moreover, the opponent was the white scorpion, a ferocious and brutal scorpion monster. To borrow Letitia's own words, she should have been eaten alive by now. With the utmost caution, I used appraisal on Letitia. But what echoed in my brain was a message I had never heard before. Error. The subject is presumed to be an existence that deviates from existing concepts. We will now move on to the analysis process. Ara. Letitia let out a small smile. You just used, appraisal, didn't you? Dot you can tell? I am very sensitive to the way people look at me. You are surprisingly forceful, Kusama, to want to uncover the secret of a woman you just met. Dot but, I'm not opposed to that kind of thing either. After saying that. Letitia approached me with a natural gait. I didn't move from that spot. I was, of course, still on high alert, but I didn't sense any hostility or murderous intent from her. As I expected of you, Kusama, you are not perturbed by this level of violence, are you? Letitia's face was right in front of mine. It was so close that we could feel each other's breath on our faces, but there was no such thing as a man and a woman's sweetness and tenderness. Please allow me to introduce myself. Letitia whispered. I'm Letitia Demetia, an A-rank adventurer, and I am a great calamity dragon summoned from the outside of this world, 
a natural enemy of all life, the bright and arrogant dragon. https colon slash slash nikes translation home dot files dot wordpress dot com slash two thousand and twenty two slash oh six slash oh 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 one four dot jpg. It seems the production skill acquired in another world is the strongest. Volume three chapter one sponsored chapter by Patreon. Enjoy Ed Blast Chapter One. I became acquainted with a blonde young lady, Letitia Demetia. When I met her in the forest at midnight, she told me that she herself was a great calamity dragon. In other words, she is the same kind of dragon that attacked Seria. Dot. Is this really true? As if to answer my question, full assist tells me in my mind. I will report on the progress of the analysis. Letitia Demetia's body is that of a human race, but it is presumed that she carries the soul of the great calamity, the bright and arrogant dragon. I see, to put it very roughly, she is a calamity in human skin. She looks like a beautiful woman, but inside she is a calamity. In my former world, there is a saying, a pretty rose has its thorns, but she has some rather dangerous thorns. Foo foo. I hope I didn't startle you. Letitia whispered in my ear with a mischievous look on her face. I, for my part, have no intention of antagonizing you. I will not attack the city or its people like other calamities. You can rest assured of that. Dot what do you mean? The mission of the calamity is to destroy this world. Dot but whether or not I follow it is another matter, isn't it? I'm 17 this year and a little late in my rebellion phase. Does this mean that she does not intend to engage in destructive activities like the black dragon and the gluttonous dragon? Of course, there is the possibility that this is an act to catch me off guard. But now, how do I judge it? Well, it is inevitable that she will be suspicious of me. Letitia said as if she had guessed what I was thinking. I have already lied about being attacked by the white scorpion and fainted, so I guess I deserved it. Please allow me to apologize for that. Can I ask you to tell me why you lied? It's that simple. If I told you that I was a calamity when we first met, you might misunderstand me as a crazy person, wouldn't you agree? Dot that may be true. Letitia's point was clear enough for me. I have been transferred from modern Japan to this world, but I don't reveal to others, saying that I have been living deep in the remote mountainous area. I don't know if people would believe me if I said I came from a different world. And in fact, there is a high possibility that they would question my sanity. In that sense, Letitia and I may have a similar thought process. Then why did you decide to reveal yourself? Dot it's a bit vague, though. Letitia told me hesitantly. I had a feeling that I had met Kusama somewhere in the distant past. I thought we had never met before. While answering that, I was still feeling a little strange. I had a strange feeling that I had exchanged words with Letitia before. Dot. This is what is known as deja vu. I would like to say it was just an illusion, but this kind of thing can be considered foreshadowing in anime and manga. In the meantime, it might be a good idea to keep this in mind. When the conversation came to a close, Letitia explained the circumstances leading up to her passing out in the woods. As I mentioned earlier, there have been a series of sightings of large monsters in this vicinity. I was visiting the forest to investigate. In the forest, she found a white scorpion and decided to challenge it to a fight. The white scorpion is a ferocious monster. If left unchecked, it could cause damage to neighboring towns and villages. Dot shouldn't we nip trouble in the bud as soon as possible? I certainly agree. As for me, I don't disagree with Letitia's opinion. In fact, I'm all for it. Early resolution of problems has been my policy since the days when I was busy dealing with the flames in Japan. It's just taking on white scorpion by yourself was a bit reckless, wasn't it? It takes eight A rank adventurers, doesn't it? Kusama, I am a calamity. There is no way I can be defeated by white scorpion. But you were unconscious when I came here. What happened? Dot actually. I don't know why. Letitia said this while shaking her head. Her expression was truly puzzled and she didn't look like she was lying. But just before I lost consciousness, I felt something like the pressure of another calamity from a short distance away. The presence was similar to that of the gluttonous dragon, but that dragon must have escaped to the outside of this world after being deeply wounded in the battle with Kusama. It is not possible for it to come back in such a short period. What in the world is happening? Maybe it's because I used spatial manipulation. That's the unique ability of the gluttonous dragon isn't it? Dot how did Kusama get it? I took it. Eh? My answer was unexpected to Letitia, and she was surprised. For now, I'll show her the proof. I activated one of the abilities included in spatial manipulation. 
invisibility. Do you believe me now? Yes, this is indeed their spatial manipulation of the gluttonous dragon. Ara, what's wrong? May I see your left hand for a moment? Yeah. I deactivated invisibility and held out my left hand. Then Letitia comes in with her hands on both sides. I can feel the presence of the black dragon from Kusama's hand. Could it be that you can also use their calamity summoning? How did you know? I have knowledge of what it means to be a calamity. There are three natural enemies of calamities. One is the hero with the dexterity, another is the sage with their magic ingenuity, and the last is the demon king with the calamity summoning. You have the calamity summoning. So you must be the demon king. No, I'm not. I shook my head. What comes back to my mind are the events that took place just before I was transferred to this world. Which role do you want to play? The hero, the sage, or the demon king? I was suddenly confronted with such a question. I chose the hidden option for none of the above, and as a result, I obtained a number of cheat skills, including creation. One of them includes dexterity. I've never heard of magic ingenuity. But then there, full assist, starts up, and information flows into my head. According to this, it seems that I am in possession of, magic ingenuity, at some point. The effect is that by wearing a ring that seals the dragon's power, you can freely handle magic of the corresponding attribute, and in my case, it is integrated into, full assist. In short, I have all the skills of a hero, a demon king, and a sage, respectively. When I told this to Letitia, she was completely speechless. She looked stunned for a while but eventually came to her senses and said to me, the hero, the demon king, and the sage possessing all three of these powers is something that would normally be impossible. You are truly an out of the ordinary being. Now I am very interested in you. Letitia continued to talk as she looked at me with curiosity. If it is all right with you, I would like to accompany you on your journey, Kusama. However, it's a sudden proposal, and if it's inconvenient, you can feel free to refuse, so, I don't mind, you know, what did you just say, it's getting late at night, and I'm worried about leaving a woman so deep in the mountains, shall we walk back to my carriage together, thank you very much, I would like to take your word for it, but, Kusama, are you sure about this, once again, I am a calamity, you don't mean to antagonize me, do you, of course not, I have decided that I will only point my fist at villains and monsters, she sounds like a righteous hero, I tell Letitia with a wry smile, if so, I have no problem with that, I'm looking forward to working with you, Fufu, what's wrong, I think you have a big heart, don't you, Kusama, I think you're very nice, that's an overstatement, I answered shortly, I was a little embarrassed because I had suddenly been praised, at that time, I heard the voice of, full assist, in my head, we agreed that Letitia Demetia accompanies you. Oops, it seems that, full assist, also came to the same conclusion as me. But on what basis? I'm a bit curious about this. And the words continue to be spoken further. If you have Letitia Demetia accompany you, you will be able to conduct a detailed analysis of the existence of the calamity. By using that information, we may be able to create an item with creation in the future that is equivalent to or even exceeds the Yggdrasil Bow as an anti-calamity item. This is a good thing to hear. The Yggdrasil Bow is known as the Bow of the Calamity Killer, and as its name implies, it is immensely powerful against calamities. However, to use it, the Arrow of the Calamity Killer is necessary, and according to Lily's foresight, the Arrow is summoned in exchange for her life. In the battle against the Gluttonous Dragon, the Arrow could be summoned by consuming Lily's magical power but that was because the bow's output was only at 20%, and if it were at 100%, for example, Lily's life might be sacrificed. For my part, I would like to avoid such a situation. If an item more powerful than the Drizzle bow could be created with, creation, then the whole problem would be solved. Let's hope for the results of the, full assist, analysis there. I decided to guide Letitia back to the grand cabin, and on the way, she told me about her background. I was born in a snowy country far north, across the sea. Believe it or not, I was the second princess. You mean you were a princess? Fufu, I'm a little embarrassed to hear you say that. Letitia continues her story with a smile on her face. I thought I was just a human being at first. I kept all my memories and the my powers as a calamity in the depths of my mind. But one day, five years ago, Letitia underwent a profound change. At the time, the king of her country was ill, 
and a battle was raging in the court for the right to succeed to the throne. Of course, Letitia had no intention of succeeding to the throne, but whether that mattered to those around her was another matter. On the day of her twelfth birthday, Letitia ate a poisoned cookie, which led to her spending three days and three nights on the verge of life and death. It was then that I remembered who I was. When Letitia realized that she was a calamity, her power overcame the poison, and she returned from the brink of death. She then denounced the second prince who had ordered to poison her cookies, and after eliminating him from the race for the throne, she decided to leave the country. Letitia was the second princess, right? How could someone of such high status leave her own country so easily? Originally, it would have been impossible. However, each calamity has its own unique abilities. In my case, there are several, and I used one of them. And what kind of ability is that? Dot I mean, can I ask you this? To rephrase my question, it would be, tell me your moves. Normally, it would have been understandable if she refused. But Letitia immediately responded, since you have accepted me to accompany you, I would like to share some information with you. One of my unique abilities is, domination, simply put, it's a kind of brainwashing. By infusing the dragon's factor into anything I touch, I can turn people and things into puppets. Does this mean that it can be used on non-living things? Yes. Let me demonstrate it to you. After saying this, Letitia reached out with her left hand and touched a tree that was nearby. I command you in my name. Let it wither and lose its branches and leaves. Many branches grew from the tree, and it was covered with numerous green leaves. But the moment Letitia gave the order, all the branches and leaves fell off at once. Dot that's roughly what happened. Incidentally, Letitia is now buried in the fallen leaves because she was standing at the base of the tree. Only her face is sticking out, which is quite a surreal sight. Perhaps she is more careless than I thought. Are you alright? When I said that and extended my right hand, Letitia replied with a mischievous expression on her face. Ara, aren't you afraid to touch me? I might use, domination, on you, Kusama. If you were going to use, domination, on me, you wouldn't have to go to the trouble of demonstrating and revealing your moves, would you? But there is a possibility that I might be trying to catch Kusama off guard. Well, I can't deny that possibility. But to begin with, domination, won't work on me. Dot seriously? Apparently, my words came as a big shock to Letitia. Her young lady's language seems to be falling apart a bit. Yeah, I'm serious. I nodded. In my mind, full assist was telling me this. We are currently analyzing, domination. Progress report, the arrogant dragon factor can be blocked by the, transmigrator, possessed by Kukauzuka. Dot Kusama is truly out of the norm, isn't he? Letitia sighs in admiration. According to my memory as a calamity, the hero, the sage, and the demon king are all protected by the, transmigrator, skill. But the effect of, domination, should have been much stronger. Shall we give it to try? If only you would be willing to try it, Kusama. Letitia reached out with her left hand and squeezed my right hand from the back of the hand. I command you in my name. Um, tell me what your hobbies are. Although I am not sure why she wanted me to tell her about my hobbies, I guess Letitia thought she was giving me a reasonable order. As I was being convinced myself, an inorganic voice echoed in my brain. The arrogant dragon factor has been detected. The condition abnormality nullification of the transmigrator is used to block it. The next moment, a silver light burst around my right hand. Kaya Letitia lets out a small scream. Then, looking sullenly at my right hand, she said. There, domination, certainly didn't work, did it? That's what I meant. By the way, my hobby is, huh? What are my hobbies? When I was a university student, I used to play video games, but after I started working, I haven't been able to play anything properly. I don't think I have any hobbies even after coming to this world. I read a few books when I moved from city to city, but that was just like killing time. When I was at a loss for an answer, Letitia chuckled. You don't have to answer. By the way, my hobbies are poetry and painting. That's a very cultured hobby. Shall I recite one? Letitia said casually and took a deep breath. Then, she sang in a high voice. You are the dragon slaying hero who led the black dragon to devour the gluttonous dragon. You have come from a distant land. What do you think and what will you do? May your journey brings you many blessings. Well, I lack artistic sense, so I can't judge if this is a great poem or not. However, the overall atmosphere is somewhat Chayunabu-ish and in that respect, I feel a sense of familiarity with it. I used to write strange poems in my notebook when I was a teenager. This poem, 
though. Letitia said, I've taken the liberty of making a poem about you, Kusama. Did you notice it? Yes, of course. I can use the black dragon through there, summoning calamity, and I have taken away their, spatial manipulation, from the gluttonous dragon. Moreover, in An, Tu, and Surya, I am also called the dragon slayer. It is clear that Letitia's poem is about me. Fufu, I'm glad you recognize it. When I was back home, no one understood my poetry. Well, I guess that's inevitable. A Chayunabu poem requires a special sense to decipher it. We left the forest and headed up the hill to the grand cabin, which was parked near the top. Dest, our lookout, noticed us and approached us. Welcome back, master. And who's this woman? Letitia, can you introduce yourself? Of course. Nodding at my words. Letitia picked up the hem of her skirt and spread it from side to side. My name is Letitia Demetia. Pleased to meet you. Nice to meet you, Letitia San. My name is Dest. Dest bowed with his left hand on his abdomen and his right hand on his back, just like a butler. Foo foo, that gesture is almost like a human being. You are a remarkable orichal kumgalam, Kusama. Where in the world did you find this child? I found it, or rather, I made it with my skills. Strictly speaking, Dest is not an Orachal Gillum. He's a destroyer Gillum equipped with a super high-powered magic laser cannon, a new type that didn't exist in ancient civilizations. A. Eh? My reply was unexpected for Letitia, it seems. Her deep blue eyes widen in surprise, and she blinks repeatedly, muttering softly. If my knowledge is correct, it should be impossible to manufacture a new type of Orachal Gillum with modern technology, even if one has the skills. And to produce an original new type of Orichal Kumgulam is. You are truly out of the ordinary, aren't you, Kusama? Fufu. At Letitia's words, for some reason, Dest proudly puffed out his chest. Both of his eyes flashed with a cupid's eye, and he emitted an electronic voice. Master is an amazing person and odors you. Fufu. Dest San really admires Kusama, doesn't he? Of course. Dest straightened his back and made a saluting pose with his right hand. Dot what can I say? I am indeed embarrassed when I am praised so much. I opened the door of the grand cabin with my left hand while scratching my cheek with my right hand. It's getting late. Why don't we go inside? Fufu. Yes, of course. Whether Letitia noticed my embarrassment or not. She smiled softly and got into the grand cabin with light steps. The ground floor of the grand cabin was pitch black, but when our presence was detected, the magic lights on the ceiling automatically flicked on. A warm orange light illuminated the area. Well, looking around the interior of the grand cabin, Letitia let out a sigh of admiration. I've never seen such a luxurious carriage before. It has a living room, dining room, and even a kitchen in the back. There's even a private room upstairs. Letitia is. Right, you can take the room at the front, just up the stairs. It was originally my room but I'll give it to the lady. I can sleep on the living room sofa. It's wide enough for six adults to sit side by side, so there's plenty of room to lie down. The other two rooms are occupied by my friends. They are probably asleep by now, so can you introduce yourself to them tomorrow? Yes, that's fine. Dot by the way, may I ask you something that I don't know? Of course. Ask me anything you like. How many private rooms are upstairs? Three. I occupy one of them and your friends occupy too, right? There are only three private rooms, so they are all occupied. Oops, Letitia seemed to have noticed. Where will you sleep tonight, Kusama? If you give up your room to me, I'm afraid you won't have any place to sleep. No need to worry. I will sleep on the sofa in this living room. If so, please use the bedroom, Kusama. I am a calamity, and the sofa will be enough for me. What does that have to do with being a calamity? I don't know. But it is certain that I do not choose my bed. Even when I was in my homeland, I was scolded for taking naps on the treetops. Dot Letitia was the second princess. Wasn't she? My father told me, I was hoping you would grow up healthy, but you're too healthy, that's what he said. Dot uh, in sum, Letitia's outward appearance is that of a noble daughter, but on the inside, she is a very tomboyish princess. So. I'll be sleeping in the living room, is that right? There is no connection at all. As expected of you, Kusama, you have noticed it after all. Of course. Be that as it may, whether Letitia is a calamity or not, I can't have a woman lying in a place like this. Think of it as you doing me a favor and taking the upstairs room. Dot now that you put it that way, I can't argue with that. Letitia giggled, and a smile appeared in her mouth. I don't want to embarrass you, Kusama. 
and I'm going to be very gracious this time. Yeah, please do. Thank you. Then good night. I really appreciate your concern. Letitia finally said and went up the stairs to the second floor with light steps. Phew. Once I was alone, I yawned. I'm feeling nice and sleepy, and if I'm going to sleep, now would be a good time. Well then, good night. It seems the production skill acquired in another world is the strongest. Volume 3 Chapter 2 Here's the chapter, enjoy. Ed, blast. Chapter 2, I introduced Letitia to everyone. The following day I woke up on the living room sofa. Warm sunlight was streaming in through the window. Fewer. I stretched up straight with a small yawn. Then I heard a woman's voice from across the table. Fufu. Good morning, Kusama. Dot Letitia, you're already up. Looking at the sofa on the other side, I saw Letitia's figure there. The long golden hair is glistening in the sunlight. Did you sleep well last night? Yes, thanks to the room you gave me, I had a good night's sleep. I woke up a little early so I could watch you sleeping. You don't find it interesting to look at my face, do you? No, no, you are very lovely. Letitia gave a small chuckle. The famous dragon slayer also looks very peaceful in his sleep. Well, at least I didn't have any nightmares. While talking about this, Lily came down from the second floor this time. She was holding Zura in both arms as if he were her favorite stuffed animal. Good morning, Kusan. Master San. Good morning. Dot huh? There's an extra woman here. Zura notices Letitia's presence and shouts. I'm Zura, a helper slime. I want to know your name. My name is Letitia Demetia. It just so happens that I am accompanying Kusama on his journey. Pleased to meet you. I am Lily Luna Loon area. Dot I saw Letitia San in my foresight, last night. So I also know who you are, Ara. Letitia rolled her eyes and turned to Lily, and said, Lily Sama is wearing the uniform of a priest of the God of War religion, isn't it? And if you have the, foresight, then you must be a, God of War's shrine maiden, right? Yes, that is correct. Lily nodded, and this time she spoke to me. I assume you know who Letitia San is, Kusan? Dot yeah. Lily Sama. There is no need for you to worry. At the same time I nodded, Letitia opened her mouth. I have already explained my true identity to Kusama. Hey, hey, Letitia and Ain. Zurara suddenly spoke up. All I know about you is your name, though. It seems that Lily has not told Zurara about the contents of her foresight. If there are any secrets, I want to know. I'm excited. Zurara-sama is so innocent, isn't he? Letitia smiled and patted Zurara on the head. Then. Let me recite a poem to introduce myself as well. I am from the farthest reaches of the world. I am the meteor that cuts through the night sky with its blue flash. I am that which brings all things to their knees. I am the calamity that is the natural enemy of all living things. My name is the bright and arrogant dragon. You shall raise your hands in praise of my abominable name. Dot well, that's about it. Ah, Lily had a puzzled look on her face. Well. That's understandable. Letitia's poem is a Chayunabu poem, and only a kindred spirit like me can understand it in one shot. Most people would not be able to decipher it and would react like Lily did. Zurara, on the other hand, Letitia Winain is a calamity. His mouth was wide open in surprise. Apparently, Zurara had properly understood that poem. Master San, we are in trouble. She's a calamity. But she doesn't seem to be a bad person. Yes. That's right. When I nodded at Zurara's words, Letitia's mouth fell open in delight. Fufu, thank you for trusting me. I have no intention of acting as a calamity, so please don't worry about that. I prefer creative activities to destructive ones. By creative activities, I assume she refers to the poem she just mentioned. I also remember she said that painting is her hobby. I am wondering what kind of paintings she draws, but aside from that, I hear new footsteps coming from the stairway. Good morning. Everyone's up early. Iris came downstairs, adjusting the position of the ribbon tying her hair with her right hand. Her hair is long, red, and jewel-like in color. Dot Ara, her red eyes turned to someone who wasn't here yesterday. Letitia, after blinking a few times, she said, with a puzzled look on her face. Are you, by any chance, Letitia? It's been a while. Iris Sama. Oops. It seems that these two have known each other for a long time. The relationship between Iris and Letitia is a matter of concern, but I decided to ask her about it over breakfast. The reason is that Lily's stomach made a reserved ka -ah sound. I I'm sorry. Although we are in the middle of a talk. Lily turned her head down, 
Her face turned bright red. There is no need to worry about it. To be honest, I was hungry too, and I was at my limit. I opened my item box with a light follow-up. What I took out was the takeout Hotep I bought at Seria. Hotep is a soup made by simmering beef, chicken, vegetables, etc. The image is similar to the pot of French cuisine. Since time stands still inside the item box, the Hotep I took out was freshly made and hot. My goodness. Letitia's eyes lit up. That's Hotep, isn't it? I love it. She was probably raised in a snowy area and was not a big fan of this kind of warm soup. Either way, I was glad she was happy. There's always more for a refill, so just let me know. Fufu. I'll take your word for it and eat it without reservation. As breakfast began, I asked Iris. Are you acquainted with Letitia? Yes. When I was on a quest to defeat a high danger monster, Letitia was on the same subjugation team with me. It was about a year ago. Dot certainly, Iris Sama's atmosphere has changed a lot compared to the old days. Is that so? Iris tilted her head slightly. Well, Maybe things have changed a bit since a year ago. It's more than a little bit. Iris Sama used to be a lot more cold and distant. Dot that's certainly true. I nodded at Letitia's words. Iris had a clear and simple atmosphere in the past, and sometimes her words and deeds were laced with shadows of her dark past. She was treated coldly in her homeland of the dragon folk, and the loss of her younger sister, Felice, must have been an emotional wound for her. Compared to when we first met, Iris has become much more expressive. Well, it's a good development, isn't it? If Ku says so, I'm glad. Dot I see. I understand now the reason for what changed Iris Sama. Letitia looked at us and nodded her head with a rather sullen expression. Wait a minute, Letitia. Iris said in a panic. I have a feeling that you have some strange misunderstanding. No, I don't think so. I am a good friend, and I will support you, Iris Sama. We only defeated monsters together didn't we? And it was only once. If I consider you my best friend, then you are my best friend from that moment on. Letitia said this proudly as she puffed out her chest. Apparently, she is quite a pushy type. Iris may have thought the same thing and opened her mouth with a wry smile. Letitia, you are as fearless as ever, aren't you? Of course. I'm a great calamity, a bright and arrogant dragon. The only thing I fear in this world is, at most, the flesh around my belly. Dot wait a minute. Iris's movements came to a sudden halt. I think I just heard a terrible thing. Come to think about it, I didn't tell Iris Sama about it yet. Did I? Letitia said, clasping her hands together. I am, actually, a calamity dragon. You'll have to ask Kusama about the details. Why are you throwing the whole story at me? Oh, well, I coughed and began to explain Letitia's true identity. Dot I see. Iris nodded deeply as she finished listening to me. Honestly, it was so unexpected that I couldn't quite catch up with what was being said, but Ku decided that you could trust Letitia, didn't you? Yeah. Well, I have no objection to that. I trust Ku. Ara, Iris Sama, is that all right with you? Letitia said in a joking tone. I might be deceiving him. No problem. Ku is basically a wise guy. No. That is an overestimation. Even I can sometimes make mistakes. I will support you when that happens. We're on the same team, right? I guess so. Iris and I looked at each other and nodded. On the other hand, Letitia is whispering to Lily and Zurara. The three of us were supposed to be talking, but before we knew it, I was left behind. Ah, uh, I'm sorry to hear that. Cheer up. Letitia and Aeen. https colon slash slash Nike's translation home dot files dot wordpress dot com slash two thousand and twenty two slash oh six slash oh 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 one five dot jpg. Lily Sama, Zurara Sama. Thank you. Well, this is all very interesting, and I'm going to observe the two of them as if I were a wall or a floor. Although I am not sure what Letitia is talking about, at any rate. We all had a good grasp of who she is. There were no objections about her accompanying us, so let's continue on our way to Fort Port. Ah, right. Letitia said something like, the only thing I'm afraid of is the flesh around my belly, but after breakfast, I took out some pudding from my item box, and she was the first to gobble it up. I thought she was afraid of the meat around her belly. Don't worry, I have a constitution that doesn't allow fat to go to my belly. I envy you. After breakfast. The grand cabin headed back down the hill and back to the highway. The trip was going well, and if all went as planned, we would be in Fort Port before noon. Until then, 
Each of us would spend our time in the grand cabin as we pleased. I sat down on the sofa in the living room on the first floor and opened my item box. In my mind there was something I wanted to do now. Last night, I defeated White Scorpion and obtained materials such as shells and shears. I wondered if I could use them to create new items with creation. Dotto there, full assist, automatically activates in conjunction with my thoughts, and a new recipe floats in my brain. Black Spider's Gauntlet X1 plus White Scorpion's Shell X1 Bastard Gauntlet X1. The Black Spider's Gauntlet is an item created from Black Spider material with creation. It is one of the pieces of armor that I usually equip myself with. It can restrain the enemy's movement by spitting out sticky threads. The item is still a pretty cool item at this point. But if it can be further enhanced, then so much the better. Dot is a minor detail. Kagashu and Gauntlet are two words that mean the same thing. T slash N, Kagashu, comma is the kanji for Gauntlet. I wonder why they are not unified, but let's create it with creation. Anyway, when I reminded myself to perform it, Bastard Gauntlet was added to the list in my item box. Bastard Gauntlet. Black Spider and White Scorpion two irreconcilable rivals are the materials used to create this drop quality gauntlet. It emits a thunderbolt that can knock an enemy into stupor. Granted effects colon shock absorption s plus magic absorption s plus black spider thread x white scorpion thunderbolt x. Okay, it's done. First, let's see the real thing. When I select the bastard gauntlet from there, item box, both of my arms are enveloped in a pale light and they are automatically attached. Compared to the Black Spider's gauntlet, the Bastard gauntlet is slightly larger, and the design has changed to be more sharp-edged and aggressive. It is grey in color, probably because it has elements of both the Black Spider and the White Scorpion. I remember reading a news article on the internet when I was in Japan that said something like, Spiders and Scorpions have the same ancestry. If that is the case, then perhaps maybe the black spider and the white scorpion share the same ancestry. I was just mumbling out loud. It was supposed to be just a soliloquy. But Zurara, who was nearby looking out the window, seemed to have heard me, and when he turned to look at me, he said, Master Sama, you know it so well. You're right about that. Dot what did you say? I asked back involuntarily. An ancient monster scholar told me that the black spider and the white scorpion are like brothers born from the same single monster. A similar story is told in the legends of the dragon folk. Iris was sitting next to me on my left, peering into the tourist guidebook spread out on the table. When she looked up from the paper and said, I heard that black spiders and white scorpions have been fighting each other since ancient times over who is the rightful heir because they share a common ancestor. Sounds like a human story. It's just a legend, so I don't know if it's true or not. Dot by the way, Ku, I've been wondering about you for a while now. Did you make a new gauntlet? Yeah. I added material from White Scorpion to the Black Spider gauntlet that I originally had to strengthen it. So that is why you talked about the Black Spider and the White Scorpion. That makes sense. Well, that's about it. I nodded to Aris's words and noticed Lily's gaze. Lily was sitting diagonally across from me on my left, looking at the tourist guidebook with Iris just a few minutes ago. But now she seemed to be very interested in the bastard gauntlet. She looked like a child gazing at a coveted musical instrument with an eager expression on her face. Want to try it on? I said, took off the bastard gauntlet, and held it out to Lily. Dot is it okay? Of course. Everything in life is an experience. T thank you very much. Lily said this with hesitation and put her arm through the bastard gauntlet. Dot it's a bit oversized. Well. I guess that's true. The bastard gauntlets are made to fit my size. Lily is small and has thin arms and legs, so it's no wonder. Thank you very much. Dot Kusan, your arms are so thick, aren't they? Is that so? I think it's normal. I look at my own arms as I receive the bastard gauntlet from Lily. Dot if you ask me, I feel like I have more muscles than I did when I was a company employee. If it is the result of intense fighting up to today, it is a pleasant byproduct. As I was thinking about this, an inorganic voice echoed in my head. Apparently, the creation of the bastard gauntlet increased my skill experience, and creation has been ranked up. It's currently level 17. Thereby, the recipe has increased. Trumpet X1 plus dark colored vestments X1 plus Idrisal branch X1. Sacred Gjlahon X1. Whoa, what an unexpected combination. The trumpet is something I got at the festival in Seria. 
The dark colored vestments are a relic of Elder Lich, and the branch of Yggdrasil was made from the Devil Treant's branch using material alchemy. What kind of item is the sacred Gjlahorn created from these three materials that seem unrelated to each other? I'm very curious, so let's get to work on it. Creation Sacred Gjlahorn, a flute imbued with sacred power. Its tone returns the souls of valiant warriors to this world and gives them great power. Granted effect colon spirit warrior summon X. This is knowledge I gained from anime and games, but it is said that Gjlahorn is an item from Norse mythology a flute that heralds the end of the world. Considering this, Sacred Gjlehun is quite a disturbing name. If I blow this, it won't be the end of the world or something like that, will it? Sacred Gjlehun has no effect other than Spirit Warrior Summon X. Please rest assured. Oops, I didn't realize that. Full assist could answer such a joke of a question. It's like a voice assistant on a smartphone. When I first arrived in this world, full assist was much more mechanical like a game system message. Compared to those days, it has become more varied in its statements and suggestions. Perhaps, full assist, has grown as well. Now that I have gotten sidetracked, it is time to get back to the main topic. Let's talk about the sacred Gjlahon. The granted effect is Spirit Warrior Summon X, which allows the user to summon immortal warriors by blowing the sacred Gjlahon. Their warriors seem to be classified as undead, but they are not evil beings, rather, they are filled with divine power. Therefore, purification magic does not seem to work on them. Since they have overcome the greatest weakness of the undead, it is quite reassuring to consider them as allies. The maximum number of summons is calculated by the formula my level x10, and since I am currently level 109, I can summon up to 1090 summons. That's quite a lot. Next time I encounter a monster. I'll summon it to fight for me. Just as I came to that conclusion, I drew it. I drew it. I heard Letitia's voice from a little distance away. After breakfast, she sat down on a chair in the dining room, pulled out a pencil and a sketchbook out of nowhere, and began to draw with all her heart. About an hour has passed since then, and from what she said earlier, it seems that she has finally completed her drawing. Letitia stood up from her chair with the sketchbook in her hand, with a proud look on her face. She comes over to us. Everyone, if you please take a look at this. I'm very proud of the work I've done after a long time. Letitia unfolded her sketchbook and put it on the table. In the sketchbook was a picture of us relaxing in the living room. In the drawing, Zurara is looking out the window, and Iris and Lily are facing each other, peering into the tourist guidebook. As for me, I was sinking into the sofa and gazing at the ceiling. This is probably the way I look when I am performing, creation. In my mind, the outlines of the people and objects are drawn in great detail, and the colors are all expressed using only shades of pencil. It looks like a black and white photograph. On the other hand, the warmth of the hand-drawn images is also expressed, and we feel as if we are about to start moving in the sketchbook. Amazing. I couldn't help but say a word of praise. I was surprised at how good you are at drawing. Fufu. I am honored to receive such a compliment. The key point is Kusama's profile. I am proud to say that I have successfully expressed the cool and calm atmosphere. Letitia is right. Iris muttered with a satisfied look on her face. I feel like this is just like Ku, with lots of leeways. Is that so? I don't usually look at my own expression, so I can't really feel it. I tilted my head and looked at Lily. Apparently agreeing with Iris' words, she nodded her head repeatedly. I was wondering if Letitia when Ian has their painting skill. When Zurara asked her that, Letitia nodded her head. Yes. In addition to, painting, I also use my power as a calamity. That's a waste of calamity. I can't say that. It's a peaceful use of power that would normally be used for destructive activities, and personally, I think it's a wonderful thing. As I nodded to myself, I heard Dest's voice coming from the magic speakers on the ceiling. Master, it's the ocean. Wow, it's amazing. It's so sparkling. Zurara was the first to speak up. Opening the window and looking out, there was a sandy beach a short distance away, with the ocean stretching out beyond it. The breeze that blew in smelled of the sea. We were almost at Fort Port. It seems the production skill acquired in another world is the strongest. Volume 3 Chapter 3 Sponsored Chapter by Patreon, and you may also want to check our new co for here. Enjoy. Ed. Blast. Chapter 3 we arrived at Fort Port. From far away, the chirping of seagulls could be heard. The sun was shining brilliantly in the sky, 
with a glint of it reflecting off the emerald green sea. Wow, I sighed in admiration as I looked out. It had been years since I had been to the ocean. The ocean stretched out beyond the horizon for as far as I could see. There was nothing to block my view. Dot. Wait a minute. We're on our way to Fort Port. According to the tourist guide, it is a bustling port town, and there are always many cruise ships and fishing boats coming and going in the nearby waters. But now, I don't see a single ship in the sea. This is strange, isn't it? Just as I was questioning this, I have detected a weak earthquake. We are stopping for safety. Dest's voice echoed from the ceiling's magic speakers. The speed of the grand cabin gradually slowed and eventually came to a complete stop. Soon after, a serious tremor hit the grand cabin. However, the intensity of the tremor was not that much. The dishes in the kitchen made a light clatter, clatter, clatter sound. With a tremor of this magnitude, there seemed to be no danger of a tsunami. As I was thinking about the future plan, Letitia muttered, There have been a lot of earthquakes lately. Is that so? If my memory serves me correctly, it seems to shake at least once every three days. Dot there are no signs of a calamity, but it is a little bit ominous. The earthquake stopped soon, and the grand cabin began to move again. Soon the walled port city of Fort Port came into view. Ten minutes later, the grand cabin arrived near the city gates. We have arrived. It's been a long journey. Dest's voice came from the magic speakers on the ceiling. We got up from the sofa and walked out of the grand cabin. It all happened so fast. Iris muttered next to me, looking deeply moved. The direct route from Syria to Fort Port is a distance that would take a normal carriage three days to cover. Thanks to Dest's hard work, I guess. I replied and headed toward the front of the grand cabin. There. Dest was standing with a straight back. Thank you again. Have a good rest. No, no. I'm honored to be of service. After exchanging such a conversation, I made a thought of storing the items in my item box. A large magic circle appeared on the ground, and Dest and the Grand Cabin were absorbed into it. I then headed for the town gate, and the guard standing nearby had a stunned look on his face. We need to get into the town. Is that all right? A. R. Yes. The guard came to his senses and turned to me. Ah, you must be Kakauzakus armor, right? Yes. That is correct. We had already informed the Scarlet Trading Company that we would be arriving at Fort Port before noon today. That may have been part of the reason, but the guard seemed to know immediately that I was Kakauzaka. I had heard that Kusama has an unlimited capacity, item box, but I didn't expect that you could store such a large item in an instant. I was surprised, saying so. The guard sighed in admiration. By the way, Kusama, I know you must be tired from your long journey, but could you please come to the Adventurers Guild first? Actually, there has been a terrible incident in the city. What happened? Before I explain, it might be quicker if you take a look at the harbor first. Please come this way. I will show you. We were escorted by the guard through the town gate. The town of Fort Port was noisy and seemed to lack a sense of calm. I had experienced this atmosphere before. It was just like the one in Un, just before the flood. Master San Zurara opened his mouth nervously. I have a bad feeling about this. Me too. Lily nodded with a tense expression on her face. There may be a calamity or a crisis of comparable magnitude looming. There's trouble everywhere, isn't there? As for me, I can't help but comment on that. Devil Treant had appeared into, and in Surya, the gluttonous dragon was resurrected. What in the world is going on this time? Eventually. We arrived at the docks, where we were greeted with a startling sight. Every single building along the coastline had been destroyed to pieces. Everywhere was charred black and turned to ruins. The damage was not limited to buildings. Every single ship that would have been anchored in the harbor was destroyed, and the wreckage floated in the sea. It is a heartbreaking sight to behold. It's awful. Iris muttered with a pained expression on her face. But it doesn't look like it was attacked by a monster. Pirates. They were attacked by pirates. The one who answered that was the guard who had led us here. His voice was filled with regret. According to the guard's explanation, there was a pirate attack at dawn today. There was only one pirate ship, but it was a huge battleship with what appeared to be an ancient weapon, and the cannon mounted on its bow thoroughly destroyed the port of Fort Port. They then sent a messenger to the town, demanding money, food and young women. If we do not comply with their demands, or if even a single person escapes from the town, they will resume their attack and burn Fort Port with all its inhabitants. That's what the pirate's messenger said. Dot there are hell of a bunch of people. Ancient weapons, without exception, have great power, but in the end, 
What matters is how they are used, if they fall into the wrong hands, many people will be hurt for personal gain. We can't allow that to happen. Letitia, who had remained silent up to that point, muttered a few words. Her profile tightened, and a flame of righteous indignation flared in her deep blue eyes. The strong trample the weak with their desires. Such evil cannot go unpunished. We must strike the pirates with the iron fist of justice. Yes, I agree. I nodded to Letitia's words. The pirates were doing something outrageous, and us abandoning the town would be unthinkable. For my part, I'd like to lend a hand in protecting Fort Port. Iris, Lily, and Zurara seemed to share the same opinion and nodded strongly while looking at us. They're all good people, or at least good-natured. Well, I can't speak for others either. While smiling wryly to myself, I told the guard. I understand the situation and we'll lend a hand for the good of the town. Pleased to be of service. Thank you very much. That's very reassuring. First of all, I need information about the pirates. Where should we go? Is it the Adventurer's Guild? Yes, sir. I was just about to guide you there. Then let's go. And so we left the port, led by the guard. After walking for about 15 minutes toward the town center, we saw a large three-story building. It was the Adventurer's Guild. Please come in. The guard opened the door for us. He treated us like VIPs. I bowed to the guard and stepped inside the Adventurer's Guild, feeling a little embarrassed. In the lobby, there were many adventurers hanging out. Perhaps because this is a port town, many of them are dressed more openly. For example, about half of the male adventurers were dressed to show off their dark skin, toned arms, and muscular pectoral muscles while the female adventurers were generally revealing a lot. Their chests and thighs were generously exposed. Normally, adventurers would be merrily chatting about their adventures in the lobby. But now, perhaps because of the imminent threat of pirates, everyone hid a heavy atmosphere. I felt like I was being watched. Who is that guy in the black coat? Black eyes, black hair, and he's got a dragon folk woman with him, meaning he's the dragon slayer Kukauzaka. No doubt. I've seen him before in Arn. Apparently, there are a good number of people who know me. Hey, the Dragon Slayer is very strong, isn't it? Yeah, I heard that he defeated Devil Treant into and a huge monster in Seria. If the Dragon Slayer can help us, then there is nothing more reassuring than that. We might be able to beat those pirates. The faces of the adventurers in the lobby gradually grew brighter and brighter. That's great, Ku. Beside me to my left. Iris gave a small smile. The atmosphere in the Adventurer's Guild changed just by your arrival. I haven't done anything yet. The surrounding adventurers gossiped about me and looked at me with anticipation and even envy. I wonder if this is indeed an overestimation. When I was puzzled, Letitia called out to me from my right. Kusama, are you perhaps embarrassed? Well, I guess. Fufu, the famous dragon slayer also has a cute side. Doesn't he? Letitia giggled as she covered her mouth. Then, she called out to Lily and Zurara, who were walking right behind us. Don't you two think so, too? Let's see. Yes, I think Kusan is surprisingly shy. I know. When masters are shy, he will look away and crooked his mouth. Mum. Zurara looked to the left and bent his mouth into a shape. Indeed, I make that expression when I'm embarrassed. Zurara, you are very observant, aren't you? After that, the role of being our guide was passed from the guard to a young male staff of the Adventurer's Guild. Then, Kusama, I'll take my leave now. The guard saluted me with a firm salute, turned to the right, and walked away. We were taken by a male staff member to the branch manager's office on the third floor. According to the staff member, the Adventurer's Guild was currently receiving a messenger from the pirate side. The pirate messenger was only one person. And when asked to give up all the money and food in town, as well as a young woman, he occupied the staff cafeteria on the second floor, drinking and eating as much as he wanted and waiting for an answer. Dot that's a rather nice position he has here. I muttered to myself, and Letitia, who was walking to my right, looked disgusted. A thief is a thief, is what I'm saying. I'm going to have him arrested right now. Dot that may be difficult, the male staff member muttered as if he was at a loss. The pirate messenger said, if anyone tries to interfere with me, I will contact the main group with a communication device. An all-out attack will be launched immediately. That's pretty nasty. That's when I replied. P please stop. A young woman's voice sounded. I stopped right there and activated my armored bear armor hearing enhancement. Hey, D don't touch me. Hey, hey, 
Staff member San. You think you can go against me? The woman's voice is followed by a threatening male voice. If I call the main group, this whole town will be gone in an instant, you know? T that's. If you understand, do as I say. The woman was an employee of the Adventurers Guild, and the man was the messenger from the pirate side. The pirate messenger was using his position to try to get his hands on the female staff member. I couldn't turn a blind eye to this. Ku, what's wrong? Iris, who was walking in front of me, looked back at me and called out. Aren't you going to the branch managers? Wait a minute, I've got some things I need to do. I was standing at the crossroads of two corridors. The branch manager's office was straight ahead, but the voice I heard earlier came from the right. He he he, if you spoil my mood you'll be in big trouble. So entertain me at your best. Uck. Someone, help me. Okay, I've located the place. I walked down the corridor to the right and stood in front of a door close by. Letitia was lined up next to me. Ara, you heard it too, Kusama. Letitia too? Yes. I never miss a cry for help. You're just like a hero in a story. Fufu, thank you very much. I am honored to hear a hero like you say so. Kusama. I exchange a few words with Letitia and put my hand on the doorknob. Let's go. Yes, very well. After exchanging glances, I opened the door. It was a storage room, and at the far wall, a blonde man was approaching a female guild employee. He was in what's called a cabin position, but there was no hint of sweetness at all. H help me. The female staff member looked at me and shouted. Who are you? Don't you dare interrupt me. Or rather, how did you get in here? The blonde man turned around and looked at me with an astonished expression on his face. Have we met somewhere before? According to my appraisal, the man's name was Zed, but I couldn't remember him by any means. Well, it doesn't matter. Let's just save the woman for now. I activated their divine speed blessing except attached to my Fenra coat. In a split second, I was close to the blonde man, Zed, and then I reached out with my right hand and grabbed him around the neck. Since I'm here, Let's try out a new item. It's the Bastard Gauntlet's granted effect, comma White Scorpion Thunderbolt X. A gush of blue white lightning shot out from the gauntlet on my right arm. GGHH. Gaewich. Zed's A's rolled back in white, and his entire body trembled. In my brain, there, full assist, said, the power of the lightning strike will be adjusted automatically. Are you sure you want to use the non lethal suppression mode? The answer was, of course. Yes, if I let this man die, I will not be able to extract information about the pirates. When the release of the thunderbolt was over, Zed was completely unconscious. As I laid his body on the floor, I called out to the female staff member. Are you alright? Why yes. Thank you for saving me. The woman bowed her head over and over again as she fixed her messy clothes. I'm so glad I could stop it before something irreversible happened. As I breathed a sigh of relief. Letitia came toward me with leisurely steps, as expected of Kusama. Dot I'm very disappointed that I didn't get a chance to act. Well, well, an enemy is an enemy, after all. Aside from a big one like Devil Tree and one or two defenseless minor thugs, I alone am enough to subdue them. I'll need your help another time. Yes, of course. Dot but for now, I'm afraid I won't be able to sleep tonight if I don't do something about this uncontrollable motivation. Otherwise, I'm going to be a raging calamity. That's not good. While we were talking, Iris came in a little later. Ku, are you alright? I heard someone screaming. No problem. The pirate messenger was about to do something bad to the female staff member, so I just let him sleep for a bit. Dot I see. Iris glanced at the unconscious Zed, then nodded approvingly. So, what are you going to do after this? I suppose we should report this to the guild's branch manager. It would be better to have him take a look at the scene. So why don't you go get him? I'll call him. Hold on a second. Iris nodded and left the room in a short run. Well, let's get some ideas together now on how to explain this to the branch manager. T slash N. Kabadon is the act of pinning down a love interest against the wall. The receptive gets cornered in the wall and unable to escape. In Japanese media such as Shiro manga or anime, this is a sign of affection, jealousy or frustration by the dominant. There could be sexual tension between the two it is an aggressive move. Typically, a tough male character performs the cabin to a meek female character. It seems the production skill acquired in another world is the strongest. Volume 3 Chapter 4 Here's the chapter, enjoy. Ed, Blast. Chapter 4, I tried to get information about the pirates. Soon after, the branch manager of the Adventurers Guild arrived. His name was Jess White. 
and he a slender, tall, middle-aged man. He wore silver-rimmed glasses and had an air of a capable man about him. When Jess heard what had happened from the female staff member, he turned to me and bowed deeply. Kukazaku san, this is an important matter for our branch. Thank you very much for protecting our valued employees. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. With this, it was as if negotiations with the pirates had broken down, but there was no word of censure from branch manager Jess. In fact, he even seemed pleased. I think of the staff of this branch as my own children. I can't be so rude as to yell at Kusan, my benefactor, after you saved my child. Besides, we were going to terminate our negotiations with the pirates sooner or later. What do you mean? The pirate's ship is an ancient weapon and it possesses fearsome power. Even if the adventurers of the Fort Port branch were to join together in resistance, the entire town would be burned to the ground. However, if the Dragon Slayer Kusan is here, it is a different story. I had heard from the guards that you would arrive in town before noon today, so I was waiting for your arrival while pretending to negotiate with them. I see. So branch manager Jess had no intention of complying with the pirate's demands but was buying time to protect the people of the town. The female staff member I had helped earlier said with an awkward smile, If Kusan comes, we will manage somehow. Dot I believed so. I know all about your past activities. Will you please use your power to get rid of the pirates and save Fort Port? Jess bowed deeply. Dot I understand. I nodded. I was not comfortable being treated as if I were a savior. But I wanted to respond to the feelings of Jess and the guild staff, who had been desperately trying to stall for time. Let me hear the details. We then moved to the branch manager's office to learn more about the pirates. We all sat down on the big sofa across from each other, and the branch manager, Jess, began to speak. This is what the messenger Zed, told me. The pirates originally belonged to the mercenary guild. The mercenary guild? That's another name I've forgotten. When the great flood happened in Arn before, the guys from the mercenary guild threw away the defense of the city and ran away somewhere. Moreover, after all was said and done, they were driven away by the destroyer Gillum when they tried to loot the city of Un in the absence of the residents. As a result, the guys who belonged to the mercenary guild in Un are wanted as criminals, but did they turn themselves into pirates? When I told branch manager Jess about my guess, he replied, it seems so. It is not rare for those who have lost their way on land to become pirates. I would add that mercenaries from to have also joined the pirates. According to branch manager Jess, there were only two mercenary guild branches in the area, one in Un and the other in Tu, and when Devil Treant appeared, the mercenaries into disappeared from the city and have not been seen since. Aren't mercenaries just irresponsible rogues? I asked Jess about the scale of the pirates. It seemed that only one ship had attacked Fort Port. But that doesn't mean this was the entire force. How did they get their hands on an ancient warship in the first place? I wonder, but unfortunately, the Adventurers Guild doesn't seem to have a good grasp of the pirates' forces. I apologize. We've been shorthanded with firefighting work at the bombarded dock. Well, it couldn't be helped. They were suddenly bombarded early this morning, after all. As for detailed information on the pirates, I would just have to get it from the messenger I had knocked out earlier. I turn my gaze to the corner of the branch manager's office. There is a large house plant there, and a pirate man with his arms and legs wrapped in ropes is lying nearby. I wonder what his name is. I think it was something like Doji. It's Zed. Oh yeah, that's it. So, full assist, can support the forgetfulness, too, I guess. If I were to turn 70 or 80 years old, it seems I wouldn't be bothered by memory loss. But that aside, Bastard Gauntlet Sight Scorpion Thunderbolt X not only stuns the opponent but can also wake him up with an electric shock. With this, I'll zap Zed awake to begin an interrogation. I was just about to move up from the sofa when Letitia said, Kusama, please wait. What is it? If you want to get information out of that man, I have an idea. With that, Letitia got up from the sofa and walked gracefully to the corner of the room. She reached out with her left hand and touched Zed's forehead, then said in a solemn tone, I command you in my name. From now on, you will obey the words of Kusama. Zed's body jerked and bounced. I see. Needless to say, Letitia is a calamity and has several special powers. One of them is, domination. By infiltrating her factor. She can manipulate people and things and turn them into puppets. Letitia used it against Zed. Then, Kusama, please take care of the rest. I understand. I'll take care of it. I left the sofa and walked past Letitia, 
who was pinching the hem of her skirt and bowing reverently to me. Let's get him up first. I grab Zed by the neck and activate White Scorpion Thunderbolt X. Ah, agua! A bolt of lightning gushed out from the gauntlet on my right arm, and Zed woke up from the shock of it. NNW what the hell is going on? Zed realized that his limbs were bound with ropes and he tried to wriggle out of his restraints. His movements were like those of a fish fresh out of the water. As he bounced around on the floor, the shin of his right leg struck a flower pot in the corner of the room. Ouch! Zed exclaimed with a look of anguish on his face. The pain must have been quite intense since his shin was hit unexpectedly. Just imagining it sends shivers down my spine. Damn, why is there a flower pot in a place like this? A, hey, you are. The flower pot had a large house plant in it. But the impact of the collision knocked it off balance, and it fell towards Zed. Ark. Zed was pinned under the plant as it was. It was like a scene straight out of a comedy. The phrase the screw up Zed came to mind. Dot are you okay? I called out to him, and he glared at me. Shut up. I'm the messenger of the pirates. You think you can get away with this for free? You are Kakazaka, aren't you? I haven't forgotten what you did to me at that time. At that time? What is he talking about? I have no idea at all. But as I tilted my head, Zed continued to speak. If you hadn't helped the old man Chrome, we wouldn't have been exposed for throwing away the escort quest. Damn, now I'm getting annoyed remembering that. R, so that's how it is. Now that he mentioned it, I finally understood. When I first came to this different world, I saved a merchant, Chrome San, who was being attacked by an armored bear. Chrome San had originally asked three mercenaries to escort him but they ran away as soon as they saw the armored bear. One of the mercenaries at that time must be this pirate guy, Zed, who is in front of me now. When I think about it, his face looked somewhat familiar. It seems you've remembered. Zed's mouth twisted into a grin. I'll tell you, our leader is a former B-rank mercenary named Dox. Do you remember him? You remember him, don't you? Dot well, I guess. I had completely forgotten about it until just now, so my memory is a little hazy but I seem to recall that there was a mercenary by that name. I believe he was called Scumdox by the resident Savan. When he found out that you were in Fort Port, he would drop the negotiations and start attacking you. Ha 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 ha. This city will be destroyed because of you. There's no way I'm going to let that happen. I said in a strong tone. I will destroy all the pirates. Tell me everything you know. Huh? Don't think you can threaten me. Who would answer yes? Understood. I will follow Kusama's orders. I will tell you everything I know, so please listen to me shit. What's going on? My mouth is moving on its own. This was probably due to Letitia's domination. The man who had abused his position as a messenger to make anyone do his will is now at the mercy of others through the power of domination. How can I say? It's just cause and effect. Anyway, this seems like an easy way to get information out of him. The information obtained from Zed was very useful. Three of the most important ones were as follows. First, the pirates had a total of five ships from an ancient civilization. However, only one of them is manned, and the other four are automated unmanned vessels. It's strange, isn't it? Iris put her right hand over her mouth and said with a thoughtful expression on her face. I wonder where they learned how to operate them. The mechanisms of these ships must be completely different from those of today. Iris Nain. Ancient ships are very efficient, you know. Zurara was a little proud of it. They have learning devices that will teach you how to operate them in about half a day, and they have artificial intelligence on board to assist you. If one wanted to, even a three-year-old could become a captain. It's a very convenient system isn't it? As one would expect from an ancient civilization, Letitia said with a small smile. But this time, that convenience backfired. Yes, that's right. I nodded and continued speaking. Because anyone can handle it, of course, if it gets into the wrong hands, it can be a big problem. This situation is a prime example. A tool is only as good as how you use it. Lily is exactly right. If it had not been the pirates who acquired the ship, it would have been a much better turn of events. The second piece of information was that a separate pirate force was waiting on the West Road. What? Branch manager Jess exclaimed in surprise. The pirates are very well prepared. I didn't think they had a force on land as well. If negotiations broke down and the pirates' ships launched an attack on Fort Port, 
the people of the town would flee with their possessions. In order to capture such people and strip them of their possessions, the pirates seemed to have sent a detachment to the western road. Airy Zurara wondered. We came from Syria to Fort Port via the highway, but we didn't see any pirates. We took the direct route. The Eastern Road. There are two routes from Syria to Fort Port. One island the straight east route, and the other is a detour route to the west. Although the Eastern Road is a shortcut, it cuts through hilly terrain, mountain roads, and deep forests, and it is highly likely to encounter dangerous monsters. On the other hand, the Western Road is a longer path, but it is flat and safe. If the people of Fort Port were to flee the town, they would take the West Road to Syria right? Oh, in the normal course of events, anyone would choose the safer route. That was why the pirates would have placed a detachment on the western road. The third piece of information was the size of the pirate group. According to Zed's story, the pirates are a large group of more than 200 people, and there are about 120 people on board the ship as the main group. In other words, there are about 80 people in the detached group. Lily seemed to have done the math in her head and answered immediately. The main group is 120 people, and the detachment is 80 people. Neither of which is a number that can be ignored. I nodded at Letitia's words. For the future, it would be better to thoroughly crush the pirates here. You are right. If even one person is missed, it could lead to new trouble. I'd like to catch them all together. Well, what should we do? Considering the number of people we're up against, it seems our party won't be able to handle them all. We're going to need the help of some adventurers from Fort Port. Wait a minute. The item I just made this morning with, creation, might be useful. Sacred Gtlahun. The granted effect is Spirit Warrior Summon X. You can summon the undead who are imbued with sacred power by blowing this horn. Dot yeah, it looks pretty useful. Do you need help planning a strategy? The voice was inorganic as usual, but the tone was somewhat personable. I wonder if, full assist, is a skill that grows as you use it for longer periods. Anyway, I would appreciate it if you could help me. If I think about it on my own, there might be something I missed. As for the pirate's detachment, how about letting the spirit warriors deal with them? This is considered the best solution among the current options. However, Kukauzaka or at least one person from the party should accompany the army of spirit warriors. Well, that's certainly true. You never know what might happen in battle, and it is better to have one person in command. The most suitable person would be Aras or Letitia. We do not have enough information on the selection of the accompanying person. How about actually summoning the spirit warriors and then making a decision? Okay, I'll do that. It seems that the spirit warriors are sacred beings so perhaps it might work better if we let Lily, a priest of the God of War religion, take the lead, or, perhaps, Zurara. Well, we can decide this on the spot, as for other concerns. Even if we are going to crush the main group of pirates, they are on the sea, so we need a means of transportation, right? Nevertheless, the pirates destroyed all the ships in Fort Port. Is it possible to create a new ship with, creation? It is impossible for, creation to create a ship with the items currently stored in their, item box. As I thought, I had expected that conclusion. If I could create a new ship, I would have the recipe in my head by now. But what if I use something outside the, item box? Currently, I can include things that I touch as materials for, creation. For example, in the past, when I used, creation, to rebuild the Zard bridge, which collapsed after an earthquake, I used not only the items I had on hand but also the remaining parts of the bridge as materials. In this case, could I reuse the wreckage of the ship? One appropriate recipe exists. Good. It makes me feel good when the results come back as expected. As we continued to discuss the matter further, the plan to defeat the pirates gradually took shape. All that remained was to put it into action. I took a deep breath to get myself back in the swing of things and said to the pirate messenger, Zed, thanks for all the help you've given me. I have one last favor to ask of you. Ha, huh, no thanks. Nobody is going to do what you say. I'll gladly do anything you say, Kusama. Please do not hesitate to command this dog. Woof woof. However much the effect of, domination, may be. It's not very cute when a blonde, skinny guy like Z imitates a dog's bark. Woof woof. I'm a better imitator than you. Woof woof. Hee hee. When I looked at Zurara, 
I saw that he had transformed his round body and had grown dog ears on his head and a tail on the underside of his back. The tail was wagging from side to side. Was he trying to compete with Zed's behavior? It was quite a funny sight. I tightened my loose cheeks and called out to Zed, answer me honestly. Where is the magic tool for communicating with the main group? It's in the right pocket of my pants. Dot is it this one? The communication device was shaped like a foldable cell phone. It resembles a so-called Japanese feature phone. The device's official name is Type 0 Prototype Magic Communication Device. It's so cool for nothing. Is it just me? Or do phrases like Type 0 and Prototype make your heart flutter? Oh, no, I think Letitia would sympathize with me. We share the same disease, after all. Thinking about this, I tell Zed. I'm going to use the communicator. This concludes our business, so get some rest. Oh, oh. Then, I'll take a rest without any hesitation. A, G G H H K A W. I activated White Scorpion Thunderbolt Eggs and took away Zed's consciousness. I put the communication device in the pocket of my Fenra coat and returned to Iris and the others. We've got all the information we need. We're going to strike out ourselves. That's good. My arms buzzing. It's my turn. I'm going to beat the evil ones to a pulp. Letitia rolled up her sleeves and clenched her right fist. Lilia Nietzschean. Let's do our best. Dot yes. I'll do my best as the branch manager. If there is anything I can do for you, please let me know. Jess pushed up the center of her glasses with her right hand. The lenses of the glasses reflected the light and shone brightly. It seems that everyone is fully motivated. I asked Jess to call out to the adventurers, and we left the guild building. Our destination was not the sea where the pirates were, but the town gate. First, Let's take care of the pirate detachment on the western road. At the gate, we saw the guard who had guided us to the adventurer's guild. Kusama, is there something wrong? Yes, actually. When I told him about the detachment, he looked surprised. Oh my goodness. So, are you going to take out the detachment first? No, we are going to split up and deal with them. I opened my item box and took out the sacred Gchle horn as I answered. The horn was quite large and heavy. A golden flag hung from the center to the tip, on which was a coat of arms combining a sword, a spear, and a bow. Kusan, the emblem on the flag is the same as mine. When I looked at Lily's priest's robe, I found a coat of arms combining a sword, a spear, and a bow on her right shoulder. It is a perfect match to the one on the banner. This is the symbol of the god of war isn't it? Yes. It is a coat of arms that shows the main god, the god of war, Warden Sama. According to the law of the god of war religion, the god of war gathers the souls of brave warriors in his castle in the divine world and prepares them for the great battle that will eventually come. I remember hearing that somewhere, although this might be knowledge I acquired from anime and video games, there must have been a similar story in Norse mythology. The main god Odin gathered the fallen warriors to Valhalla in preparation for Ragnarok, or something like that. This world is a bit like Norse mythology in some places, isn't it? While I was thinking about this, Lily continued the story further. It is said that the god of war hands over an army of valiant warriors. When his successor appears, dot I think that Kusan might not just be a transmigrator, but a successor to the god of war. T slash N. Chayunabu. It seems the production skill acquired in another world is the strongest. Volume 3 Chapter 5. Sponsored chapter by Patreon, and you may also want to check our new co for here. Enjoy. Ed. Blast. Chapter 5. I tried to get ready for the pirate subjugation. Lily told me, you may be the successor to the god of war. Hearing that, Letitia said, that's a phrase that stimulates my creativity. Well. I kind of understand how she feels. The phrase successor to the god of war is so cool and Chayunabu-esque, isn't it? Whether it is true or not, I have one thing to do. I raise the sacred Gchlehorn. It's the first time in my life that I've played a horn, but their dexterity supported me. I put my mouth close to the mouthpiece part and exhaled slowly, making my lips tremble. Then, the horn emitted a high note, resonating with the vibration. <laughs> The sound was so loud that it seemed to reach the end of the sky and was filled with grandeur and solemnity that seemed to herald the beginning of something. Before long, a change occurred. The emblem of the god of war, a combination of a sword, a spear, and a bow, appeared on the ground. It was quite large, more than twenty meters in diameter. The emblem glowed red. Around it, crimson particles swirled and rose. Lily, who was standing nearby, 
gulped such tremendous divine power. At the same time, full assist, spoke in an inorganic voice. We have confirmed the activation of spirit warrior summon X. Please specify the number of warriors to summon. Since Kakauzuka is level 109, the maximum number is 1090 warriors. Of course, I will not spare any warriors. I will summon all 1090 warriors, the whole group. As if responding to my will, the emblem shone with a strong radiance. I involuntarily closed my eyelids. The dazzle was too much. After the light subsided, I slowly opened my eyes to see the silvery glow of the knights in armor. The knights in armor kneeled toward me in silence. This was what, full assist, told me. But it seemed that the souls summoned by the sacred Gjlehon were subject to the restrictions of the god of war and could not exchange woods with living humans. However, I naturally understood the unwavering loyalty of the knights in armor toward me. Ku is always out of the norm, but this time he's especially amazing. Iris sighed in admiration. Airy Zurara suddenly shouted. I know those knights in armor. You do? Yeah, I've seen them in ancient civilizations. Let me go check it out. Zurara said bouncing on the ground as he headed toward the knights in shining armor. The souls summoned by the sacred Gjlehon are the souls of brave warriors, who, in short, have died once. If that were the case, it is quite possible to find people from 4000 years ago, when an ancient civilization was flourishing. They were talking happily about something. I thought that armored knights were not supposed to be able to exchange words with people in this world. As I tilted my head, full assist activated and supplemented my knowledge. Apparently, Zurara was a magical creature, so it's considered okay. It sounds like a loophole. I chuckled to myself. Anyway, I guess it was a good decision to bring Zurara from the underground city. I'm tempted to pat myself on the back for that one. Soon after, Zurara returned and told me. I knew it. Those knights in armor were from an ancient civilization. What did you talk about? Um, a lot. According to Zurara's story, the knights were elite men who were gathered to defeat the Calamity, and at that time, they belonged to a group of knights named the Knights of the Dawn. They were based in the vicinity of what we would now call Arn, and when the Black Dragon appeared, they immediately set out to defeat it. The knights fought hard, but in the end, they were all wiped out. Therefore, they respect you and are very grateful to Master San for defeating the Black Dragon. They said, Thank you very much for avenging our deaths. We will definitely repay you for this favor. Please use our power to the fullest. I see. As I nodded, Letitia muttered in agreement right beside me. The reason why the knights follow Kusama is not simply because you're the master who summoned them, but because you're the hero who accomplished the feat of defeating the Black Dragon, which they couldn't do themselves. Dot well. I suppose that's what it's about, I replied in a slightly blunt tone. I was a little embarrassed to be called a hero directly, foo foo. Perhaps sensing my feelings, Letitia gave me a small smile. If I were to strike the main group of pirates, it would be best to let the Knights of the Dawn deal with a separate group. Each of the knights summoned by the sacred Gjlehun is a very powerful person, and there are more than 1000 of them. However, the knights have the restriction that they cannot exchange words with living people. So I decided to have Zurara accompany them as an interpreter. If possible, I would like one more person to accompany the knights. When I discussed this with, full assist, earlier, I concluded that I would think about it after summoning the knights, but now, what should I do? As I was pondering this, Lily raised her small hand. Kusan, may I accompany Zurara-san, too? Dot actually, I've seen a scene similar to this one before in their, foresight. Is that so? In the dream. I was holding Zurara-san with both hands and advancing through the plane together with many knights. That was probably a premonition of what was going to happen today. Everything that happened after that was also in their, foresight. I will catch every single person in the separate group, so why don't you leave it to me? Lily's eyes were filled with a strong light of determination. It is very unusual for Lily, who is always modest, to assert her will like this. I also want to be useful to you. Kusan, please let me do it. Dot I understand. After thinking for a while, I nodded. Lily is a trustworthy companion for me. I'll leave it to you to take care of the detachment, but don't be too hard on yourself. I pat Lily on the head. Dot it's ticklish. Even as she said this, Lily's expression was somewhat happy. Compared to when we first met, I feel like we're getting to know each other a lot better. Considering that Lily's, foresight seem to be utilized in addition to the presence of the great knights, 
I could say that everything was in place regarding the detachment. The next step was to prepare to attack the main group. I took Iris and Letitia and headed back into town. By the way, Kusama, do you have any idea where we can get a ship? No problem. I'm going to make one right now. Right now? Letitia rolled her eyes in surprise. Dot I see. Iris nodded in understanding. I wonder if it's creation. That's right. I nodded. Not long after, we arrived at a dock on the town's coastline. The pirates' bombardment had reduced the surrounding area to a pile of rubble, and the wreckage of a ship floated in the sea. When we were guided by the guard to this place earlier, there were no people around. But now, for some reason, many sailors are gathered here. So you're the rumored dragon slayer, huh? Dot aren't you quite a nice looking fellow? Yeah, you also have the face of a man who can be relied upon. Branch manager just told us that you are going to crush the pirates with just three of you. Dot amazing. That's really cool. Do your best. It seems that the sailors went out of their way to be here to cheer us on as we headed off to defeat the pirates. Dragon Slate is San, this is a parting gift. Please take it with you. A sailor came toward me and offered me a red, ripe apple. It was a beautifully colored apple and looked delicious. Are you sure? Unfortunately, we can't beat the pirates. So. If we go with you, we'll only be a burden to you. I'd like to give you an apple or two to make up for it. It's from the Blue Forest in the Baron's territory to the northwest and is surprisingly sweet. Okay, I'll have one on the way. I answered and accepted the apple. The other sailors also gathered around. Dragon Slayer San, how about some of the dried fruit that is a specialty of Fort Port? It'll take away your fatigue. This is a nautical amulet from my hometown. You can have it if you like. My wife makes homemade sauerkraut in a bottle. It's the one thing that comes to mind when you think of sailing. This is a very unexpected turn of events. Sailors came up to me one after another, handing me food and other things. I guess they were thanking me for taking on the task of subjugating the pirates. After storing each item in my item box, I said to the sailors, thank you. I'll be sure to defeat the pirates, so leave the rest to me. Oh, please. I have a grudge against those pirates for destroying my ship. I want you to beat them to a pulp. How are you going to the pirates, Dragon Slayer San? There's not a single ship left. Don't worry, it won't be a problem. I replied inwardly, kneeling down on the ground and touching the nearby debris with my right hand. Then a recipe popped into my mind. The number and variety of materials this time are quite large. The rubble piles in the surrounding area, the ship wreckage floating in the sea, the devil tree and trunk and devil tree and root from my possessions, and the Orichalcum sword and Orichalcum shield I obtained when I defeated the skeleton soldier's army. With these, a new ship and a harbor can be created with creation. I was surprised that I could create not only a ship but also a harbor. I took a deep breath and activated my skill. Creation. The next instant, as if a dazzling flash of light burst forth, the pile of rubble and the ship's wreckage were gone. Silver particles spread out all around with a whoosh, and amidst the swirling brilliance, the dockyard was restored. Or renewed. The sailors were astonished. W what in the world is going on? Wow, the harbor is being restored to its original state. No, it's even more magnificent than before. Fort Port Harbor X, a new harbor created by Kukauzika with creation. It is made of devil tree and trunk and roots and requires no maintenance. Comes with a 30 comma year durability guarantee. Granted effects colon durability s plus self regeneration a plus ramp formation x. It seems that once again, I have created something that performs beyond expectations. The synergistic effect of durability s plus and self regeneration a plus has given it exceptionally long durability even after 30,000 years. Speaking of 30,000 years, I saw on TV once that the ancestors of the Japanese people arrived in the Japanese archipelago about that long ago. When I think about it, it is quite a grand story. There is another effect that can be given to the harbor colon ramp formation X. A ramp is a ladder for getting on and off a ship. When a ship comes alongside this harbor, the routes of the devil tree and used as a material will grow and automatically form a ramp. It looks very fantastical and interesting. Looking at the sailors, everyone had a look of surprise in their eyes. Well, that's understandable. Not only was the pile of debris cleared away, but a new harbor had just popped up. Are you the reincarnation of God, Dragon Slayer Bro? I was told it would take three months to restore the harbor, but it was rebuilt in an instant. All we need now is a boat and we can go fishing. Thank you, 
thank you. The sailors were stunned by the shock for a while but eventually came to their senses and came to me one by one to express their gratitude. Some were so moved that they hugged me. It was a little bit awkward, but I guess that's how happy they were. Well, I don't feel bad. By the way, this, creation, is only a byproduct of the restoration of the harbor. The real purpose was to create a new ship, which was stored in my, item box. Exceed Cruiser, a high-speed magic boat created by Kukauzuka with, creation. It is equipped with top-class mobility and stability and can freely travel on the sea. Granted effects colon mobility enhancement S plus stability enhancement self regeneration A plus physical defense enhancement S plus magic defense enhancement S plus golem combination EX. Even just reading the description, the ship has an amazing atmosphere. I wondered what exactly a magic boat was. As I tilted my head, full assist, immediately added more information. It seems to be a type of ship that existed in ancient civilizations and is powered by magic. Therefore, like the Orichel can Gillum and Destroyer Gillum, it seems to be equipped with a magic core inside the ship. The reason why self-regeneration A plus exists as a granted effect is probably because the roots and trunks of deviltry and are used as materials for creation. Fair physical defense enhancement S plus and magic defense enhancement S plus are probably derived from Orichalcum, and most notably is Gillum combination EX. A similar effect was granted to Grand Cabin. But it seems that Exceed Cruiser also shows its true performance by merging with Destroyer Gillum. Do you want to combine Destroyer Gillum and Exceed Cruiser? The inorganic voice of, full assist, echoed in my mind. The answer was, of course, yes. I nodded a little and reminded myself to take it out from there, item box. Then, a magic circle appeared on the sea nearby, and a large ship slowly rose from it. Kusama, that's, Letitia asked blinking her large eyes. It's a new ship. I built it with my skills. A ship? But it doesn't have sails, does it? https colon slash slash nikes translation home dot files dot wordpress dot com slash 2022 slash 06 slash 000 dot jpg. The Exceed Cruiser, a ship floating on the sea, is more than 15 meters long and resembles a modern pleasure boat or cruising boat in shape. The reason it has no sails is that it is powered by a built-in magic core. When I explained this to Letitia, she responded, just like the harbor earlier, and this boat, everything that Kusama makes is out of the norm. Ara? On the other hand, Iris shouted as if she had noticed something. That one stuck in the middle of the ship is Dest, isn't it? Yeah. This ship is basically the same as the Grand Cabin. Dest will be in charge of the controls of the ship. I nodded to Iris' words. The Exceed Cruiser was powered by magic power, but there was no bridge. Instead, Dest, who has become one with the Exceed Cruiser through Golem Combination EX, takes its place. From the center of the hull, the upper half of Dest's body protruded out. Master, how do you like my new look? Does it suit me? Dest posed with his arms outstretched. You look great. Thank you. I'm so happy. This sure is lovely. Letitia nodded. Her deep blue eyes sparkled with admiration. Well. Combined robots are a kind of romance, aren't they? I understand exactly how Letitia feels. We had a new ship, the Exceed Cruiser, and we were off to leave the harbor and go on a pirate subjugation mission. Iris, Letitia, and I boarded the ship and stood on the forward deck of the hull. Well then, we are departing. With Dest's voice, the magic core of the Exceed Cruiser was activated, and the encouraging mecha sound was heard. Looking back toward the harbor, the sailors were waving to us. Do your best, Dragon Slayer San. Please avenge our boat. When you return, I'll make you drink my treasured wine. Don't get hurt. With warm cheers at our backs, we left the harbor. The breeze feels so nice. Iris said, holding her long red hair with her right hand. The Exceed Cruiser is a high-speed magic boat and boasts considerable speed. I have a feeling that it may be traveling at a speed of about 100 kilometers per hour. Moving at such high speeds, the hull should sway considerably, but thanks to the stability enhancement S, it was very comfortable. Letitia, for example, was elegantly enjoying a cup of tea with a tea set she had retrieved from somewhere. Where in the world did she store the chair, table, pot, and cups? Ara, Kusama, may I help you? Letitia noticed my gaze and called out to me. Where did you get that tea set? From outside the world. What on earth does that mean? While I was trying to figure out what she meant. Letitia finished her tea and got up from her chair, 
It might be easier to understand if I demonstrate it to you. I, with a rather cute call, a small magic circle appeared near Letitia's right hand. The outline of the magic circle was blurred, and it was unclear what kind of pattern it was. The magic circle emitted a golden glow. Then the tea set was absorbed by the magic circle and disappeared into it. Is that an item box? No, it wasn't. Letitia shook her head with a slightly smug look on her face. I'm recreating something similar to an unlimited capacity item box, by creating my own warehouse outside the world. Is that also a unique ability of the arrogant dragon? I'd like to say yes. But actually it's not. This is just borrowing a part of the power of one of the calamities, the gleaming greedy dragon. There, a new name popped up. The gleaming greedy dragon. What kind of being is it? When I asked her about it, Letitia looked a little troubled. I'm actually missing some of my old memories. Before I was born as Letitia Demetia. Tens of thousands of years ago, when I was called into this world as a bright and arrogant dragon, the memories of that time are not completely clear to me. But Letitia continued. I remember that the gleaming greedy dragon is the younger brother of the arrogant dragon. Perhaps it is because we are siblings, but I sometimes feel his presence. I am sure he is reborn as a human being and is somewhere in this world. I hope that one day you can meet him again. Foo foo. I hope so. Letitia smiled and looked straight at me. I am traveling to find that little brother of mine. I am sure that he is similar to me, so he has abandoned his mission as a calamity and is free to live his life as he pleases. I'm sure he's been looking around the world, eating his way through the streets of some city. And being a good-natured person, so he may be helping people wherever he goes. Letitia's expression was always calm and gentle as she said this. I am sure that the sister and brother had a very good relationship. The greedy dragon's personality is somewhat similar to mine, and I feel like we'll get along. The name Gleaming Greedy Dragon and Kukauzuka is also quite similar. T slash N. The Japanese of Gleaming is Kuku, so pretty sure he meant that. Dot no, that's too aggressive. As I shrugged to myself. I suddenly felt my Fenra coat quivering. No, it's not. The communication device in the pocket of the Fenra coat was vibrating. It was the one I had just taken from the pirate messenger. Zed. The shape resembles a foldable cell phone. Thanks to their dexterity, I could understand how to use it without having to read the manual. I took it out of my pocket and opened the folded part by popping it open with my thumb. I pressed the call button and put it to my ear. It's me, Docs. How's it going over there? Are you getting what we want? It seemed that I was dealing with the leader of the pirate's docks. I remember him fondly as the next guy I fought after Armored Bear. In fact, until today, I had forgotten he existed. Hey, Zed, say something. I'm bored. As I remained silent, Docs continued to speak as if annoyed. He didn't seem to notice that it was me on the other end of the communicator. Well, whether or not the town accepts our demands, we're still going to get the money, the food, and the women too, and then we're going to have a big party. Hee <laughs> hee, being a pirate is an easy business, isn't it? It makes me feel like a fool for being a serious mercenary. No, wait a minute. Docs once abandoned his job as Grom Sans bodyguard to spare his own life. He didn't even take his mercenary work seriously in the first place, did he? Although Docs was saying something more, as expected, I couldn't bear to hear it, so I decided to open my mouth. Dot it's been a while, Docs. Do you recognize me? It seems the production skill acquired in another world is the strongest. Volume 3 Chapter 6 Here's the chapter, enjoy. Ed, Blast. Chapter 6, I tried to fight the pirates. That voice. Is you, bastard, Kukauzuka. How did you know? Of course, Ku, you bastard. You caused me a lot of trouble. On the other side of the communicator, Docs gave an eerie laugh. I would never forget your face or your voice not even for a day. My resentment runs deep. You could have used that energy in a better way. You know. Shut up. Don't tell me what to do. Docs yelled so loudly that the communicator almost broke. He's so angry. It's like an instantaneous water heater. How about having a Docs pot in each household? Dot well, I don't need it. I will refuse it with all my might. Coo. Now is the time for you to get your head out of your ass. We have ancient weapons over here. I'm going to watch you burn before I go and set Fort Port on fire. Docs finally shouted and unilaterally cut off the communication. What does he mean by setting me on fire? No, I know what he means. Anyway, Docs seems to be full of hatred toward me. In a way, 
This is a favorable development. The most annoying thing would be if Docs ignored me and started an all-out attack on Fort Port. I'm honestly grateful that we seem to be able to avoid that. As I was gathering my thoughts, Dest suddenly raised his voice. Master. Emergency. A number of magic missiles are approaching from the sky. What? I looked up and saw a cylindrical object with a tail of smoke approaching us. The number of these objects probably exceeded 100 and may have reached 200 or even 300. I activated, appraisal. Anti-calamity magic missile. This is a magic missile developed with combat against calamities in mind. The tip of the missile is pointed like a spear, and as soon as it pierces the target, the magic formula built into the missile is activated, causing a large explosion. 4,000 years ago, a similar weapon was used in the battle against the Black Dragon but it failed to even scratch its scales. I see. The magic missile must be a very powerful weapon since it bears the name Anti-Calamity. But even so, it seems that it was unable to inflict even a scratch on the Black Dragon. Thinking about it the other way around, how could I have defeated the Black Dragon with just a sword? Of course, it was thanks to the help of Iris and the spirit ring given to me by Milia, but in any case, it was a miraculous victory. Considering what happened then, the current situation with countless magic missiles in the air doesn't seem like such an extreme situation. Ku, I'm ready. Iris called out to me. She had already taken out her dragon god shield and held it in her left hand. Their dragon god barrier X effect has prevented even the attacks of the black dragon and the gluttonous dragon. If the barrier is deployed, it should easily shut out magic missiles. However, I tell Iris, there may be other attacks coming. Iris. You prepare for that one. I'll deal with the missiles. What will you do? I'll shoot them down. I replied briefly and took out a ring from my item box. Flame Emperor Dragon's Ring. It is an item that was created from the corpse of the Black Dragon with creation, and inside the large crimson gemstone, flames are blazing brightly. I put the ring on the middle finger of my left hand. Then, one of the effects Flame Emperor's Successor X was activated, and, Flame Emperor, was added to my skill set. This increases my aptitude for flame magic to the utmost limit. The target is all anti-calamity magic missiles, and I will intercept them by expending all my magic power. I thrust out my left hand, and a large magic circle spreads out from that point. Go, fire arrow. As if on cue, the magic circle began to rotate at high speed. From there, fire arrows are released with the force of machine gun, piercing every one of the magic missiles causing them to explode and burst into flames. The blue sky became a stage for the blooming of explosions. Well, Letitia let out a sigh as if she had been moved to tears. It's quite a gorgeous firework display. It really is. Dot but, Iris raised the dragon god's shield and activated their dragon god barrier X. The light barrier is deployed. Then, after a few seconds of delay, a red heat ray comes toward us in a straight line from the front. Screech. However, the heat ray could not penetrate Iris's barrier and was completely blocked. Thank you, Iris. Fufu, you're welcome. It's my job to protect Ku. I'm always grateful for your help. Dot where is the enemy? Looking in the direction of the heat rays, I saw two ships without sails on each side four in total cutting through the waves as they approached us. I immediately activated, appraisal, assault cruiser an unmanned assault vessel equipped with a magic core. The hull is covered with orichalcum and armed with a rapid-firing magic laser cannon. In the age of ancient civilization, it boasted the highest performance in both offense and defense. Speaking of rapid-firing magic laser cannons, the orichalcum golem was also armed with one. From the name, I would guess that the assault cruisers were like orichalcum golems for maritime combat. The four assault cruisers were approaching us and attacking us simultaneously with red magic lasers. It's no use, Iris shouted, and the light barrier shined even brighter. Its solidity was overwhelming, shutting out all the concentrated fire of the magic lasers. However, the story wouldn't progress if we just defend ourselves. Dest. Can you shake off the enemy's attack? Yes. If the Exceed cruiser is as maneuverable as it appears to be, it can break free. All right. Do it. Roger that. The Exceed cruiser accelerated and made a sharp left turn. Normally, with our inertia, the centrifugal force would have swept us off the ship. But since it had stability enhancement S, we only leaned a little. I grabbed the deck railing just in case and told Iris and Letitia. I will take care of the two ships on the left. Letitia will take care of the two on the right, 
is that all right? Of course, I was just about to go on a rampage. What am I supposed to do? Iris, you stay on the boat and follow behind. If Dox started to attack the city, you would take care of the defense. I understand. Don't worry about me, Ku. Just go ahead and go wild. Iris winked with her left eye and nodded. Soon after, Dest's voice rang out. Master, we're out of range of the enemy. Okay, it's time to counterattack. I took out a flying potion from my item box. As I gulped it down in one gulp, a mellow aroma filled my nostrils, and at the same time, my body floated away. Kusama, did you make that potion with creation? Too? I nodded at Letitia's words. Yeah, I'll be able to fly for a while if I drink it. Letitia, would you like some? I'm interested, but I'm a little nervous about trying it in the middle of a battle. Well, maybe some other time. I said that and told Iris. I'm going to go now. I need you to deactivate the barrier. Okay. You two take care of yourselves. Of course. Of course. Letitia and I both uttered the same line and we both jumped out of the boat simultaneously. I'm going to fly away with the flying potion, but I wondered what Letitia was going to do. And to my surprise, she was sprinting over the ocean. What in the world is the principle of that? When I looked at the surface of the sea after Letitia had run through, I saw cracked thin ice floating there. The inorganic voice of, full assist, told me. Letitia de Meteor is exercising, domination over the sea surface and is presumably forming a foothold by freezing it locally. That's interesting. It seems that, domination, is a much more versatile ability than I had imagined. But this is no time to be impressed. Let's get rid of the two ships on the left. Let's go. I manipulated the wind and headed toward the two assault cruisers. Dozens of magic lasers were flying at me to intercept me, but sometimes I avoided them and other times I received them with my bastard gauntlets. The magic power absorption S plus effect was useful here. No matter how many magic lasers hit me, they were only absorbed by the bastard gauntlet and did no damage to me. This would be an easy win. I closed the distance to some extent and took out the magic sword gram from my item box. I set it up as if I were carrying it on my right shoulder. I put all the magic power I had absorbed up to this point into the sword and activated Guild of War slash S plus. Here's your return. Receive it. From the upper left to the lower right, I swung the sword down with great force. Magic power was released from the silvery blade, becoming a huge slash that struck the two assault cruisers with a single slash. Both assault cruisers were split in half and exploded. Now, how about Letitia? If she is having a hard time, I'll help her out. So I thought and headed to the right. In the first place, I wonder what kind of fighting style Letitia had. She always speaks in a ladylike language and has a graceful manner, so it doesn't seem like she would do anything to get her hands dirty. She would probably use magic from a distance to blow away her enemies or something like that. But, when I arrived at the battlefield, I found that the scene was completely different from what I had imagined. Letitia dodged the magic lasers and came within striking distance of the first assault cruiser, and she readied her right fist. Her, with a brave shout, her right hand glowed blue. The fist, clad in light, trailed like a meteor as it struck the hull of the assault cruiser from below. It was an uppercut so magnificent that one could almost be smitten. The force of the blow transcended the laws of physics and the huge hull of the assault cruiser was launched into the sky, dented and spinning around. That's the finishing blow. Letitia moved in for the chase. This time, her legs were covered with blue flashes of light, and she kicked off the frozen surface of the sea, making a big jump. And then, her, she released a spinning kick in the air just as the assault cruiser was being pulled down by gravity. It was like a scene from a fighting game. Letitia's kick sent the assault cruiser flying diagonally downward. Ahead of the cruiser was the other assault cruiser. The two assault cruisers collided. Both assault cruisers seemed to have sustained fatal damage to their magic core, and with a blinding flash of light, they explode in a massive explosion. Against the backdrop of the flames and black smoke from the explosion, Letitia descended from the sky. Her expression was very cool. A thin layer of ice forms on the surface of the sea, and with a thud, she landed on it. When Letitia noticed me, she smiled mischievously and raised her right hand, and made a gun-shooting gesture. As I was smiling, Letitia walked over to me. As you can see, it's all taken care of. How was it? How to say it? It was bold. Foo foo. I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah, please do. I responded to Letitia's words and thought about our next move. 
The pirates were supposed to have one manned ship and four unmanned ships. In the battle just now, all the unmanned ships had been crushed. All that remained were the manned ships occupied by Dox and his crew. Suddenly, a light flashed at the edge of my vision. A magic laser was flying in a straight line toward us. The manned ship in which Dox and his crew were on board must have attacked us. Both Letitia and I jumped out of the way at the same time. It seems an invitation to the party has arrived. It's very kind of them to go out of their way to tell us where they are. In the direction from which the magic laser flew, I saw the shadow of a large ship. How would you like to attack, Kusama? Right. I'll go ahead and attract their attacks. Letitia. You come after me. Sure. I'll be ready. Letitia smiled wryly and snapped her fingers. Letitia was a very strong person and very dependable. I glanced back and saw the Exceed cruiser in the distance and Iris standing on the deck. When I waved my right hand, Iris noticed me and waved right back. It made me feel a little warm. Iris Sama has really changed, hasn't she? Letitia said sincerely. In the past, she didn't seem so cheerful. It must be thanks to Kusama. Dot I wonder. Foo foo. You're also very cute when you are embarrassed, Kusama. Letitia gave me a devilish little smile and peeked down at me. Anyway, I'll be watching the two of you as if I were a wall or a ceiling. Dot well then, let's go. Yeah, let's go. We nodded to each other and started moving at the same time. I maneuver the wind to gain altitude and head toward the enemy ship, accelerating at once. Dot it's big. The battleship is probably over 200 meters long. It had no sails similar to the unmanned assault cruisers, but its numerous turrets were crammed together on deck like hedgehogs floating in the sea. I activated, appraisal. Anti-calamity battleship Horachilcum Rocks, a supersized battleship developed by combining the technologies of ancient civilizations. Equipped with a number of magic missile turrets and rapid-firing magic laser turrets, it boasts unparalleled offensive power in naval battles and land bombardments. Its most powerful weapon is the super high power magic laser cannon on its bow. The results of the appraisal indicate that the earlier magic missiles and magic lasers were probably an attack from the Orichalcum rocks. Speaking of super high power magic laser cannons, the same thing is mounted on the destroyer Gillum's desk. It is powerful enough to vaporize tens of thousands of monsters in an instant. So if something like that were to be unleashed on the city, it would be more than just a sea of fire. It would be a catastrophe. Dot that guy, Dox, has brought out an extraordinary thing. I sighed and stored Gram in my item box. I'd like to reduce my luggage as much as possible in order to increase my mobility. I lower my altitude and daringly appear in front of the Orichalcum rocks. Countless magic laser turrets turned toward me, all at once. Okay, so far. So much for the plan. My role is a diversion. The more the Orichalcum Rox's attacks are concentrated on me, the less burden Letitia will have to bear. Oops. Dozens, no, hundreds of magic lasers attacked me in bunches. It was truly a barrage of light. I activated my dexterity and dodged through the gaps between the lasers. It was as if I was dancing. The barrage of Orichalcum Rox was getting more and more intense. I wondered if Letitia was ready to enter. Just as I thought that, one of the magic laser turrets exploded. Was it a malfunction? No, it was not. Letitia's figure was on board the Orichalcum Rox. Letitia's fist was covered with the radiance of a blue meteor and she unleashed a blow with all her might. It completely transcended the laws of physics and easily exploded a magic laser turret with mass hundreds of times greater than hers. For a moment, Letitia looked at me. I didn't hear her voice, but she said, thank you. This one is all taken care of now. It seemed to be that. Nodding my head in acknowledgement, I raised my altitude once more to get a full view of the Orichalcum rocks. In the middle of the deck, surrounded by a magic laser turret, there is a tall structure. The front of the structure was made of glass, and it looked like it offered the passengers a good view. Inside the structure, I could see a few figures of what appeared to be pirates. I am only guessing, but this is probably the bridge. Or, in other words, the command center. In human terms, it is the brain of the ship, so I want to destroy it as soon as possible. Dot OK. Thanks to Letitia's efforts. More than half of the Orichalcum Rox's magic laser turrets have already been silenced. The magic missile turret had been motionless from the start, but it may have fired all its missiles in the previous attack. This would make it easier to approach. I swooped down and approached the command center in a straight line and with the same momentum, 
smashed through the glass in front of it and rushed in. Thanks to my Fenra coat and armored bear armor, I didn't even get a scratch. Maneuvering the wind, I put on a sudden stop and came to a stop in midair. I land on the floor and look around. The place is about the size of a school classroom, with shiny monitors and suspiciously glowing machines set up along the walls. It has the atmosphere of a space battleship from an anime or manga. The number of pirates in the room was roughly counted at about 30. I jumped in out of nowhere, and everyone had a look of astonishment on their faces. That's strange. Where's Docs? There was no doubt that this was the command center. But there was no one among the pirates who looked like Docs. Where in the world could he be? As I looked around again, one of the pirates came to his senses and shouted out. It's been a long time, Kukazuka. Boss Docs ain't here. Dot who's that? The pirate was large and muscular his chin covered with a shaggy beard. I don't recognize him at all. I thought and activated, appraisal. His name is Genuma, and the two skills he possesses are, axe technique, and, fighting spirit enchantment. Considering his words and actions, he is probably one of the three mercenaries who abandoned Grom San's escort. Thank you for coming all the way here to get killed. Hey, you bastards, get him. When Genuma shouted this, the other pirates looked up and picked up their weapons. Swords, spears, axes all were well worn, and may had rust on them. Weapons are your partners to whom you owe your lives, so why don't you take good care of them? The pirates, with their whole bodies filled with murderous intent, rushed toward me all at once. Too slow. I dodged a slash and grabbed a nearby pirate in the face with my left hand. The effect of the bastard gauntlet white scorpion thunderbolt X is activated. https colon slash slash nikes translation home dot files dot wordpress dot com slash two thousand and twenty two slash o six slash o o o o two eight dot jpg ag. The pirate's body trembled with pale sparks. I let go of the pirate, and he collapsed to the floor. White tide die. Another pirate came up from behind me with a spear thrust. No use. I turned around and threw a kick. The blow struck the spearhead squarely in the side, sending it flying far away. That's ridiculous. The pirate had a look of astonishment on his face. I stepped forward and launched a body blow while activating White Scorpion Thunderbolt X. Gah, ag. The pirate was sent flying backward in a parabolic trajectory, crashing into a machine near the wall. I kept up the momentum knocking out three, four, and then five more. After knocking out about fifteen, the pirates slowed down. W what the hell are you doing? He's alone. Why can't you kill him? Is this guy really human? S shouldn't we just give up? The pirates' faces showed signs of fear. Many of them had lost their will to fight and were now running away. Is the game already decided? Just as I was thinking about this, Genuma shouted angrily, You bastards, don't be cowardly. It doesn't matter that he is a dragon slayer. He is still a human being, and he is bound to get exhausted sooner or later. Surround him, and keep attacking him. Eh alright, Genuma Aniki. We will make you regret that you ever picked a fight with us. If we kill you, we'll become the dragon slayers. Prepare yourselves. Dot what's going on? As soon as Genuma raised his voice. The pirates regained their fighting spirit. It's too inexplicable a situation. Then, full assist, automatically activated and told me. The activation of Genuma's skill, fighting spirit enchantment, was confirmed. There, fighting spirit enchantment, is a skill that affects the mental state of the allies and increases their will to fight. I see. So the pirates suddenly became motivated because of this skill. It seems the production skill acquired in another world is the strongest. Volume 3 Chapter 7 Sponsored Chapter by Patreon, and you may also want to check our new co for here. Ed, Blast. Chapter 7 I tried to settle the past scores. Genuma's, Fighting Spirit Enchantment, instantly transformed the previously frightened pirates into deadly warriors. This is a pretty powerful skill and would have been welcomed with open arms in the army or in the knighthood. Yet Genuma became a mercenary and eventually reduced himself to a pirate who terrorized the people of Fort Port. Maybe he had a personality problem, but it was a waste. At times like this, I think of Chrome Sand's words. There is a big difference between drawing a good hand and making good use of a good hand. There are plenty or people who are blessed with good skills but cannot use them or who can only use them in a way that makes those around them miserable. Genuma is a person who is blessed with skill but cannot make good use of it, 
and he can only use it in a way that makes those around him miserable. I was thinking about this when I use Ed White Scorpion Thunderbolt X, taking the pirates' consciousness away from them. The pirates were initially fired up with fighting spirit by their fighting spirit enchantment, but as they were overwhelmed, the effect of the skill seemed to fade, and their faces began to show signs of fear again. D damn it, is he a monster? Ag tt there's no way we can win. He's too strong. Ag genuine help me. Jejejejej. There were about 30 pirates in the command center, all of whom were stunned only Genuma remained. T they are useless. Genuma spat and kicked the head of a pirate who was lying at his feet as if he were poking it with the tip of his toe. But, Ku, you must be getting tired too, right? Ha ha ha, don't hide it. I can tell. No, I'm not too tired at all. I think I can afford to deal with another 200 people. But I don't have to tell Genuma that. When I kill you. I will be the Dragon Slayer. Prepare yourself. The Dragon Slayer is a phrase that Genuma's subordinate mentioned earlier. Maybe he liked it? In any case, I have no intention of letting him kill me. Genuma readied his axe and came at me, swinging it from side to side. Ha 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 ha. I have the axe technique, and I will cut you in half. The sound of the wind blowing in the air echoed. Now, what should I do? In this case, I guess an axe for an axe. I took out a wooden Haikino axe from my item box. Seeing this, Genuma gives me a mocking look. What are you going to do with the wooden toy? This axe is made of orichalcum. Orichalcum? Is that from an ancient civilization? You know it so well, huh? I found this in the ruins too. You <coughs> Genuma raised his axe and tried to smash it at me. Now, I twisted my body and threw the Hykena wooden axe at him with a side throw. The axe spun like a boomerang and slammed into Genuma's axe. Clank. A high-pitched sound rang out. Hykena's wooden axe and the Orichalcum metal axe. The winner of the clash between the two was the Hykena wooden axe. The Orichalcum metal axe was shattered at the blade and was thrown out of Genuma's hand. This would normally be an impossible scene. But the Hykena wooden axe was granted throwing critical A+. As a result, it was powerful enough to shatter the Orichalcum. Wow! Genuma's eyes widened in astonishment. How could he expose such a gap in the middle of a battle? I had already begun my next move. I closed the distance with Genuma and grabbed him by the throat. Sorry, but this is the end. And no way. Gagagagaga! A bolt of lightning gushed from my bastard gauntlet. Genuma's entire body trembled and he eventually lost consciousness. At least I've taken control of the command center now. Next, let's go get that dock sky. It's inefficient to search around in the dark, and I'd like to save myself this trouble if possible. Dot I know a good way to do it. I suddenly thought of something and activated, auto mapping. A blue white window appeared in front of me, displaying a map of the Orichalcum rocks. Auto mapping, is a skill like a smartphone map application, but its function is a higher level version of a map application. In addition to providing route guidance by specifying a destination, it can also search for and locate people. Search for Dox's whereabouts. Can you do that? I asked, and the blue-white window flashed on and off. After only three seconds, a red light spot appeared on the map. Apparently, Dox was hiding in a hidden room at the rear of the ship. Now, let's go. Inside the Orichalcum rocks, an alarm was blaring alerting everyone of an intruder. I ran through the long, narrow corridors, and every time I encountered a pirate on the way, I used Ed White Scorpion Thunderbolt X to knock them unconscious. Damn. I didn't hear the Dragon Slayer coming. Ag. Damn it. I shouldn't have followed the Dox Sky. Igigigigigi. Hi I. I can't win. I can't win against him. You gu 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 gu. The number of pirates I had defeated, including those at Genuma's place, was now over 50. Suddenly, there was a loud explosion in the distance. Letitia was probably rampaging elsewhere. It's hard for the pirates to make an enemy of the transmigrator and a calamity together at once, isn't it? As I was thinking about this as if it were someone else's problem, the communicator in my pocket vibrated. When I picked it up, it was Dox. Ku, you seem to be doing whatever you want, don't you? Yeah, I did. I've defeated Genuma and Dox. You're next. Ha 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 ha. You can be happy now, while you still can. The one who's being cornered isn't me. It's you, Ku. Dox was being very stubborn. A desperate attempt to find a way forward. It doesn't seem to be like that, and I'm not sure how I feel about it. The room I am in also serves as a backup command center, from which I can control the ship's main weapon. I've just set my sights on Fort Port. Now it's up to you. 
Dot what are you going to do now? If you give up, I may consider calling the attack by ship's main weapon. I assume he means the super high powered magic laser cannon. If such a thing were to hit the city, it would cause a tremendous number of deaths. That must be avoided at all costs. You're being very cowardly, huh? Docs, shut up. There are no rules in battle. Ha 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 ha. Docs spoke confidently as if he was sure he would win. What are you going to do now? If you're going to decide, decide quickly. Otherwise, you won't make it in time. If I give up, you'll reconsider your attack, won't you? Oh, I'm a man of my word. On second thought, you're still going to attack, right? Wow. Docs was absolutely astonished by my response. How did you know that? I knew you'd think of something like that. I sighed. I can tell what a scoundrel like you is thinking. Dot I'm sorry, but I won't let you lay a finger on the city. I hung up the call on the magic communicator, put it in my pocket, and took a hyena mallet from my item box. The effect is wild destruction S+. Plus. According to the map in there, auto mapping, there is a hidden room just a wall away from where I am, and that is where Dox is hiding. Uh, I raised the mallet and slammed it into the wall with all my might. Boom. The wall shattered with a sound like a bomb blast. Beyond that, I saw Dox. He was suddenly thrown back and slumped to the floor. WWW what the hell is going on here? It doesn't make any sense to break through a wall made of orichalcum. That's a dirty trick. You're the one who said there are no rules in battle, Dox. I stored the hyena mallet in my item box, grabbed Dox's face, which was still slumped over, and activated White Scorpion's Thunderbolt X. Ah. Agagagaga. Dox's entire body was enveloped in a blue-white bolt of lightning and he lost consciousness, with his white eyes rolling back. After putting Dox out of his consciousness, I activated, auto-mapping, and displayed all the remaining pirates' whereabouts. I walk around the ship and subdue them one by one. The last one seemed to be at the very back of the deck. I headed that way and saw that Letitia was just about to fight. This is the end. Uh, An uppercut like a meteor struck the pirate's lower jaw, knocking him unconscious. Around them, Several unconscious pirates were lying in a heap. Looking at Letitia, her face and body were unscathed, and her clothes were almost undisturbed. There was no doubt that she was quite capable. Few. Letitia took a breath, then turned to me and smiled. Ara, Kusama, were you watching? You've done a great job. How many people did you beat? I would say about 40, at a rough count. How about you? Kusama, about Tati. I also defeated Dox. Now everything is under control. It was quite a hard battle, wasn't it? Letitia raised her right fist with a mischievous look on her face as she said that. I raised my right fist as well, and we bumped fists together. I'm glad you helped out with the pirate's subjugation. I appreciate it. I am the one who should thank you. Thanks to you, Kusama, I have been able to do it with ease. Shall we go back to Fort Port? Yes. Let's do that. We can take this ship back to Fort Port. It would be killing two birds with one stone since we could carry all the unconscious pirates with us. We decided to head to the command center to get the Orichalcan rocks moving. We were walking side by side through the ship's corridors when I felt a gaze. I feel like I'm being watched. Letitia is walking right beside me, but she has been glancing at me since a few minutes ago with a thoughtful expression on her face. I wonder what is going on. Letitia, is there something you want to say? When I asked her that, she looked as if she had come to her senses. After blinking several times, she slowly opened her mouth. I apologize for this. I was just thinking about my brother. Your brother, you say? Um, I'm talking about my calamity of a younger brother the gleaming greedy dragon. I wonder where he is now. Do you have any clues? No. Nothing solid at the moment. But he is the type of person who can't leave someone in need, and I'm sure he's helping people somewhere in the world. If there is a village targeted by bandits, he will protect all the villagers to make sure they are unharmed and capture every single bandit. As the name greed implies, he will achieve a perfectly happy ending. Is that considered greed? It would bring evil to justice exactly, with no casualties. I don't see anything wrong with that at all. In fact, I sympathize with it. I understand exactly how you feel. Letitia looked at me with her deep blue eyes and nodded. Let me tell you one thing. The name given to a calamity brought in from outside the world has two sides of the same coin. My brother has a strong sense of responsibility. He never cuts corners when he decides to do something, and he always tries to do it perfectly until the end. Dot, but that can be turned around to mean greed for the best possible outcome, can't it? Dot, well. Yes, I understand what she means. 
although it is a bit confusing at times. In short, it's a matter of saying what matters. What about you, Letitia? I don't feel that you are arrogant. Fufu, I'm glad you think so, Kusama. Letitia giggled and continued to speak. I have decided to use my power to protect people. I am determined to strike with my iron fist of justice against those who take away someone's life or property unreasonably. Dot, but that's only justifying my own violence in the name of justice isn't it? So you call it arrogance? Letitia nodded in agreement with my words. I also think that the terms arrogance and greed are too biased and only focus on the negative aspects of the word. The entity that brought the calamity into this world and gave it a name must have a twisted nature. I'd like to punch him in the face, though. Who exactly is the entity that brought the calamity into this world? Unfortunately, that part is missing from my memory. It is also possible that the memory was intentionally erased. While we were talking like this, we arrived at the command center. When I touched the suspicious looking machine by the wall, dexterity, was activated, and the operating instructions flowed into my mind. I ran my fingers over the buttons and keyboard here and there and set it to move to Fort Port. This way, I wouldn't have to carry the unconscious pirates killing two birds with one stone. Letitia sighed in admiration as she watched me set the course of the Orichalcum rocks. You can handle the machines of ancient civilizations so well, can't you, Kusama? I was truly astonished. I have the dexterity, skill, you know. It's thanks to that. It's a handy skill, isn't it? I wonder if you could share it with me? That would be difficult indeed. Fufu, I'm just kidding. Letitia let out a small smile. By the way, Kusama, I agree that we should use this ship to carry the pirates back to Fort Port, but I think it might surprise the people of the city. I agree with you. I nodded at Letitia's words. If we let the Orichalcum rocks approach Fort Port, the city might be mistaken for the start of the pirate attack, and the city could be plunged into a panic. We should explain this to them well in advance. It would be better if Letitia or I reported the pirate subjugation to the city in advance, wouldn't it? If so. I think Kusama would be more suitable for the job. The words of the famous Dragon Slayer are much more persuasive. Dot well, you're right. It is a little embarrassing to admit this up front, but the name Dragon Slayer is well known in Fort Port. It cannot be undone now, and if that is the case, I should reconsider how I'm using it and take advantage of it. I understand. Then, I'll go back to the city first. I've set the ship to automatically head for the port of Fort Port. So Letitia is free to do as you please until then. Understood. However, it would be a shame to make only Kusama work, so I think I should put domination on the pirates. We don't want them to escape after arriving in the city, do we? Indeed, it would be better to eliminate the seeds of trouble. I am glad you understand. Then, let's do what we both have to do. I was about to fly back to the Exceed Cruiser, but it was past the 30 minute duration of the flying potion. Okay. Let's open the second bottle. I took out an additional bottle of flying potion from my item box and gulped it down. Then I floated in the air and slowly left the command center of Orichalcum Rocks. With the battle over and my mind at ease, I took a walk in the air to take in the surrounding scenery. Turning my eyes to the south, I could faintly make out the outline of a city in the distance. Perhaps that is the cityscape of Fort Port. Looking north, on the opposite side, the shimmering as your sea stretches out endlessly. Beyond this should be the royal capital, but as expected, it does not seem to be visible from here. To the east and west, small islands dot the landscape. Come to think of it, where did Dox and the others get their ancient weapons? Maybe there are ruins on one of the islands. Well, that would be something we could investigate carefully after the case was over. While I was thinking about this, the Exceed Cruiser came into view. I lowered my altitude and approached the deck of the ship. Then Iris noticed me and waved her right hand. Dest, still docked with the hull of the ship, also welcomed me with a cheerful wave of both hands. Welcome back, Master. Ku, good job. Are you hurt? I'm fine. The pirates are all defeated, and all we have to do now is to return to the city. After I told her that, I gave her a brief explanation of what had happened since we left the Exceed Cruiser and what we were going to do next. While I was talking, both Iris and Dest nodded their heads with serious expressions on their faces. As usual, they seemed to be listening carefully. So that's why we're returning to Fort Port in advance. Dest, 
Would you mind turning around and heading back to the city, as you command? Dest saluted with a broad gesture of his right arm. Both of his eyes flashed with a fierce twinkle. Accelerate. Turning around. Full speed ahead. The Exceed cruiser's engines roared wildly. The ship made a U-turn, turning sharply to the right, and began to sail toward Fort Port. I rested my weight on the deck railing for a while staring blankly at the sky. The sun's rays felt nice and warm. While I was resting in a relaxed mood, Iris came up next to me on my left. Hey, Ku, do you mind if I join you now? What's up? I was thinking about Letitia. She looked like Ku, didn't she? Is that so? I tilted my head. There is nothing about her that matches me. Our gender and age are different, and I think it's more difficult to find something in common between us. Letitia is like the hero of the story, isn't she? Well. Yes, I can agree with her on that point. She doesn't tolerate evil and doesn't miss the call for help. The word ally of justice fits her well. Dot I mean, there's a big difference between her and me. Don't you think? Eh? Iris raised her voice as if puzzled. Did I say something strange? Ku is no different. I think you're a great hero. You fought to protect the people of Fort Port this time, and you've saved a lot of people before, haven't you? It just turns out the way it happens. Just a coincidence. But you could have run away like the people in the mercenary guild, right? Dot well, I guess. I suddenly recalled the battle with the gluttonous dragon. Up until the middle of the battle, I was totally at a disadvantage, and I even considered abandoning the defense of the city and retreat. However, in the end, I chose to face the dragon and managed to defeat it. In retrospect, it was like that from the time I first came to the other world. When Chrome San was attacked by the armored bear. I had the option of pretending I didn't see it and walking away from the scene. At the time, Chrome San was nothing more than a stranger to me. What's more, I myself didn't realize how much skill I was blessed with, and I was terrified to the point of cowering when I saw the terrifying looking armored bear. So why did I try to fight it? To be honest, I don't really know myself. If I were to venture a guess, I would say that when I was little, I had always wanted to be a firefighter. To be more precise. I wanted to be a hero who could reach out to people in crisis. However, that was a child's dream who did not know the reality. As I grew older, I came to understand how the world works and concluded that heroes do not exist in reality, so I gave up on my dream and chose another career. However, I guess the feeling I had when I longed to be a hero remained with me. Maybe that's what drives me. Dot yes. Maybe this guess is not wrong. I want to be a hero who can save someone. In this world. I have once again reached for the dream I once gave up on. The result of these efforts is the connection with Iris, Chrome San, and many others, as well as the Dragon Slayer title, I suppose. Dot I've become the person I wanted to be without even realizing it. It seems the production skill acquired in another world is the strongest. Volume 3 Chapter 8 Here's the chapter, enjoy. Ed, Blast. Chapter 8, I Return to Fort Port. The Exceed cruiser arrived at Fort Port in about 15 minutes. The harbor was ruined by the pirates' bombardment, but it was rebuilt with my creation. Naturally, there are also granted effects, one of which is Ramp Formation X. As the Exceed cruiser stopped moving, Devil Treant's roots grew and extended from the harbor to form a ladder for embarkation and disembarkation. Okay, let's go. It's kind of a big fuss. Iris was right. There was a bit of a festival going on around the harbor. In addition to the city's residents, Lily, Zurara, and even the Knights of the Dawn have gathered. The density of the crowd was incredible. As Iris and I descended the ladder side by side, Lily and Zurara came up to us. Welcome back, Kusan. Master San, we've been waiting for you. Are you okay? Are you okay? Iris and I are both fine. We've taken out the main group of pirates. And how did it go on your side? Fufu. We did our job properly. Praise us, praise us. Zurara's face grew a little taller, and his chest, puffed out with a proud expression on his face. Lily added, supplementing Zurara's words. It was all as predicted in my, foresight. Every single one of the separate units has been captured and taken to jail. All right. Thank you, both of you. I pat Lily with my right hand and Zurara with my left thanking each of them for their work. That's ticklish. He he he. Master San patted me. Yay. Seeing the two of them so happy makes me happy too. When I looked towards the Knights of the Dawn, more than 1,000 knights kneeled down all at once. First of all, I would like to thank them. Everyone did a great job. I may ask for your help again in the future. When that happens, I'll be counting on you. As I said this, 
Zurara walked over to the knights. It looked like Zurara and some of the knights were exchanging words with each other. The knights of the dawn are undead summoned by the sacred Gjlehon and are unable to speak with those who are living. This is probably why we cannot hear their voices at all. Since Zurara is not a human but a magical creature, he is able to speak with the knights. After a while, Zurara came to me, rolling on the ground. Master San. I've heard what the knights have to say. Thank you. May I ask you to tell me? Yes. Let's see. According to Zurara, the knights had this to say. We are truly grateful for your kind words, they are too good for us. We, the knights of the dawn, pledge our allegiance to you once again. We are truly grateful to you for summoning us this time. Please let us fight beside you next time. Zurara further informed me, all the other knights were also very grateful to you, Master San. Although it is me who should be thanking them. If it hadn't been for the knights of the dawn this time, we might have missed the separate unit. I'm really grateful for that part. I feel bad about keeping them on the ground forever, so I think it's time to send them back to where they belong. I took out the sacred Gjlehon from my item box. I put my mouth on the mouthpiece and blow on it with my lips trembling. Foo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-oo-
The pirate's attitude was like a different person compared to when they were fighting me. There was no outburst of violence in the process, just obedience itself. Perhaps it was because of Letitia's domination. The pirates must have been ordered not to disobey the guards. While I was thinking about this, Letitia comes down from the Orichalcum rocks. Phew, as expected, it takes a lot of work to put domination on all the pirates. Good work. It was tough work, wasn't it? Yes. Thank you. Anyway, that settles the matter for now, doesn't it? Yes, I guess so. I nodded at Letitia's words. The city suffered zero damage, and we caught all the pirates. It's a happy ending, no questions asked. Foo foo. What's wrong? I was thinking about my brother a little. Dot he used to help people around him and say things like, happy ending, no questions asked, too. That's an amazing coincidence. To be honest, it's hard to believe that we are strangers that we even share the same habit of speaking. I have a feeling I'm going to have a good drink with Letitia's brother. After that, we were taken by branch manager Jess to the Adventurers Guild. We would like to hear a detailed report on the pirate extermination, and a place where we can talk calmly would be good. Is the branch manager's office okay with you? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Dot actually. One of Kusan's acquaintances arrived in Fort Port just a few minutes ago. She is waiting for you at the Adventurer's Guild. Would you like her to be present as well? My acquaintance? Who on earth could he be talking about? I headed for the branch manager's office with my head slightly tilted, only to find a familiar figure there. Kusan, Iris San. It's been a while. I finally caught up with you. She had a rather childish face and lovely, round golden eyes that sparkled. Her name is Milia and she is the assistant branch manager of the Adventurers Guild Un branch, an elite member dispatched from the headquarters in the royal capital. If you focus on her title, you may get the impression that she is unapproachable, but she is cheerful and easy to get along with, and I personally feel that I can get along with her. When we were all seated on the sofa, I asked her, Milia, what brings you here? Due to work reasons, I also left Tan the day after Kusan departed. This time I took the shortest route north through the Fatos Mountains. It's what you call a back road. Milia, you went that route? Iris shouted in surprise. The Fatos Mountains are supposed to be crawling with very dangerous monsters in the back. How did you manage to survive? Foo foo. I'm lucky. Dot just kidding, but it's thanks to you, isn't it? Dot me? The topic suddenly turned to me, and I was a little confused. What did I do? When the Great Flood happened? All the high danger monsters living deep in the Fatos Mountains also rushed to Arn, and Kusan burned them away with your Gillum lasers, didn't you? Boom. And Milia put on a smiling face and spread her hands wide. Perhaps it was a gesture that conjured up the image of an explosion. It seems that the high danger monsters were uprooted and reduced to ashes at that time. The Pathos Mountains now have a much lower concentration of monsters. So there are only a few lonely wolves and punch rabbit at the foot of the mountains. So that's why you were able to get to Fort Port so smoothly. That's right. Well, now, let's leave it at that. It seems that you have been very active in this city, too, Kusan. Since I'm here, may I ask you and branch manager just to let me join in on your talk? Yes, of course. Is that okay with you, everyone? I'm fine. What about you? Lily Chan? Um, Iris's words made Lily look a little puzzled. I have never met Milia San before, so first of all, may I introduce myself to her? Come to think of it, this is Lily's first meeting with Milia. If that is the case, it would be better to introduce them properly. I turned to Milia and said, This girl is Lily Luna Lunaria, a priestess of the God of War religion. Please get along with her. I'm Lily. Pleased to meet you. Lily stood up from the sofa and bowed. At the same time, Milia also made a small bow. I am Milia. Lily San, could it be that you are a God of War's shrine maiden? Dot how did you know that? When Lily asked curiously, Milia proudly puffed out her chest. There are many users of light magic in the God of War religion, so when the undead appear, the Adventurers Guild sometimes requests their cooperation. Because of this, I know the faces and names of the high ranking priests memorized. Wow, Milia and Ain is very resourceful. On Lily's lap, Zurara jumped up and down in a small leap. Then, do you know my name? Let's see. You are the helper slime from the underground city, right? Yes. My name is Zurara. Master San gave me my name. Fufafu, that's a very pretty name. And, that's Letitia San over there, 
isn't it? Could it be that Milia and Letitia know each other? Good day, Milia Sama. We met before at the Adventurers Guild headquarters in the royal capital. Didn't we? It was since I was present at the examination for Letitia San to become a C rank adventurer. Wasn't it? I see. When one is promoted from D rank to C rank, one must take an examination at the Adventurers Guild headquarters in the royal capital. Milia originally worked at the headquarters, so it makes sense that she also met Letitia at that time. Letitia San, are you traveling with Kusan and the others as well? Yes. I have been accompanying them since yesterday. Letitia nodded with an elegant gesture and continued to speak. Even so, Milia Sama seems to be very fond of Kusama, going out of her way to be present for the report. Of course. After all, Kusan is a super newcomer with great potential. Promising super newcomer. I haven't heard that term in a long time. Since I had been called the Dragon Slayer ever since I left Un, it made me feel nostalgic. After the introductions, it was time for the report. I will start by explaining the events leading up to our return to Fort Port after our mission to defeat the main group of pirates. Iris and Letitia supplemented me when I left something out, so it was very easy for me to talk. When I finished my story, Milia muttered with a mysterious expression on her face. Kusan, aren't you becoming more out of the ordinary than when you were in Arn? I think so too. Iris nodded with a sincere look on her face. Creating a new harbor on the spot or summoning more than 1,000 ancient knights together. It's beyond the boundaries of human beings, isn't it? I think it's really wonderful that you can have such great power and yet remain a good person without going astray. I respect you so much. You are giving me too much praise. I told her bluntly and decided to change the subject. The next step is to talk about the pirate detachment. That is all I have to report. Lily, can I ask you to explain? Yes. Lily's voice was a little stiff. She has always been shy, so she is probably nervous about speaking in front of everyone. However, as long as you are alive, you will probably have many occasions like this, so you should think of it as practice and do your best. Lily. Together with Zurara, the Knights of the Dawn, and a group of local adventurers, left the city of Fort Port and headed west toward the highway. The local adventurers were naturally familiar with the geography of the area and knew all the back roads and secret paths. With this information, Lily commanded the Knights of the Dawn based on her foresight, and captured every single pirate detachment. Lily Onichan did a fantastic job, Zurara said a little excitedly his body trembling with excitement. She gave the knights instructions, and in no time at all, they had the pirates in custody. Isn't that amazing, Lily? When I called out to her in admiration, she replied in a subdued tone. I don't think I could have done it on my own. It was thanks to Zurara San, the Knights of the Dawn members and local adventurers who lent a hand. And, Kusan said I was a trustworthy friend. Lily slowly placed her right hand on her chest as if checking the location of a precious treasure. Apparently, my words have touched Lily's heart more deeply than I had imagined. I'm kind of embarrassed. With the report completed, the next step was to discuss the reward. Branch manager Jess offered a sum in the hundreds of millions, but I thought about it for a while and then decided to ask one question. How many ships were destroyed by the pirates' bombardment this time? Right. Jess put his right hand on his silver-rimmed glasses and thought for a while before answering. It is just an estimate, but I think there were no less than 100 boats destroyed. Most of them are local fishing boats, but there are also a few boats that are used as liaison ships to other parts of the country. I understand. Then use my payment to cover the damage. Dot, huh? Branch manager Jess rolled his eyes as if my words had come as a surprise to him. The silver-rimmed glasses were slipping off from his ears in surprise. What did you just say? When I created the Exceed Cruiser with creation, I was allowed to use the wreckage of the ship that was destroyed. I feel bad about taking it for free, and I would like to donate my payment to pay for it. Kusan restored the harbor for us, and that seems to be enough for the price. No. I think it's more like change. The harbor was just an incidental repair. Don't worry about it. Dotto. Yes, I know. What's going to happen to the Orajilkan rocks? I will answer that question. Melia raised a small hand and said, If we are to go by the rules of the Adventurers Guild, all of the pirates' possessions will belong to Kusan. However, the Orajilkan rocks is very large, so if you have trouble handling it, the Adventurers Guild headquarters will be happy to accept it. What do you think? Perhaps it could be used as a material to make another item. For the time being, 
please consider it as my trophy. I understand. What will you do about where to store it? Oops, I forgot about that. Dot I hope it can go into my item box. As expected. The Orichalcan rocks seem to be too large and was excluded from storage. The capacity is unlimited, but there's a limit to the size of the entrance. The fact that the Exceed Cruiser can be taken in and out means that it must be at least 15 meters in length, but the Orichalcan rocks is more than 10 times that size. Literally, it is an order of magnitude larger. Now, what should I do? As I was pondering this, branch manager just said to me, if so, the Fort Port branch will take care of it for you. In exchange for that, let it be in lieu of a reward. So, the management of the Orichilcan Rocks was consigned to the Adventurers Guild branch in Fort Port. Normally, we would have paid a consignment fee, but since it was in lieu of a reward, it was free of charge. I am very grateful for this. By the way, this is a completely different topic, but my wallet is in a terrible mess right now. I was paid a considerable amount of money for saving the cities from major crises in Un, Tu, and Surya, and Count Maillard was going to pay me 200 million kumsa every year for 10 years as a return gift for saving his life. I thought it was too much, so I bargained with him, but he said, I really like your unselfishness. Let's make it 500 million kumsa. In the end, the butler who was there interceded and the price was returned to 200 million kumsa per year. But that aside, I was working for a black company in Japan and was paid only a meager salary every month. So when I was told I would be rewarded in the hundreds of millions, it didn't ring a bell, and I didn't know how to handle it. I was afraid of getting carried away and destroying myself, so the best thing to do would be to have them use it for the people of the city. It would also help the economy two birds with one stone. It was late in the evening when we left the Adventurers Guild building after our talk. The city was very lively, and all the residents had cheerful expressions on their faces. Seeing such a scene filled me with a sense of accomplishment. I am so glad that we were able to protect the city. Ku, what are you going to do now? I thought for a moment before answering Iris's question. I think we should go to the inn first. Dot speaking of which, what about Letitia? Rooms for me, Iris. Lily, and Zurara have already been reserved through the Scarlet Trading Company. Letitia started accompanying us last night, so she's not included in the number of people who will be staying. For the time being, I will go with you to your inn. If there is a room available, I will take it myself. If not, I will find somewhere else. Please rest assured. I understand. Well then, let's get going. Master San, what kind of inn do you have in mind for today? If there is a hot spring, I will be very happy. Apparently, Lily is a fan of hot springs. Fort Port is a port town, and it would be ideal if there were open air baths with a view of the ocean. It seems the production skill acquired in another world is the strongest. Volume 3 Chapter 9 Sponsored Chapter by Patreon, and you may also want to check our new co for here. Enjoy, Ed, Blast. Chapter 9 I tried to relax and enjoy the night. We headed in the opposite direction of the sea to the southeast of the city. We climbed up the slope, which was illuminated by a mad red light. Then we saw a magnificent brick building. Is that the inn? Probably, yes. I turned my eyes to the sign on the building while I was listening to Iris's words. Landscape Pavilion. No doubt about it. This is where we will be staying tonight. The place was located on top of a small hill, and when we stopped in front of the building and looked behind us, we could see the cityscape of Fort Port spread out below us. Hey. There's an observation deck over there. Iris pointed to a large wooden deck that extended out toward the ocean. It's sunset now, and it would be a good time to take in the view. Let's take a little detour. Looking out from the observation deck, the sun was setting over the horizon. The ocean reflected the sunlight and sparkled. It's beautiful. Wow, the ocean is so bright. Lily and Zurara both exclaimed in admiration. Incidentally, the wooden deck was surrounded by railings so Zurara couldn't see anything from his line of sight. Perhaps because of this, Lily placed Zurara on top of her own head. She held him firmly with both hands to prevent him from accidentally tumbling down. Lillianichin, are you sure I'm not too heavy? It's fine. The sea is beautiful, isn't it? Yes. It looks delicious, like tomato soup. Delicious. When I tilted my head at the expression that was too unique, Letitia, who was right next to me, said with a wry smile. Perhaps Zurara-sama is hungry. Oh, I see. Zurara is quite a glutton, and when he is hungry, it's probably inevitable that all he can think of is food. Perhaps. By the way, 
What is Letitia doing? I've been inspired, so I've been scribbling a little. I looked at Letitia's hand and saw that she was running a pencil through her sketchbook at great speed. She was using only a graphite pencil, but she had managed to capture the colors of the sunset with just the right amount of shading. You're very good at it. Thank you very much. Please let me paint your portrait one day. It would be boring for you to draw me. No, of course not. You have a very attractive face. I'm sorry but your flattery will get you nothing. Ara, I am only giving you my honest impression. Letitia gave a devilish smile and went back to her sketches. Geez, you gotta stop teasing an adult. I shrugged my shoulders and left Letitia's side to stand by Iris. Iris was leaning against the railing of the wooden deck, quietly looking down on the city. Her crimson hair and eyes sparkle like jewels in the evening sun. Dot I admired her figure for a while. What's wrong, Ku? Oh, no. Nothing. I came to my senses when Iris spoke to me. I was just a little hazy, that's all. Maybe you're tired from defeating the pirates? Maybe. Kuro, you've been very active this time, haven't you? Shall I rub your shoulders? No need to go that far. I'll just take it as a compliment. Oh, that's too bad. Iris said this in a joking tone of voice and turned her gaze toward the sea again. Beyond this sea is the royal capital, isn't it? It's a five-day boat ride away, I think. It's pretty far isn't it? Yeah, it is. Dot I guess Ku's hometown is probably even further away. Well, yeah, I haven't told anyone that I'm from a different world yet. However, I have known Iris for a long time, and I think she would understand. Maybe I'll find an opportunity to explain it to her at some point. Dot I suddenly noticed that Letitia was looking at us with an unusually warm gaze. What's the matter? For some reason, Letitia nodded deeply with a satisfied look on her face and raised her sketchbook above her head. There were not drawings but words written on it. Was it a message to me? I'm sorry to disturb you too, so we'll go into the inner head of you. No, there is no need for you to be so concerned about it. We've enjoyed the view, and it's time to check in. When I entered the lobby of Landscape Pavilion through the main entrance, I saw many employees lined up in a row. It looked like a department store just after opening. Welcome. Kukazaku Sama and his party. Welcome to Landscape Pavilion. Thank you very much for defeating the pirates. All of us here at Landscape Pavilion are truly honored that the famous Dragon Slayer has chosen to stay with us. Please come this way. Receiving an enthusiastic welcome from the employees, we headed to the reception area at the back of the lobby. We asked about Letitia's accommodation, and fortunately, a room of the same grade as ours was available. How about this room? Yes. That will be fine. Thank you. Very well, then. I will show you to your room. Our rooms were all on the top floor of the inn. The room assignment was one for me and Zurara, one for Aris and Lily, and one for Letitia, making a total of three rooms. After a short rest in the room, we would gather in the lobby for dinner. I understand. I have to get ready, so how about thirty minutes later? That's fine with me. How about Lily and Letitia? No problem. I'm fine. Two. What about Zurara's armor? I'm full of energy 24 hours a day. Full power slime. Well then, I'll see you in the lobby in 30 minutes. I said that, wrapped up the conversation, and went into the room with Zurara. It was a suite of rooms. It has not only a bedroom but also a kitchen, a parlor, and even a shower room. Incidentally, the inn's open air bath is on the roof and seems to offer a panoramic view of the entire city. I'm curious to see what kind of view it has and I'll have to check it out. With this in mind, I lay down on the bed in the bedroom. Phew. As I lay on my back, resting, Zurara jumped on my back with a plop. Master San, I'm going to give you a massage. Can I ask you to do it? Yes, I'll take care of it. I'll do it. Zurara's voice sounded full of enthusiasm, and he began to rub my shoulders. Whoa. Crack, 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 crack. A cracking sound, no longer human in level rings out from my shoulder joints. I had been massaged by Zurara into before, but the sound was more intense than that time. Perhaps the intense battle after the intense battle had exacerbated the stiffness in my shoulders. Master San, you should have this done not only on your shoulders but also on your lower back and your whole back. Can I have you do that as well? Of course. Help her energy, at full throttle. Woo -ah. My back, no, my whole body is about to fall apart, but strangely enough, it didn't hurt, rather, it felt good. The blood circulation improved as the stiff muscles relaxed, and the body felt warm and fluffy. It felt as if I was under a blanket, even though I was not covered with a futon. Phew, a yawn leaked out involuntarily. Thank you, 
Zurara, I'm feeling much better now. Wow, I'm so happy. Zurara was innocently pleased and continued to speak. Master San took me out of the underground city. I'm just returning the favor. Zurara is a magical creature created by the technology of an ancient civilization and was originally not allowed to go outside the underground city. But after I rewrote the system, the restriction was lifted and we are now traveling together, Master San. I have a lot of fun every day. Today I saw the ocean for the first time in my life, and it's not just water. It was so beautiful, glistening in the sunlight. That's the ocean in the daytime. At night, it's a different scene. Wow, that's amazing. I want to go see it. Well, shall we go to the harbor for dinner? Yes, I'm so excited. Zurara seemed to be excited and began to rub my body even more enthusiastically. I felt as if my whole body was melting away, and before I knew it, I was asleep. Master San, Master San. Um, it's time to go. If you don't wake up, you'll be late. Um, Zurara shook me awake. The time to meet up with Iris and the others were approaching, according to the clock. You slept so well. I had only been asleep for a short time, but the feeling of fatigue had completely disappeared. My body felt light. I feel ten years younger. Thanks to Zurara's massage, I feel much better. I patted him with gratitude. He he he. Master San praised me. I left the room with Zurara, who was in a good mood. I went downstairs to the lobby on the first floor and found Iris, Lily, and Letitia in the lounge area. All three were sitting on a sofa, chatting happily. What a gorgeous scene. Oh, coo. Over here? Over here, Iris noticed me and raised her right hand lightly. Sorry, did I keep you waiting? No, it's fine. Iris shook her head, and in her hand was Letitia's sketchbook. I was just looking at Letitia's drawings with Lily. That looks interesting. Can I take a look at it too? How about it, Letitia? Of course, you can. I would be happy to show you. Letitia nodded with an elegant gesture. Her dignified attitude showed her strong confidence in her own work. I took the sketchbook and turned to the cover. Most of Letitia's drawings were of people living in the city. Street vendors hawking their wares in the market, adventurers singing and dancing in a tavern, housewives chatting on the side of the road. All were painted with a warm touch and exuded Letitia's gentle personality. On the last page was a mysterious picture. In the gentle sunlight, a dragon is sleeping with its body curled up. The dragon's expression was happy. On the dragon's back, small birds are singing in a line, and near its face, several cats are gathered in a conference. Furthermore, there are many people as well as animals. A woman meticulously polishing the dragon's scales, an old man reading a book while reclining on its tail children running around. It was a very peaceful scene. Just looking at them gave me a warm feeling. Letitia, this dragon, could it be a calamity? I was about to say so, but just before I did, a flash of inspiration struck me, and I said something else. Could it be your brother, the greed dragon? I couldn't quite put into words why I thought that. Maybe it was because of the deep affection I felt for the dragon from the landscape of the painting. Letitia stared at me for a while her deep blue eyes fluttering and blinking repeatedly, and then she slowly opened her mouth. Yes, you are right, you understand very well. It's just a hunch. For once, it was really just a hunch. I am surprised that I was right. Kusama, do you recognize this dragon? Letitia was probably asking for a clue from her brother. No, I don't think I remember anything about it. Unfortunately, I have never seen this dragon. I'm sure I've never seen it. For some reason, the scene depicted in the painting seemed awfully familiar to me. After that, we decided to leave the inn and look for a restaurant for dinner. Since we were traveling, we wanted to try a menu unique to Fort Port. What are the specialties of this city? Iris answered my question as she opened a May guide. The book says sea boat paella. Not seafood, but sea boat. What's paella? It is a local dish of rice cooked in a broth with saffron. The yellow color of the saffron is its characteristic. Ah. I see. In my original world, it would be the equivalent of Spanish paella. Yellow rice looks so delicious, doesn't it? Just imagining it makes me hungry. The reason why it is called sea boat instead of seafood is because paella is served in a vessel that resembles a boat. In short, it is a seafood paella served on a boat. Sounds interesting. Hearing this, Lily and Zurara's A's lit up. I'm interested in it. I want to try it too. Shrimp. Octopus. Squid. So. 
Dinner today turned out to be sea boat paella. There are several restaurants in the city of Fort Port that serve sea boat paella. The one we went to was called Orchid Fragrant Restaurant located near the harbor. The restaurant is highly recommended by May Guides, and there is a stage in the center of the restaurant. On the stage, a chef was cooking in front of a huge frying pan. The pan was over 5 meters in diameter. The chef is said to be a strong man skill holder and is stirring the paella with his stiff arms. What an impressive power. We were shown to our seats on the second floor, from where we could look down at the stage on the first floor. This would keep us occupied until our food arrived. While we were looking at the stage, the sea boat paella for five people was soon brought to us. Yellow rice was served in a bowl filled to the brim in the shape of a ship, and seafood was used in abundance, including shrimp, squid, octopus, and even shellfish. Gorgeous! I exclaimed. The fresh aroma of saffron wafted through the air, wetting my appetite. My stomach is rumbling, so I decide to eat. It's a dark monsieur. Thanks for the food. Oh, this is delicious. I couldn't help but let out a sigh of admiration. Unlike Japanese rice, the rice is not as sticky, but this is what makes it so pleasant to the palate. The seafood broth soaks into the rice well, and combined with the saffron flavor, it seems as if one could eat an endless supply of rice alone. The seafood, especially the shrimp and octopus, were very chewy, which added a nice touch. The shrimp came with shells, but thanks to the dexterity, I was able to peel them quickly and easily. I looked at Lily, who was struggling to peel the shrimp shells. I can peel them for you if you want. Dot is that okay? Yeah, I'll take care of it. I stripped every single shrimp on Lily's boatload. Letitia giggled at the sight of it. https colon slash slash Nike's translation home dot files dot wordpress dot com slash two thousand and twenty two slash oh six slash oh 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 two five dot jpg. Foo foo, you are just like brother and sister, aren't you? Although the ages are a little too far apart. Ara. How old are you, Kusama? I am 29 years old. I'm almost 30. Dot you must be joking, right? Letitia looked surprised and rolled her eyes, blinking repeatedly. I thought you were 23 or 24 years old. I know, right? I was also surprised when I heard his age. Iris nodded in agreement. Ku must look young because he doesn't look tired at all. That being said, my shoulders and back tend to be quite stiff. When Zurara massaged me a while ago, there was a tremendous crackling sound coming from my joints. Maybe age creeps up on us in ways we can't see. Paella was so good. Thank you, Master San. Zurara said with a look of satisfaction on her face after the meal. Serving it on a boat was an interesting idea. I can't wait to try it again. We sat back and relaxed, chatting in the aftermath of our meal. Personally, I'm in the mood for a change of location and a drink. As I was thinking about this, my eyes suddenly met Iris's. She was looking at me. Iris looked at me as if she was watching me and made a gesture with her right hand as if she were lifting a wine glass. She seemed to be in the mood for a drink, just like me. I wondered how the other three were feeling. And Letitia said as she got up from her seat. Well, I'm going to go back to the inn first. I'm looking forward to the outdoor bath on the roof. Would you like to join me? Lily Sama, daughter. Lily looked at me and Iris alternately then turned to Letitia and nodded. Yes, I'd like to go there, too. I'm going back to the inn too. I'm starting to feel sleepy. Then, we'll be going. Iris was just about to say this when Letitia opened her mouth. Fufu, you don't have to force yourself to go along with us. Since you're here, why don't you drop by a bar with a view of the ocean? You both look like you could do with a drink. Right, Kusama? Well, yeah. Dot may I take you up on your offer then? Of course. Please rest assured that I will take Lily Sama and Zurara Sama back to the inn properly. If there is anyone suspicious, I will turn them into a meteor in the night sky with my iron fist of justice. That's dependable. Or rather, too dependable, and conversely, worrisome. If Letitia hit them with all her might, the bad guys would definitely be turned into stars in the night sky. Anyway. This was where we split up. After seeing Letitia and the others off to the inn, Iris and I headed for a nearby bar. The name of the bar was Gull's Hideout. As the name suggests, it is located quietly near the sea. As I entered the bar, the bell attached to the door rang. Welcome. The owner of the bar was a large man with few words. The muscles in his arms were muscular, and his skin was darkly tanned. He looked like a former sailor. Please come this way. He led us to a seat in the back. A part of the wall was made of glass, 
and we had a panoramic view of the sea at Fort Port. It's a nice view. Thank you very much. You must be tired today. Please take your time. The owner seemed to be aware that I was the Dragon Slayer, but he didn't mention it and went back to the counter. He may have been mindful so that I could drink leisurely. I was grateful for that. Hey, Ku. That's the Orichilcan Rocks, isn't it? Iris pointed out the window. At the edge of the harbor in Fort Port, there was a battleship docked. The Orichilcan Rocks. It is a large battleship built with the technology of an ancient civilization. It was originally commandeered by pirates but now belongs to me. It was too huge to fit in my item box, so I was allowed to place it rent-free in the corner of the harbor. Orichilcum rocks was floating quietly in the sea at night, illuminated orange by the city's lights. It would be a perfect place to sip a drink while reflecting on the day's events. Thinking of this, I called the owner and placed my order. He brought me a bottle of red wine, which he recommended. Cheers, then. Cheers. We raised our glasses lightly and tasted the wine. It smells like the ocean. It's sweet and easy to drink. It tastes interesting. According to the owner, this wine is made from grapes grown on the dunes near the sea. The dunes have a large temperature difference between morning and evening, which makes it easy to grow sweet grapes and has become a hidden specialty of Fort Port. While we were leisurely enjoying the wine, Iris murmured in a quiet tone. This is the first time Ku and I have had a drink together since we started our trip, dot indeed. I nodded. That's right if you ask me. Into Ansuria, I was always accompanied by Lily and Zurara, so the situation of being alone with Iris seemed fresh. Or should I say that I missed it? When we were in Un, we used to go on quests and have meals and such together every day. It was like going back to those days. Compared to when we started this trip. There are a lot more of us now, aren't there? Dest, Zurara-chan, Lily-chan, Letitia. Iris narrowed her eyes as she muttered Letitia's name. She turned her gaze toward the sea and sighed a little. There was a hint of melancholy in her expression. She seems to be trying to hide it. But I can tell. Is something bothering you? Number. It's nothing serious. Iris shook her head and drank the rest of the wine in her glass. The amount was quite large, but I wonder if it is okay. The alcohol seemed to have started to turn, and her cheeks had a faint vermilion color. Well, you see. After saying that, Iris fell silent for a while. Her crimson eyes were looking back and forth between me and the view beyond the window. It was as if she was searching for the next words to say. If it's something you don't feel comfortable talking about, you don't have to. Iris's mouth relaxed as I told her this. Ku is very kind. I don't know. I'm just trying to be nice to Iris. Foo foo. Thank you. Iris slowly turned her gaze to me and said. I was a little envious of Letitia after today's pirate subjugation. Jealous. She and Ku went on that ship together, didn't you? Iris pointed out the window with her right index finger. There, the Orichilcan rocks floated silently, smashing the turrets, taking command of the pirates with domination. She's been very active, hasn't she? Yeah. She was pretty determined. Compared to that. I wasn't much help to Ku this time. Help to me. I didn't expect my name to be mentioned here, so I was a bit confused. Iris blinked a few times, swayed her long eyelashes, and continued to speak. I owe a lot to Ku. I told you before, I was so happy that you came to my rescue when the black spider tried to kill me. Before that, I thought there was no one in this world on my side. How do you feel now? I'm not as hopeless as I used to be. Because there is someone here who is like the hero of the story. Iris glanced at me sideways. A hero, huh? It's a little embarrassing to hear her say that face to face. I picked up my glass and downed the rest of the wine, trying to hide my embarrassment. The back of my throat was burning. I sighed unintentionally. Iris said as she watched me. It wasn't just during the black spider. Who helped me many times and gave me many things after that. I'm also very grateful to you for being with me and giving me a place to stay. So I'd like to return the favor in some small way, but, Ku can do everything on his own, and that's kind of difficult to do. Iris lowered her eyes and gave a small slump of her shoulders. This may be the first time she's shown me her weakness like this. In a way, it may be a sign that she is opening up to me. How should I respond? I am sure Iris is not looking for superficial words of comfort. Rather, it would be better to express my honest feelings. After thinking for a while, I slowly opened my mouth. Iris is very helpful. This time, too, you were a great help. Dot is. That so? Iris asked me as if she couldn't believe it. I looked her straight in the eye and told her. If Dox and his men start to attack the city, 
the barrier will prevent them from doing so. Knowing that, I was able to attack them aggressively. You mean you were relying on me? Yes. Not only this time. Even at the time of the Black Dragon and the Gluttonous Dragon, it was Iris's presence that allowed me to survive and protect the city. I am grateful to you for everything. I appreciate it. Dot I see. Iris's mouth relaxed as she sighed. Am I really helping you? Of course you are. I'm glad to hear that. Muttering reassuringly. Iris raised her empty wine glass. Can I have another glass? Of course. I took the wine bottle with my right hand and poured it into Iris's glass. By the way, my glass was empty too. Shall I pour? Yes, please. Iris poured out about half of the wine in my glass. Is this about the right amount? Yeah, that's about right. Dot well then, let's have another toast. Yes, cheers. We raised our glasses to each other. We were both in a good mood probably due to the fact that we were now intoxicated. This is a story about my hometown. I suddenly realized that I had said something like that. Perhaps it was the alcohol that made me light-mouthed. Normally, I wouldn't tell anyone about the past. But tonight, I was in the mood to talk a little. I was working on some kind of archaeological site system where I lived, where ancient civilization-like technology was commonplace. The company I worked for was focused on IT-related business so that shouldn't be so wrong as an explanation. Ancient civilizations are a lot like modern Japan. I looked at Iris, who was listening to my words with interest. That's good. Apparently, she was not bored. With a small sigh of relief, I continued my story. It was a year ago, I think. The people who were supposed to deal with errors in the system were all fired. The upper management thought that since there were no errors, it would be fine if they were gone. I have a bad feeling about this. You're right about that. I nodded to Iris. Then, a while later, the system made an error, and the member who was supposed to deal with it was fired, so it took quite a while for things to get back on track. It was a tough time. So it's important to be prepared for emergencies. Yeah. I nodded my head. There are many tragedies in the world that occur because the people in charge don't understand the situation and this story is a typical example. In this case, Iris is the contingency plan. It's an important role that can only be entrusted to someone you trust. Fufu, thank you. Iris let out a smile. I hope I didn't make you feel uncomfortable, not at all. I shook my head and looked out the window. Iris said as she gazed out the window at the gently shimmering nighttime sea. It's quite unusual for Kut to talk about himself isn't it? Really? Yes. Iris gave a small nod and turned to me. Her red eyes sparkled like jewels. Where was Kud born? How did you grow up? And what did you do? You've told me very little about yourself until now, haven't you? My life story isn't very interesting, you know. Iris shook her head. That's not the case. I want to know about Ku. Dot that would be an honor. I answered shortly and tipped my glass of wine. The mellow aroma tickled my nostrils. I wondered if it would be alright if I talked a little more about it. My hometown is very far away. You said that before, didn't you? Iris said with a nostalgic tone. Maybe across the sea? No, it's much further away. I sipped a little wine to moisten my mouth before answering. Beyond the sea, or rather, out of this world. Out. Think of it as a completely different world. There are no monsters, no calamities, no skill or magic. It's a place like that. Dot one day, without any warning, I was suddenly transported to this world. I had the skills before I even knew it. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? Right. Dot but, I believe it. Iris turned to me and nodded deeply. Her red eyes were staring straight at me. Without averting her gaze, she told me. Even if everything you just said is a lie, I don't care. It was like a once in a lifetime confession or a declaration of commitment to life. Iris said this in a tone of voice that had absolutely no hesitation at all. I am willing to be deceived by Ku. I paid the bill and left the bar with Iris. The smell of the sea was wafting in the air. Iris, thank you for believing me when I told you earlier, dot I was talking too much because of the alcohol. That's not true. I am very happy that Ku is telling me about himself. Iris replied with a smile that seemed to burst into flames. Iris smiled and looked up at me which tickled me strangely. Is Ku planning to return to your own world someday? No way. I answered immediately with a shrug of my shoulders. My place is here. I'm not going to go back, even if I'm asked to. Dot thank goodness. Iris breathed a sigh of relief. It makes me sad just to imagine what it would be like. If Ku were gone. It's okay. I'll be with everyone. We walk together through the harbor under the stars. I am on the right, and Iris is on the left. In a moment, 
the back of my left hand and the back of Iris's right hand touched each other. Dot. Dot. It was already late at night, and there were no other people around. It's just the two of us. I looked at Iris, and she looked at me. Our gazes collided in the center. Hey, Ku. Iris's pale pink lips call my name. And then, suddenly, there was an earthquake. It seems the production skill acquired in another world is the strongest. Volume 3 Chapter 10 Here's the chapter, enjoy. Ed, Blast. Chapter 10 I accepted Millia's request. Fortunately, the earthquake was not that strong. I thought it was about the same as the shaking of a commuter train. As long as I stand on my feet a little, I can endure it without falling down. However, Iris, perhaps because she was drunk, lost her balance. She fell toward me. Kaya. Oops. I caught Iris with both arms. Dot she is slim. And also light. Her body feels very delicate. Iris is a woman, and I am reminded of this again. Soon after, the shaking stopped. It lasted less than five seconds. With an earthquake of just this magnitude, there was no need to worry about a tsunami. Iris, are you okay? Why yeah. Iris was leaning against me with all her weight on me. But then she slowly regained her posture. Thank you. You've been a great help. Don't worry about it. You didn't sprain your leg, did you? Dot yeah, I think I'm fine. Iris checked the movement of one leg on each side and then turned to me and said, By the way, your arms are a lot thicker than they look, Ku. Is that so? Yes. I was surprised to see how much stronger you are than I imagined. I've been through a lot of hard fights in the past. So it's a good exercise whether I like it or not. It's good to be manly isn't it? Well, it's not a bad thing. We began walking back to the inn, exchanging words in our usual light-hearted manner. On the way, full assist, was activated, and an inorganic voice echoed in my brain. Analysis of the earthquake is complete. The epicenter is a volcanic island located about 200 kilometers northwest. There is no danger of a tsunami caused by this earthquake. The message sounds like an early warning for an earthquake. Good night, Ku. I had a good time today. Yeah. Me too. Let's go again one day. Yeah, promise. When we returned to the inn, we exchanged these words and parted ways. My room and the room Iris was staying in were right across from each other. When I entered my room and closed the door, I felt a sense of reluctance and glanced toward Iris's room, and my eyes met hers. It seems that we were both thinking the same thing. See you later. See you. We exchanged one more word and closed the door. Dot few. With a slight feeling of loneliness in my heart. I headed for the bedroom. Zurara should have gone back to the room before me, but I wonder how he spends his time. Q. Supi. The futon is delicious. Choo choo. He was sleeping soundly. By the way, he is not eating the futon. He was just talking in his sleep. Dot he looks like he's sleeping very comfortably. I think he slept through without even noticing the earthquake. I felt sorry for him, so I took care not to make any noise, took a bath and went to bed. Many things happened today. When I arrived at Fort Port, I found that the city was in danger of being destroyed because of pirates. It was a surprise to learn that the boss of the pirates was a former mercenary, Docs. It's true that in life, you never know when something will happen. When I returned to the city after the pirate extermination, I found Milia there. Her bright smile, the same as when she was in Arn, and this warmed my heart. After that, Zurara gave me a massage at the inn and we went out for dinner. The famous sea boat Paella was delicious. It was also quite impressive to look at, and if there were social media in this world, I would have uploaded a picture of it. As for the rest, I told Iris that I was from a different world, albeit over a glass of wine. I was worried that she would think I was crazy, but Iris even told me that she wouldn't mind being fooled by me. Iris must have trusted me very much. I am very grateful for that. Good night. Dot Iris. She was so slim. I feel like my hands still have the feel of her body when I caught her body. The following day, when I woke up and went to the wash basin, Zurara was posing in front of the mirror. All right, I'm all round today, too. Dot oh, Master San, good morning. Good morning, Zurara. Did you sleep well? Yes. I slept very well until the morning. Zurara put on a bright smile. When I asked him about last night's earthquake, he replied that he had no recollection of it. I fell asleep as soon as I got back to the room. Maybe that's why I didn't notice it. That's fine. I'm just relieved that everything is alright. I patted Zurara on the head. He he he. Master San's hands are so warm. Are they? Yes. I feel so comfortable. Yay. Zurara shook his body in a good mood. After that, 
We got ready and left the room. When we went down to the lobby on the first floor, we found Iris and Lily there. Good morning, Ku. Zura Chan. Good morning, Ku San. Zura San. Good morning, Iris Nain. Lily and Good morning, both of you. I raise my right hand to greet Iris and Lily. All that's left is Letitia. Huh? Right. She's not very good with the mornings, but I hope she'll be okay. Don't worry, she'll be fine. She just arrived. Oops. Before I knew it, Letitia was standing right next to me. Good morning, everyone. I apologize for keeping you waiting. No, it's no problem. Me and Zurara also just arrived a few minutes ago. In the first place, we still have about 15 minutes to spare before the meeting time. The party was quite excellent as all the members arrived early before the meeting time. Since everyone is here, then, let's have breakfast first. We left the inn and entered a nearby cafe. We were shown to a table with a view outdoors, where we could see the morning cityscape and the ocean of Fort Port in the distance. Unfortunately, the sky was covered with black clouds. The food arrived quickly. I ordered pancakes with salmon and cream cheese. Next to the pancake, there was an avocado that looked like it was about to melt in the mouth. It looked delicious. I hold a fork in my left hand and a knife in my right and begin to eat the pancake. Oh, I unexpectedly let out a sigh of admiration. It tasted even better than it looked. The salmon was fresh, and the cream cheese was rich. The pancakes were so soft and fluffy that it was a shame to finish them. It was a perfect breakfast. By the way, Iris ordered the same salmon and cream cheese pancakes as I did. Lily and Letitia had egg sandwiches, and Zurara had a hamburger with fries. Everyone seemed to be very satisfied with the taste and had happy expressions on their faces after the meal. As we looked out at the sea while sipping the cup of tea that came with the meal, Iris said, There aren't any ships out at all, are there? It's true, as she said. Although this is a port town, there are almost no ships on the sea. Only a few small boats were floating around. Yesterday, the port of Fort Port was thoroughly destroyed by pirates' bombardment. Because of this, there is probably not a single large ship left in the harbor. I wonder if the ship to the royal capital will ever sail. I doubt it. I answered, and Letitia said from the side. How about going on the ship that we used when we were exterminating the pirates? You mean the Exceed Cruiser? Well, I'd say it's possible. From the way you said that, it sounds like there might be a problem. There's no sleeping quarters on that ship. At night, we have to sleep in cabins. On the ship, the speed at which the Exceed Cruiser can sail is considerable but at the expense of a little bit of livability. Aside from day trip cruising, staying is a bit painful. As for me, I would prefer to spend relaxing time on a ship with a passenger room if possible. Well, we still have plenty of time on our schedule. Let's check the availability of the ship first and then we'll take the Exceed Cruiser as a last resort. So, after lunch, we headed for the reception office of the passenger ship. We asked the staff there about the availability of the ship, but it seemed that the next ferry to the royal capital had been destroyed by pirates. A replacement ship was being arranged, but it would take about eight days to depart. We still have about twenty days to wait for the award ceremony in the capital so we can wait eight days. There are casinos and the many tourist attractions in Fort Port. I left the reception office thinking that it would be a good idea to spend some time playing around. When I ran into Milia just as I was leaving the office. Oh, Kusan. You are just in the right place. What's wrong? The guard reported to me just now, and we found out where the pirates found the ancient weapon. It will be a long story. So why don't you come down to the Adventurers Guild? We have some snacks as well. I look forward to the snacks. Actually, I wasn't completely full from the breakfast. Melia led us into the Adventurers Guild lounge. The room was about the same size as the branch manager's office, with four large sofas surrounding a table. After we sat down on one of the sofas, Melia left the room, saying, I'll go get the snacks. Soon after, Milia returned with several small plates in her left hand and a platter of apple pie in her kaya. She stumbled on the floor and leaned forward. Although she did not fall, the impact caused the apple pie to pop right out of the platter. I quickly activated Divine Speed Blessing Eggs and tried to. But Zurara had moved first. I'll protect you, snack. Choo choo, gulp. Ah, uh, well, what happened was that Zurala opened his mouth wide, caught the apple pie, and ate the whole thing. Everyone, including me, rolled their eyes at this unexpected turn of events. Milia and Ain. This is so delicious. Zurara was smiling with satisfaction, 
seemingly unconcerned with the reactions of those around him. Hey, hey, do you have some more? I want Master San and the others to have some, too. Ah, uh, why yes, I have five more. I'll bring them over. There are five more? That's a surprise. Melia left the room and brought the apple by with careful steps this time. Kusan, can I ask you to cut it into pieces? If I do it myself, it's likely to be uneven. All right, I'll take care of it. I accept a knife and fork from Milia. Then there, dexterity, was activated. The six of us here army, Iris, Lily, Letitia, Zurara, and Milia. The apple pie is about the size of a large whole cake, so let's divide it into twelve equal portions. Kusan, you're really good at everything you do, aren't you? I envy you so much. It's no big deal, I replied distributing the apple pie to each person's small plate. When everyone had been served, I spoke to Milia. Let's get down to business for now. You said you found out where the pirates found the ancient weapon, right? Yes. Please take a look at this first. Milia spread a map on the center of the table. The map depicted the city of Fort Port and several islands in the surrounding waters. It looks like this is where the pirates found the ancient weapon. Milia pointed to the sea northwest of the city. There is apparently a large island here, though it is not shown on the map. A large island that has never been found before? Yes, it was rumored among the local fishermen to be called Mahara's Island. It is said that on a clear day, when you look through a telescope, you can see the island at the edge of your sight. But when you try to look at it directly, it disappears. Dot I have my own theory as to why. T slash N. I'm not sure to just translate the name of the island or just put it like what the author wrote. The author uses Katakana for the name of the island. Comma, Maho, can be translated as magic. Roz, can be translated as loss, lost, and equals island. So it can be translated as magic lost island. Milia's expression and tone of voice had become serious at some point. I guess that's how important this story is. It is said that there are magic tools of ancient civilizations that cover a wide area with barriers so that the inside is unrecognizable to the surroundings. It may be that these barriers are working or that they have been working until recently. The malfunctioning of the magic tool that concealed the existence of Mahara's island resulted in the pirates discovering the island and arriving at the ancient ruins. That's what Milia thinks, isn't it? Yes. We, the Adventurers Guild, believe that an immediate investigation is necessary. Milia turned to me and said this with a tight expression. But due to the pirate attack, there is not a single ship left that can reach the island. Dot I heard that you have your own ship. Kusan, if you don't mind, would you please investigate the ancient ruins on Mahara's island? Indeed, it is still many days before a ship to the royal capital is available. I am curious about the ancient ruins, and it is not a bad idea to go there. I think I'll take care of the investigation. What about you guys? Iris, Lily, and Zurara all nodded their heads in agreement. I'll go with you. Leave it to me to be the shield in case of an emergency. I'll go with you, too. Kusan. If an undead appears, I will exterminate them immediately. I'm your slime companion. I will accompany you, Master San. It seems that three of them will be coming with me. The remaining one Letitia was staring at me with an expression as if she wanted to say something. I have seen something similar before, but at that time, Letitia was thinking about her brother. I wondered if the reason was the same this time. I thought about it for a moment, and then I told Letitia. If you want to prioritize the search for your brother, we can go our separate ways. Please don't hesitate now. Eh? Letitia came to her senses and shook her head. Oh, no, there's nothing to worry about. I will take my time with that, and I think I have a pretty good idea of where he is at the moment. Dot putting aside my own matters, please allow me to accompany you on your investigation of the ancient ruins. Thus, we all decided to go to the ancient ruins on Mahara's island. Thank you so much. Kusan and everyone. Milia stood up from the sofa and bowed deeply. Information about Mahara's island is limited, and we know almost nothing about it. If you decide that it is too dangerous, please come back immediately. Dot reports coming in from the lighthouse to the west just a few minutes ago say that smoke has been sighted from the direction of Mahara's island, which appears to be from volcanic activity. There have been a series of small earthquakes in Fort Port recently. So maybe Mahara's island has an active volcano. Understood. I'll check that out too if I can. Thank you very much. That's all I have to say about Mahara's island. Dot I have one more important matter to discuss with you, 
Kusan. Me? What in the world could it be about? The way Emilia looked, it seemed like she wanted to talk to me alone. When I looked at Iris, she nodded her head as if she knew what I was thinking. Then let's split up. The island survey may take a while, so we'll go restock our gear and food supplies. Can I count on you? Yes. I'll take care of it. I'll meet you at Orichalcum Rocks. That's a good idea. The Orichalcum Rocks is a huge ship, so it would be an excellent place to meet up. So, it was decided that Iris and the others would go separately. Let's get going, then. Lily Chan, Zura Chan, Letitia. Iris said, getting up from the sofa and heading for the door. See you later, Ku. Ku San, Milia San. Excuse us. I'll get you some souvenirs. Master San. I'll ask around about the island. See you later. Finally, Letitia closed the door with a polite gesture. The only two people left in the room were Milia and me. Everyone is very cheerful, isn't it? Milia said with a bright smile on her face. I am relieved to see everyone enjoying themselves, too. I think we are a good group. I'm very grateful for that. It is because of the popularity of Kusan isn't it? Is that so? Yes. It's because nice people gather around other nice people as well. Dot well, I'm sorry to take up so much of your time, so I'll get right down to it. Milia turned to me again as she said this. Kusan, do you still have the spirit ring? Yes, of course. I took out the spirit ring from my item box. The night before the battle with the black dragon in Arn, Milia gave it to me. On the surface, there are ancient words that say, you who come from faraway lands, if you challenge the dragon, empty your vessels. The blessing of the spirit dwells there. The spirit ring originally belonged to one of Milia's relatives, didn't it? Yes, it was given to me by my grandfather, a distant relative, when I was little. He said, when someone challenges the dragon, give them this ring. I didn't know what it meant at the time, but I felt it was important, so I carried the ring with me all the time. Thanks to that. I was able to defeat the Black Dragon. I really appreciate your help, Milia. In the battle with the Black Dragon, all my magic power was absorbed by their Dark Field, a unique ability. This would normally be called a desperate situation. However, just before the Black Dragon's breath was about to scorch me, the skill hidden in the Spirit Ring, the Blessing of the Spirit, was activated, and I achieved a miraculous victory. As I was soaking in the memories, Milia continued to speak. The day after Kusan departed, I received a gift from my distant relative's grandfather. A gift? Yes. A letter was also enclosed. I want you to entrust the ring to the Chosen One. Saying this, Milia took out an old scroll from her bag, which she had put aside, and spread it out on the table. In the center of the scroll was a magic circle that looked like a combination of a circle and a triangle. At each tip of the triangle, there was a small picture of the spirit ring a dragon holding a shield, and an old man blowing a horn. What on earth could this be? At any rate, I activated, appraisal. The Twilight Scroll, a scroll that contained a formula for uniting the five great powers spirit, god of creation, dragon god, god of war, and calamity. It is required to perform certain recipes in, creation. Uniting the five great powers. From the description, it seems that if one were to use this scroll to perform with, creation, an incredible item would be created. However, no new recipe has come to mind so far. Perhaps other materials are needed. Milia, who is this grandfather who sent you this scroll? I don't really know either. When I met him, when I was little, he said he was an archaeologist. Could the spirit ring and this scroll be relics from an ancient civilization? I wonder. That seems a little different. I know it's subjective, but ancient civilizations are a mix of fantasy and science fiction. The underground city of Un is full of futuristic houses, and the magic communicator looks just like a cellular phone. As for Orichalcum Rocks, it is equipped not only with a laser cannon but also with missiles. To sum it up in short, the near future where magic exists from my original world would be a perfect description. In comparison, this scroll is too analogous. If it was a relic from an ancient civilization. We would at least find a tablet with a magic circle recorded on it. Can I keep this for now? I mean, you can keep it, or rather, you can have it. It's just like the spirit ring. It's probably meant for you to have it. I understand. Thank you. I thanked her and stored the twilight scroll in my item box. No, no. Actually, the main reason I was in such a hurry to chase after Kusan was to give you this scroll. I am relieved to have done my job. The scroll arrived the day after I left Anne didn't it? So if I had delayed my departure by a day, 
it would have made things a little easier for Milia. But in that case, wouldn't to have been destroyed? That's true, too. The devil treant attacked the city of Tu on the evening of the day I left. If my departure had been the next day, the city of Tu would have been destroyed during that time, and many of its residents would have lost their lives. Kusan, don't worry about it. The trip to Fort Port was a bit difficult, but I did it of my own accord. If I was of any help, all is well. That's it. Milia winked with her right eye and made an OK mark with the thumb and forefinger of her right hand at the same time. It was quite a cute sight, and I couldn't help but chuckle. It seems the production skill acquired in another world is the strongest. Volume 3 Chapter 11 Sponsored Chapter by Patreon and you may also want to check our new co for here. Enjoy, Ed, Blast. Chapter 11, I headed to the volcanic island. After parting ways with Milia, I headed to the meeting place. On the edge of Fort Port's harbor was a battleship that looked like a huge fortress, an ancient weapon. The Orichalcan rocks. Around it, for some reason, the city's residents had gathered. Hey, this is the ship used by the pirates. Huh? It's huge. I've never seen a ship this big before. I'm really grateful to Dragon Slayer San for exterminating the pirates. It seemed that the residents had come to see the Orichalcan rocks. There were quite a few people gathered here, and the atmosphere was a bit like a tourist spot. Dot wait a minute, isn't the one over the Dragon Slayer San? One of the residents who was looking at the Orichalcan rocks suddenly turned to me. It's true. It's Dragon Slayer San. What did you say? Black hair, black eyes and a black coat. It's definitely the Dragon Slayer. Whoa. While I was surprised by the suddenness of the situation, I was completely surrounded by the residents. I felt like a celebrity surrounded by fans. I heard about it, Dragon Slayer. I heard that you donated the reward for defeating the pirates to the city. Thanks to you, we can buy a new ship. Many thanks. You are a real hero. I will never forget this favor. All the money from the pirate extermination was donated to the city of Fort Port to help recover from the damage. Apparently, the residents had already heard about this. Not only sailors but even their families approached me one by one and thanked me. It was kind of embarrassing. As I was doing so, I saw Iris and the others in the distance. It seemed that they had finished their shopping. All right, let's join them. First, I have to get out of this crowd. I'm sorry, but I have something to do. Can you let me through? As I said this, the city's residents quickly cleared the area around me. Oops, sorry, Dragon Slayer. Pardon us for taking up so much of your time. What do you want to do? Are you trying to get rid of the bad guys? Yeah, I'm sure it is. Dragon Slayer San. Good luck. We're all rooting for you. Hooray for the Dragon Slayer. Hooray. What's with this flow? I noticed that the people in the city had somehow started a chorus of hooray for some reason. What kind of face should I make at a time like this? At first, I went to Iris and the others, pretending to be calm. Coo, you're as popular as ever. Dot well, I guess they are grateful in some way. I responded to Iris's words in a slightly blunt tone. Then Letitia came close to me and giggled with amusement. Ara, Kusama, are you embarrassed? Dot I won't deny it. Master San, in that case, you should eat a snack. Here, I'll give it to you. What Zurara offered was a pineapple that had been cut and skewered. Looking at the surface, it was slightly frozen. Thank you. I patted Zurara on the head. Then I took the skewer and bit into the pineapple. Crunch. The pineapple was as smooth as sorbet. And yet, the taste was still raw and juicy. What on earth is this? I wondered, and Lily told me. I asked the shopkeeper. It was made by using ice magic to slowly freeze the fruit. I see. So it's a food unique to a world with magic. This is interesting. After we finish our research on Mahara's island, let's go buy some more. We then moved to a place by the sea, a short distance away from Orichalcan rocks. Fortunately, there were only a few people around. So there would be no commotion here. I opened my item box in my mind and thought of taking out the Exceed Cruiser. A magic circle floated on the surface of the sea nearby, and a ship without sails slowly rose from it. Dest was connected to the center of the hull like a piercing rod, and when he turned his face toward me, he raised his right hand to greet me. Hello, master. Please embark. Yeah. We're going to be a little busy today. I need your help. I boarded the Exceed Cruiser and headed to Dest's side. I then activated, auto mapping, and explained the location of Mahara's island. They say there are ancient ruins on the island. We don't know what will happen, 
so will be very vigilant, understood. I will do my utmost to ensure your safety. Dest raised his right arm and saluted with a resounding thump of his chest. In the meantime, the others had also boarded the Exceed Cruiser. Let's get going. At the rear of the Exceed Cruiser, there is a descending staircase that leads to the cabin. The cabin is furnished with a table, a sofa, and several easy chairs for passengers to relax during the cruise. A large white pillar sits in the center of the cabin which probably contains Dest's body. It takes two hours to travel from the port of Fort Port to Mahara's Island. We sat down on the sofa in the cabin and shared information. Then I will speak first. Letitia was the first to speak. I've been talking to some of the old folks in town, and they tell me that Fort Port only gets an earthquake once every few years at the most, and this is the first time it's happened two or three times in a short period. This could be a harbinger of an eruption. It could also take a while to survey Mahara's island. Yes, I think we should be vigilant. Letitia nodded and finished her story. Iris was the next to open her mouth. Lily and I did a lot of shopping. I've put together a list of what we bought on paper, so please check it out when you have time. Saying this, Iris held out a piece of paper about the size of an A4 sheet. The contents were a list of purchases. It seems that Iris has prepared a list of items necessary for the survey of the uninhabited island, mainly food and other items. Master San, I want to report back to you too. I wondered if Zurara had done something too. Well, the old lady at the pineapple shop told me an old story about Fort Port. What kind of stories? It's called Grandpa Reindeer of Mahara's Island. At the end of the year, the old man gives a wonderful dream to a good boy who is sleeping soundly. It sounds like Santa Claus, doesn't it? Putting these impressions aside, there is one part of the story that is a bit disturbing in terms of its content. There are ruins of an ancient civilization on Mahara's island, and perhaps there are magic creatures with antlers like reindeer living there. Well, we'll find out when we get there. Lastly, here is my report. I took out a twilight scroll from my item box and showed it to everyone. The scroll depicts a magic circle and triangle, a spirit ring, a dragon holding a shield, and an old man blowing a horn. Heiku, this dragon is. What's wrong? I think it's the dragon god. I have seen it many times in the ancient manuscripts in my hometown. According to the results of the appraisal of the Twilight Scroll, this incorporates a technique to unite the five powers of the spirit, the creator god, the dragon god, the god of war, and the calamity. If that is the case, it is only natural that a picture of the dragon god is drawn on it. If so, is the old man who blows the horn the god of war? I asked Lily, and she answered as I had expected. Yes, this is a painting of the god of war, Warden Sama. The same thing is depicted in the religious paintings displayed at the sanctuary. I see. The scroll also depicted a spirit ring, which probably represents a spirit. As I nodded to myself, Letitia said, if the scroll depicted spirit, the dragon god, and the god of war, then there should also be pictures of the other two, meaning the creator god and the calamity. I wonder about that. I thought for a moment before answering. The twilight scroll is supposed to be used for creation, and at that point, it fulfills the element of the creator god, doesn't it? Then the only thing that remains is the calamity. As Letitia said this. She stared intently at the magic circle drawn in the center of the scroll. It was a crest combining a circle and a triangle, matching the one that appears when I activate the item box. After we were done sharing information, I walked up the stairs at the rear of the cabin to the deck. I was in the mood for a bit of fresh air. The Exceed Cruiser was speeding along at a good speed, and the breeze felt good against my cheeks. In the distance, a few small islands could be seen dotting the horizon. We were just over a quarter of the way to Mahara's island, according to the auto mapping. We still have more than an hour to go before we arrive. Um, Kusan? I heard a voice from behind me. I turned around and saw Lily. Can I sit beside you? Of course. Suit yourself. Thank you. Lily bowed politely and lined up next to me. Then, she sat down and looked at the surrounding scenery. The ocean is beautiful isn't it? It makes me want to jump in and swim. Dot I can't swim, though. Really? I don't know how to swim. The sanctuary was surrounded by land, so Lily had no parents and was raised in the sanctuary of the god of war religion, which is said to be far away across the sea. She had the skill of the god of war's shrine maiden, and had therefore been educated to fulfill the mission of a priestess. Apparently, 
their education did not include learning how to swim. In modern Japan, there are schools all over the country, usually with swimming pools, but this is a different world. In the case of Lily, she has a role as a God of Wars shrine maiden, and education related to this role was probably given priority. Well then, after this investigation is over, maybe we can practice swimming a little. Can you swim, Kusan? Well, I can swim reasonably well. That's amazing. Lily turned her sparkling, straight, longing gaze toward me. I scratched my right cheek, feeling a little bit embarrassed. Then, for a while, a quiet time passed. The only sound that could be heard was the sound of the Exceed cruiser moving. Suddenly, Lily said, Kusan, are you enjoying being an adult? What's the matter, all of a sudden? Yesterday, you and Iris San went out drinking together, didn't you? Yes. I nodded and thought back to last night. It had been a while since I had the opportunity to talk one on one with Iris, and we were just grateful to Letitia and the others for their thoughtfulness. Could it be that Lily wanted to go with us? I don't know. Lily looked thoughtful and tilted her head, but having a drink at the bar after dinner is a very adult thing to do. When Lily is a little older, we should all go together. Is that okay? Of course. I nodded and patted Lily on the head. Lily is also a very important friend of mine. I won't leave you behind. Thank you very much. Lily looked up at me, and a faint smile appeared on her mouth. I'm looking forward to it. Really? Lily is a God of Wars shrine maiden and still has several missions weighing on her shoulders. One of them is to summon the Calamity Slayer's arrow in exchange for her life. The night before we left Surya, Lily said, I am still determined to fulfill my mission, but I would also like to live longer if possible and visit various places with Kusan and the others. One of those various places would be the bar after dinner like this time. As for me, I'd like to give Lily what she wishes. Dot, huh? I was wondering. How old do people in this world have to be before they can drink alcohol? It was, full assist, who answered my question. It seems that for the human race living in this country, it is customary to start at the age of 20. However, there seem to be no clear regulations or penalties as in Japan. Lily is 15 years old, so it will be about 5 years before she can drink alcohol. I hope that by that time, all the calamities will have been cleared up and the world will be at peace. Lily and I continued to watch the distant scenery from the deck. Then we saw white smoke billowing up from beyond the horizon. Kusan. That smoke, could that be? That might be the volcano of Mahara's island. I used, auto mapping, to check the geography of the area. The location of Mahara's island matched the direction of the smoke. I turned around and told Dest, who was still connected to the center of the Exceed cruiser. Dest. Can you increase the speed as you wish? Boost on. With a loud and booming shout, the speed of the Exceed cruiser surged forward. And then, Mahara's Island came into view in the distance. In shape, it resembles a witch's tricorn hat. The brim is covered with dense forest, and the pointy center is a volcano. The elevation of the volcano is probably less than 200 meters. However, this is only the part of the volcano that was protruding from the water. In fact, it is a huge volcano and it is possible that only the tip of the volcano is visible above the sea. Smoke was still rising from the crater, giving off a disturbing atmosphere. Perhaps an eruption was imminent. As I was thinking about this, suddenly a sharp metallic shwink sound rang out, and a magic circle of an item box floated in front of me. From there, a large sword with a silver blade gram appeared by itself. Lily gulped. Kusan, could it be? Yeah. Probably a calamity. I pull Gram out of the magic circle and look around. The first thing that came to my mind was the words the greedy dragon. Maybe Letitia's brother is nearby. While I was thinking about this, I heard footsteps behind me. When I turned around, I saw Iris and Letitia there. Both of them have grim expressions on their faces. Who could it be a calamity? Iris said and raised the dragon god's shield. A sharp metallic sound echoed from the shield just like Gram. Yeah, maybe one of them is near here. I looked at Letitia as I answered. Letitia had her hands on her temples, and her eyes were slightly closed. Then she opened her eyelids and replied to me. This feeling, this is not my brother, is that so? I was a little surprised. I thought I was finally going to meet Letitia's brother. I don't know if it was wrath, envy, or the white dragon or the yellow dragon. I don't know which calamity it is 
but if it tries to destroy the world, I will punish it with my iron fist. You can count on me. Letitia smiled and raised her right fist in the air. Her appearance was very encouraging. It seemed that she was not afraid to fight the other calamities. Over there, Lily suddenly raised her voice. Something is wrong. What's wrong? At the time of the gluttonous dragon, there was a more horrifying presence. But now it's Lily couldn't quite put her feelings into words and dropped her gaze as if she was having trouble. I also dropped my gaze down, and just then, Zurara rolled over to me. Hey, hey, Master San. Could it be that even though it is a calamity, it could be a gentle calamity, like Letitia and Nain? No, a gentle one like Letitia. I feel like it's all about rampaging, but I know what Zurara is trying to say. I guess Zurara meant that it might not be a being that wants to destroy the world. Unlike the black dragon or the gluttonous dragon. Certainly, I didn't feel the usual eerie presence. The metallic sounds that had been echoing from Gram and the dragon god's shield had also somehow disappeared. Iris spoke to me with a puzzled expression on her face. Hey, Ku. What in the world is going on? All I know for sure is that this is something that's never happened before. Immediately after I answered her, there, auto-mapping, automatically started up. A blue-white window appeared in the space and a map of the surrounding area was displayed. In the northwestern part of Mahara's island, around to the left from the current location of the Exceed Cruiser, a red spot of light was shining. It coincided with the entrance to the ancient ruins. I headed for Dest, who was in control of the ship and instructed him, showing him there, auto-mapping. Can you take us here? Understood. I will proceed with caution. Yes, please do so. If the opponent is a calamity, we should not neglect our vigilance. Iris, be ready to set up the barrier at any time. Can you do it? No problem. I'll do my part. Iris nodded her head with a reassuring expression on her face. In the meantime, the ship had begun to make a wide turn. Looking toward the island's coast, we saw a series of steep cliffs. The sky was blue, and the sun was dazzling. In the distance, we could hear the relaxed cries of seagulls. When the black dragon and the gluttonous dragon appeared, the area was much dimmer, and not only the animals but the whole forest was silent as if gasping for breath. I wonder what, full assist, has to say about this. The presence of the calamity has already been sensed. In order to determine the threat level, further information needs to be gathered. I apologize for not being able to help. I don't mind. I mean, really, full assist, is becoming more and more human-like. Eventually, the ship turned to the northwestern part of Mahara's island. Below the cliff was a large cave, the mouth of which was so wide that the Orichilcum rocks could easily fit inside. According to the information from Milia, the cave was connected to the ancient ruins. I looked toward the top of the cliff. There was a figure there. He was waving at us. I wondered if the figure was a castaway or something. Dest, get a little closer to the island. As you wish. As the ship moved forward. The outline of the figure became clearer. It was an old man with a fishing rod. His face was covered with frizzy hair and beard, like that of a hermit. From his head were horns like a reindeer. What was that? My bewildered mind suddenly recalled an old story that Zurara had heard in the city. Grandpa Reindeer of Mahara's Island. He is like another worldly version of Santa Claus, who gives children wonderful dreams at the end of the year. His appearance. It was really an old man with reindeer antlers. I check, auto-mapping. The red light spot indicating the location of the calamity coincides with the location of the old man. Does this mean that the grandpa reindeer in the old tale was, in fact, a calamity? It's getting kind of complicated, isn't it? At least I don't sense any hostility from the old man, and it might be quicker if I went to talk to him directly. I put Graham back in my item box, and took out a flying potion. After downing it all in one gulp, I told the others. I'll go talk with that old man for a while. You guys wait here. Wait, Ku. Are you okay? Dot that man is probably a calamity. At least it won't be a sudden fight. I'll talk to him first. If something goes wrong, get off the island right away. Alright. Be careful. Yeah, I'm off then. I manipulated the wind and floated in the air. Then I headed for Grandpa Reindeer. Dot. It seems the production skill acquired in another world is the strongest. Volume 3 Chapter 12 Sponsored Chapter by Patreon, and you may also want to check our new co for here. Enjoy, Ed, Blast. Chapter 12 I became acquainted with Grandpa Reindeer. I flew up from the Exceed Cruiser and landed on Mahara's Island. A short distance away from me was an old man with antlers like reindeer. His wrinkled face was covered with a gentle smile 
giving him the air of a good-natured old man. The old man approached me, waving his right hand in the air. Oh, you have come well. It's a long way to this place, isn't it? He seemed very friendly. If I were to use an analogy, it would be like an old man welcoming his grandchildren back home. At least, I don't get the impression that he is hostile. You already have the arrogant dragon in your place, don't you? I, like her, was born as a human being, albeit a calamity. I usually hide my horns when I go out on the town. The old man patted himself on the head. As soon as he tapped his head, the antlers shrank and were hidden by his fluffy gray hair. When he tapped his head again, the antlers grew in the opposite direction this time. It was quite a strange thing to see. As I gazed at the antlers, the old man said, Well, first of all, let me introduce myself. I am the faraway lazy dragon, and I often use the name Tidal in public. A lazy dragon and Tidal. It sounds like a pun, but it is easy to remember. T slash N, da, comma means lazy in Japanese. Above all, the somewhat relaxed sense of naming matched the old man's friendly atmosphere. I nodded my head in understanding. Then, let me introduce myself next. My name is Kukazuka, and I am a D-rank adventurer. I'm a, of course, I know who you are. You are a, transmigrator, who possesses the three powers of the hero, the demon king, and the sage, and also has the power of, creation, aren't you? Don't you know a lot, don't you? When I replied with some surprise, Tidal smiled cheerfully and told me, This lazy dragon has a unique ability called, Thousand Miles Leap, which allows me to see and hear various things in the past and the present by sleeping. You mean that you have grasped me with the power of, Thousand Miles Sleep? That's right. Of course, I also know why you came to Mahara's Island. You are investigating the ancient ruins, right? Yes. I heard that the pirates took an ancient weapon from here. That is correct. Mahara's Island is a place with which I have a deep connection, and it was a real surprise when I came back after a long absence to find that the ruins had been raised to the ground by pirates. Tidal sighed sorrowfully. The gesture was so human-like that he didn't seem like a calamity at all. I am grateful to you. Kudono. You did a great job of beating up those pirates. I was thrilled when I watched you in there, thousand miles of sleep. Kakakakaka. Tidal laughed with genuine amusement and clapped me on the shoulder. His behavior was exactly like that of a cheerful old man. I'd like to show you around the ruins of this island if you wouldn't mind as a thank you. I decided to return to the Exceed Cruiser with Tidal. Before I could ask him to show me around the ancient ruins. I had to introduce him to everyone. Tidal also seemed to be able to fly, so we headed back to the ship, both of us floating in the air together. Even so, your ship is magnificent. Just looking at it makes my sailor's blood boil. Were you a sailor before? It was a long time ago. Tidal suddenly looked nostalgic and said, As I said before, I was born a human being. I did not know that I was a calamity, but I worked diligently as a sailor and tried to be happy like anyone else. But, was there an incident? That was when I was 18 years old. The ship I was on capsized, and when I was on the verge of death, that was the moment I remembered that I was a calamity. Since then, I've been traveling around, away from home. Despite his words, Tidal looked somewhat sad. His gaze is directed across the sea in the direction of Fort Port. But he eventually shook his head to shake off the sentiments and grinned. Sorry for the gloomy talk, Kakakaka. No, I don't mind. While we were talking, we approached the Exceed Cruiser. I went down to the ship's deck and introduced Tidal to Iris and the others. It didn't take long for them to lower their guard, probably due to Letitia being a precedent as a human-born calamity. I'm Iris Note Fafner. You can call me Iris. Nice to meet you. Tidal San. I am Lily Luna Loon Area. I am accompanying Kusan as their, God of War's Shrine Maiden. I am Dest. Welcome to the Exceed Cruiser. I am Zurara. Grandpa, your antlers are so cool. You look so strong. The only reason I look strong is because of my appearance. To be honest, I doubt I could even beat a lonely wolf. Kakakakaka. No, 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 wait a minute. How can a calamity be weaker than a lonely wolf? As I tilted my head. Letitia opened her mouth. Indeed, it seems that Tidal Sama has lost most of his power as a calamity now. I am Letitia Demetia, also known as the brilliant and arrogant dragon. Pleased to meet you. Oh, I know you from, Thousand Miles Sleep. You are looking for your brother, aren't you? Have you found his whereabouts? I have a pretty good idea where he is, don't worry. May I ask you about the reason why you lost your powers? Of course. It's quite simple, 
Though, with that said, Tidal cleared his throat, as the name implies. The lazy dragon gains its power by being lazy. But I've been very busy these past few days. I've had minimal sleep. In short, you are saying that you are too fatigued to exert yourself? Yes, you are right, Kudono. I would need three years of sleep to recover to my full potential. Tidal nodded in response to my words. I am fine with just spending my days in peace and quiet. I'm not interested in power. I just want to be able to protect myself. Are you sure you don't intend to act as a calamity? Of course not. I'm a lazy dragon, there is no way I will do such a troublesome thing. Kakakaka. Tidal laughed cheerfully. Now that the greetings are over, it's time to head for the ruins. I called out to Dest and asked him to move the Exceed Cruiser. Well then, we're off. I'm counting on you. The sound of the engine's drive echoed as the ship entered the cave below the cliff. The cave's ceiling was like a stalactite cave and it was quite impressive. There was a huge gate at the back. The Orichalcan rocks and the unmanned assault cruisers that accompanied it must have left the island from here. Beyond the gate was a ship stock, or should I say, the wreckage of the dock. Everywhere was so badly destroyed that barely anything remained of the dockyard. The site was in such a state of disrepair that it could not have been caused by weather over the years alone. It's terrible. When I said this, Tidal looked down with sadness in his eyes. The pirates have been raiding the ruins and even stealing ships. As you know, the Orichalcum Rocks is a weapon with terrible power, and I never thought they would target Fort Port. That city is my birthplace. I see. I was surprised, but at the same time, I was convinced. I guessed that Tidal was thinking of his hometown when he gazed in the direction of Fort Port earlier. We then chose a spot on the dock with the least amount of damage and disembarked from the Exceed Cruiser. Thanks. Dest. Yes, let me know when you're ready to return. I nodded at Dest's words, and then I activated my item box. A magic circle floated on the sea's surface, and the Exceed Cruiser was sucked into it. Tidal rolled his eyes at the sight. Kudono, that was. It's an item box. It has unlimited capacity, and a ship of that size can be freely inserted and removed. This explanation has become somewhat of a standard. Thinking this, I looked at Tidal, who for some reason, had his arms folded and a thoughtful expression on his face. What's the matter, Tidal Sama? When Letitia called out to him, Tidal suddenly came to his senses, smiled a good-natured smile, and said, No, 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 I was just a bit dazed. I've been busy the past few days restoring the ruins, which were ravaged by pirates. Those guys are so good to make me, a lazy dragon, clean up after them. At this point, I'm tempted to call myself a dried up overworked dragon. Kakakaka. This dragon had a look that was very common in Japan. My co-workers and I all worked with dead eyes, and I think our company was a den of dried up, overworked dragons. Aside from this personal experience, Tidal's loss of power as a lazy dragon was probably due to the fact that he was working on repairs to the ruins facility. Grandpa Tidal, are you alright? Zurara called out to him with concern. If you're tired, I can give you a massage. Oh. You're so kind, Zura-chan. I'll ask you to give me a massage someday. Tidal replied and began to walk slowly. Well, this way. Follow me closely, so you don't get lost. Tidal led the way as we walked through the ruins. The pirates had raided not only the ship's dock but also the corridors and rooms along the way, making it look as if a storm had passed through. They are really reckless. I wonder if they don't know the difference between adding and subtracting. Iris muttered sadly. And next to her, Lily nodded her head. I am so glad that the pirates were caught. I agree with her. Dox and his crew had acquired the weapons of an ancient civilization and were intoxicated by their power. They were looting and destroying everywhere, and many people could have been killed. It was meaningful to have prevented that from happening. After walking through the ruins for a while, we eventually arrived at a very large room. The atmosphere was similar to that of an airport control room. A large monitor was attached to the front wall and the screen was divided into three sections. On the upper left was a map of the surrounding area, on the upper right a schematic diagram of the volcano, and on the lower half a graph of complex waveforms. Looking down, there were several shiny, glowing machines like the ones we had seen in the control room of Orichalcum Rocks. What in the world is this room for? As I wondered, Tidal turned to me and began to explain. Kudono, you knows there is a volcano on Maharas Island. 
right? Yes. Dot, I saw smoke coming out of the crater earlier. Then that makes it easy to talk about. There is a magic formula under the island to suppress volcanic eruptions, and the equipment to control it is gathered here. Tidal looked around at the machines. The pirates are really quite indiscriminate. They are destroying every piece of equipment in this room. That's why we've had more earthquakes lately and smoke has been coming out of the crater. Dot, if the equipment is broken, doesn't that mean there's a danger of an eruption? Kakakakaka, there is nothing to worry about. Tidal assured me with a confident smile. I've been up all night repairing the equipment. The magic formula is functioning properly, and the smoke from the crater should dissipate sooner or later. Dot I wonder if this is true. Rush construction without proper rest is very prone to problems. When I was in Japan, there were many times when I led a firefighting team to extinguish a fire. T slash N. The firefighting team is like a term for when he worked at the IT company in Japan to solve a problem that might arise immediately. The sense of smell I had developed through that experience alerted me to the situation. Hey, Ku. Iris quietly whispered in my ear. I have a bad feeling about this. What a coincidence. Me too. I nodded in a hushed voice. That's when it happened. Bit, bit. An alert sounded and suddenly there was a huge earthquake. My feet were shaking violently. I often learned in school that you should hide under your desk when an earthquake occurs, but unfortunately, there was no place around us where we could hide. Moreover, the ruins themselves were in danger of collapsing. I shouted as quickly as I could. Iris. Yes, I know. Just by calling her name, Iris knew what I was thinking. She took out her dragon god shield and deployed a barrier to surround all of us. After a while, the shaking stopped, but a second or third earthquake might come. Iris. Please keep the barrier in place. I checked my surroundings as I called out to her. Nothing seemed to have fallen or toppled over. The graph on the lower half of the screen fluctuated wildly. There was a sense of danger in the air. Master San, we are in trouble. I looked at Zurara, who was perched on a nearby machine with a serious expression on his face. I've accessed the system at the ruins, and it looks like the volcano is getting very active. It may erupt soon. With Zurara's voice. The monitor in front of us blacked out. The number 120 hours 2 minutes appeared in the upper right corner, and the countdown began. 120 hours 1 minute 120 colon 00 119 hours 59 minutes dot. What will happen when the number reaches 0? It is ominous. Too ominous. This number is the estimated time until the eruption. Zurara said, his eyes fixed on the monitor. It may actually be sooner, but... The volcano will erupt within two hours from now. What did you say? Tidal's voice was mournful, and he covered his wrinkled face with his right hand. He was so shocked that he fell to his knees. Don't tell me there's something wrong with my repair work. No, you didn't. Zurara consoled him. The equipment is fixed, and the technique is working. But the volcanic activity seems to be more active than ever. Dot there have been some unusual events happening all over the world recently and this may be one of them. But, Zurara continued, if the device had remained broken, the volcano would have erupted earlier. But thanks to Grandpa's efforts to fix it, nothing happened until we got here. So Tidal's work was not in vain. I said this, and Tidal, who had been feeling disappointed, looked up. I'm sorry to have bothered you, Kudono. I'm fine now. I'm just telling you the truth. Dot by the way, Zurara, do you know what the damage will be when the volcano erupts? Wait a minute. I'll put the information on the monitor in front of you. A beep sounded, and a map appeared on the screen. In the upper left corner was Maharez Island, and in the lower right corner was the coastal terrain centered on the city of Fort Port. If the volcano erupts, the entire surface of the island will be coated in magma, and I don't know if these ruins will be safe. What's more, Zurara continued. His tone is completely different from his usual one, and he is very serious. Fort Port is also in danger. Although it is a long way from the island, the damage could be devastating. Because of the earthquake and tsunami? Yes, you've got it all figured out, Master San. Zurara sounded impressed. This is knowledge I got from TV, in Japan. Earthquakes and tsunamis caused by volcanic activity are rare. However, they do occur with some frequency overseas, and the number of victims is not small. Perhaps this is a similar case. I'll put the projected extent of damage on the monitor. Around the time Zurara said this, the lower part of the map was painted bright red. 
The entire city of Fort Port was included in the area, although the landscape pavilion where we were staying is on high ground, there is a strong possibility that the tsunami will engulf the entire city, including that place. Zurara's words took my breath away. If even the landscape pavilion was unsafe, there was no choice but to flee inland. We need to get back to Fort Port as soon as possible and call for the evacuation of the people of the city. But will we make it in time? While listening to Letitia and Lily's conversation on the side, I turn my gaze to the upper right corner of the monitor. The countdown to the eruption was at 116 hours 8 minutes, and at that moment, I felt a small tremor in my step. Oops. I braced myself so as not to fall, and for a moment, my gaze wandered away from the monitor. I looked at the monitor again and saw 86 hours 56 minutes in the upper right corner. Wait a minute. Aren't the numbers jumping too quickly? I looked next to me and saw that Iris also had a puzzled expression on her face. Hey, Ku. The countdown time just suddenly dropped, didn't it? Yeah. What's going on, Zurara? I asked him that, and he answered with an apologetic look on his face. I'm sorry, Master San. That was the estimated time remaining before the eruption, so it could change depending on the situation. So it's just an estimate. Even if the countdown was correct, the time limit was less than an hour and a half away. Considering that it took two hours to get from Fort Port to Mahara's Island, even if we return at full speed now, the evacuation will not be completed in time. The earthquake and tsunami will destroy the city. The only way is to stop the eruption itself if we want to reduce the damage to zero. What comes to mind is the people who live in Fort Port. After the pirate extermination, Many people came to my place and thanked me for my work. They started to lift their arms in the air, and it was like a day of festivities. Dot to be honest, I didn't feel bad about it. It's nice when people appreciate what you've done, isn't it? It wasn't exactly a way to return the favor, but I want to protect the people who live in Fort Port. I don't want to leave anyone behind. I'm a real softie myself, but this is who I am. Everywhere I've gone. I've tried to save everyone I see, so I'm sure I will continue to do the same in the future. I affirm that answer. As long as you are you, full assist, will spare no expense to help you. I heard a voice in my head. It was inorganic, as usual, but unlike usual, it was filled with something like emotion. Currently, with the cards in Kukauzuka's hand, it is not possible to stop the eruption of the volcano. The city of Fort Port will be destroyed and many people will lose their lives. What is needed to change the future is to create a new hand. In the time you have left, please look for materials for, creation. You can do it No, we can do it. That is the conclusion of, full assist. It seems the production skill acquired in another world is the strongest, volume 3 chapter 13. Thanks to Sfcipher for the Kofia and this chapter, and also join our Patreon to get more chapters, enjoy. Ed, Blast. Chapter 13. I tried to create a new sacred treasure with, creation. After I finished listening to the voice of, full assist, I looked around again, the countdown on the monitor in front of me displayed 85 hours 4 minutes. Iris, Lily, Letitia, Zurara, Tidal everyone had a look of uncertainty on their faces. What should we do with the time we have left? Perhaps they were at a standstill, unable to come up with an answer. I told them, even if we return to Fort Port now. We will not be able to evacuate the residents in time. We need to find a way to stop the volcano from erupting. Tidal, you know a lot about these ruins, don't you? Yes. I lived here for a while. I know most of these ruins. Then tell me, are there any items left in these ruins for the transmigrator? Tidal kept his eyes down for a while and thought for a while before answering. There is a treasure room in the deepest part of the ruins that only transmigrator can enter. Perhaps we should try to go there. I understand. Please lead the way. Yes. Then follow me. Tidal led us out of the room. We went down a nearby staircase to the back of the ruins and found a small door at the end of the passage. In the center of the door was a handle. This is the treasure room. There seems to be a special barrier inside, so even my, thousand miles leap, cannot see what's inside. But, according to the records of the ruins, the door opens in response to the, transmigrator. I can feel the presence of the sacred beyond the door, though it is faint. Lily said quietly, right next to me, perhaps there is a third sacred treasure here. The sacred treasure is the weapon that contains the power of Warden, the god of war. The first two are in my possession. I wonder if the last one, the unmarked holy spear, 
is lying on the other side of the door. Let's go inside for now. As I touched the door handle with both hands, I heard, full assist s voice, Kukauzika is in possession of a, transmigrator. Since you meet the requirements, the treasure room will be unlocked. A clanging sound echoed, and the door automatically opened to the back. Beyond it was a small room. In the center of the room was a horizontal pedestal on which a battered spear rested. The spear was covered in rust and broken into three pieces. Is this the unmarked holy spear? Dot yes. The expression on Lily's face was one of astonishment as she nodded her head in agreement. But I never thought it would look like this. Lily Chan, maybe it's too soon to give up. Iris said and looked at the unmarked holy spear. Hey. That gram you're using was also broken when you first found it, wasn't it? Dot yeah. I close my eyes and think back to that time. In the beginning, gram, which was stored in the underground city of Un, was split in two in the middle, and the blade and handle were rusted. However, by restoring it with creation, it regained its original form. The same thing may be possible this time. Let's try using creation, I muttered and Iris nodded. Yes, I think it's worth a try. All right. I stepped forward and touched the shattered spear with my right hand. Then a recipe popped into my mind. Shattered spear, top, plus shattered spear, middle, plus shattered spear, bottom, plus dragon god's shield holy dragon spear fimbule. It seems that the dragon god's shield is also used as a material. What is produced by this recipe is not a restored and marked holy spear but a completely different weapon. What in the world is going on? In response to my question, full assist, added more information. It seems that the unmarked holy spear has little of the power of the god of war left in it, and it is impossible to repair it as it is. Therefore, it seems that, creation will fuse the dragon god's shield and rebuild it as a new sacred treasure with the power of the dragon god in it. The effect is that it would contain the power of ice. If that's the case, then it would be useful to stop the volcano. I would like to create it with, creation, right away, but the material is a problem here. The dragon god's shield is a treasure of the dragon folk, and the holy spear is a sacred treasure of the god of war religion. Neither of them is something I can use as material on my own judgment. Iris, Lily. Can I have a word? Actually, I briefly explained the recipe to them and asked if I could use the shield and the holy spear as materials. Their reply was as follows. I don't mind. It is to save many people. I am sure the dragon god will agree with me. I am of the same opinion. If you think it is necessary, please use it as a material for creation. Dot I understand. I'll use it then. I answered that and immediately started using creation. I received the dragon god's shield from Iris and placed it near the shattered holy spear. I held up my right hand and thought of activating the skill, creation, and with a snap, a dazzling flash of light burst forth. What great divinity! Lily gulped. The light passed, and then a large spear with a bluish-white tip was born. The holy dragon spear fimbule, a sacred weapon that contains the power of the dragon god. It has been greatly enhanced by Kukauzika's creation and can freeze all things in the vicinity. It can only be used by those who possess the, Dragon God's Shrine Maiden. Granted effects colon true Dragon God's Barrier X Dragon God's Blessing X Absolute Freeze X. Dotto. All of the granted effects are X's. The Shield and the Holy Spear. There is no doubt that they are two sacred weapons fused into one. The true Dragon God's Barrier X is a higher level compatible version of the Dragon God's Barrier X find in the Dragon God's Shield and the strength of the barriers and the range of their effects have been improved overall. The Dragon God's Blessing X improves the user's physical and magical abilities. It is a simple but important effect, and Absolute Freeze X, which is activated by putting magic power into the spear. The effect is to manipulate ice and snow it will unfreeze the target and it has a fairly wide range of uses. It can be used for a wide range of purposes, such as freezing an enemy who had been stabbed with it, causing a blizzard to freeze the surrounding area, or completely stopping molecular motion by depriving it of heat energy. I see. If used properly, it might even be able to stop an eruption. I turned to Iris and told her, it seems that only, Dragon God's Shrine Maiden, can handle the spear. Iris. Can I leave this to you? Dot me. Iris pointed to herself with her right hand and blinked repeatedly. Her crimson eyes are wide open. It seems that my words were very unexpected. But after a while, she came back to her senses and nodded. I understand. It's a big responsibility, isn't it? Yes, please. I said and took a step backward. Iris stepped forward and picked up the spear, 
thimble, in place of me. The tip of the spear glowed softly. You think you can use it? Dot yes, Iris replied, looking at the spear intently. I can feel something like the will of the spear. Dot it seems to be very motivated, and I think it will probably work. Fimbul's tip shone strongly in response to these words. That's pretty dependable. As I nodded to myself, I felt a small, wobbly tremor beneath my feet. The ceiling was grumbling down as grains of sand. This is disturbing. I have a bad feeling about this. Letitia muttered as she brushed the grains of sand from her hair and clothes. I'm wondering how much time we have left, so why don't we go back upstairs for a while? Yes. Let's do that. I nodded and left the treasury with everyone in tow. We walked up the stairs and returned to the monitor room. The countdown on the screen was 42 hours 15 minutes. From the time we left this room to the time we returned, only about 10 minutes had actually elapsed. And yet the remaining time had dropped to less than half. Probably because the situation was growing more unstable. We'll test the power of the spear first and see if it works. Is that all right? Of course. Let's do everything we can. Iris gripped the spear tightly. Hey, hey, Master San. I looked down at my feet and saw Zurara there. Looking straight up at me, he said in a quiet voice. Can I stay here? Dot I might be able to buy you more time if I adjust the control device. It would help you too, Master San. Dot but... It's dangerous. If an eruption were to occur, there is no telling what would happen to the ruins. Instead of collapsing due to earthquakes, magma could come pouring in. I'll be fine. Yes, I'm absolutely sure. But Zurara said in a strong tone of voice. I believe Master San will stop the volcano. I'll stay, too. It was Tidal who said this. I can hardly use my power as a calamity right now. Even if I go with you to the volcano. I will only be able to leave more of the old man's stuff behind. I'd rather be here adjusting the controls than there. Dot if push comes to shove, I'll take Zurara Chan with me and run away. Don't worry about that. Dot I understand. I thought about it for a moment and nodded. Zurara, Tidal, I'll leave the control devices to you. But if you feel it's dangerous, you must evacuate the ruins immediately. Yay, thank you. Master San. Um, I think I have a good grasp of when it's time to retreat. Don't worry about us. Kaka Kaka. Tidal stretched out his chest dependably and laughed in a jovial voice. Then he tightens his expression and turns to me. As I said before, Fort Port is my hometown. Dot my friends and family have long since passed away, but their grandchildren are alive and well. Watching them grow up is one of the few things I look forward to. Tidal's face was full of the gentle kindness that is typical of an old man as he said this. He did not look like a world-destroying calamity. Please protect the city of Fort Port and the people who live there. I beg you. And Tidal bowed deeply, profoundly. I nodded and said in a clear tone, Leave it to me. I will stop the eruption. It seems the production skill acquired in another world is the strongest. Volume 3 Chapter 14 Thanks to Sfcipher for the Kofia and this chapter. And also join our Patreon to get more chapters, enjoy, ed, blast. Chapter 14, I tried to confront a volcanic eruption. Thus, Zurara and Tidal stayed behind. The rest was up to Lily and Letitia. I'll go. Lily said in a modest but strong tone. I have seen Iris San's new spear several times in my, foresight, a few years ago. Perhaps the contents of my dreams may be useful. Please allow me to join you. Following Lily. Letitia opened her mouth. This arrogant dragon has other unique abilities besides, domination, and perhaps they will be useful. I understand. Then, I will be counting on you. Yes, please leave it to me. Letitia said, spreading the hem of her skirt and bowing. As usual, her gesture was very graceful. For a moment, I even had the illusion that we were in a ballroom. What brought me back to reality was a small tremor. Dot another earthquake. I looked at the monitor and saw that the time limit on the upper right was 24.15. The remaining time was dwindling significantly. I had better hurry. Let's go, everyone. I called out to Iris and the others and left the monitor room. We were running out of time. I will definitely stop the eruption. We took a short run back to the ship stock. I opened their, item box and thought of taking out the Exceed Cruiser. A large magic circle floated on the water's surface, and a ship over 15 meters long emerged from it. Dest was connected to the center of the hull as if pierced through it. Dest turned toward me, saluted with a clang, and uttered a voice. Good work, Master. May I help you? Yeah. We need to be out of here in a minute. I told Dest and got into the Exceed Cruiser. Iris, Lily, 
and Letitia followed behind. Once everyone was on board, Dest said, Well then, we're leaving. At the sound of his voice, the Exceed Cruiser's engines roared to action. The ship left the dock and passed through the front gate. Keep your distance until we can see the entire island. Very well. Dest nodded at my words. The Exceed Cruiser accelerated rapidly and we were out of the cave in a single bound. It continued to move away from Mahara's island. How much time do we have left? Full assist, answered my question. We have established communication with the control system of the ruins. The estimated time until the eruption is 18 minutes and 30 seconds. That's pretty close to the limit. But it's times like this when it's important to remain calm. I took a deep breath. Then, keeping my eyes fixed on the island, I call out to Dest at the right moment. Can you please stop the ship now? Roger that. Slowing down, the Exceed cruiser turned and decelerated. A white splash of water rose up. When it came to a complete stop, the front of the ship faced Mahara's island. Smoke was billowing from the volcano in the center of the island, and there was a tingling atmosphere in the air. The sky was shrouded in black clouds and the sun was nowhere to be seen. The weather was ominous. I furrowed my brow and told Iris. It's time to get started. Are you ready? Yes, okay. Iris gave a small smile and raised the fimbule. The tip of the spear glowed blue. Dot the spear says. Iris muttered with her eyes downcast, partially freezing the volcano won't help. In fact, it might even hasten the eruption. Dot indeed. I don't know much about it myself. But I remember hearing in a class back in high school that eruptions occur when top magma cools. When the temperature drops, some of the magma solidifies, and the gas that was dissolved in it escapes. As a result, the pressure increases, leading to the eruption. Perhaps that was what Fembule was warning about. As I was convinced, Iris continued, Fembule is going to interfere with the entire volcano with its absolute freeze to stop the movement of the small, invisible particles apparently. It's going to take a long time because it needs to exert its power over a wide area. Anyway, I'll give it a try. Invisible little particles? Maybe it was talking about atoms and molecules. At absolute zero, all atomic and molecular motion would be static. Fembule was probably trying to suppress the eruption by creating that state. That's a hell of a power, even though it's an item of my own creation, I couldn't help but be impressed. In the meantime, the fembule grew brighter and brighter. The cold wind blew with a whoosh. Dot. A small, watery object struck me around the neck. What is this? Snow, I think. Letitia muttered as she looked up at the sky. The reason why she looked somewhat nostalgic was probably because she was from a snow country. At first, the snow was falling slowly and unobtrusively. But soon, the snow began to fall with increasing intensity. The ambient temperature began to drop and a cold wind was blowing. It's cold, Lily said, shivering. I took off my Fenra coat and draped it over her shoulders. Thank you very much. But are you all right, Kusan? No problem. I'm fine. However, the weight of the snow might sink the ship if it continued accumulating. Just as I thought that, Dest raised his voice. The magic core is now running at maximum capacity. Heaters on. From inside the Exceed Cruiser, a driving sound like a scream rose up. Soon. The surroundings became warmer and warmer. The snow on the deck began to melt. I didn't know such a convenient function existed. Now, how about the volcano? I turned my eyes toward Mahara's island. Smoke was still rising heavily from the crater. The estimated time until the eruption is 12 minutes and 30 seconds. There are 8 minutes and 50 seconds left until Fembule's absolute freeze is activated. Full assist announced this in my mind and supplemented the information further. This snow was just a byproduct of absolute freeze X, and the magic was still in the stage of needing its magical power. At any rate, if things continue to progress smoothly, it looks like we will be in time for the eruption. If we are careless with things like this, something unexpected will surely happen. When I was in Japan, I had to deal with such scenarios many times when dealing with flaming incidents. The most dangerous time was when you felt that everything would be fine. I would like to look for other cards to play in addition to Fimbule in case of emergencies. Just as I thought that, I heard the sound. Go 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 go. A thundering roar came from the direction of Mahara's island. The sea shook, and the waves rumbled violently. Since the Exceed Cruiser had been granted stability enhancement S, the hull did not waver much. But there was something more important. The volcano was shaking. The roar was getting louder. Isn't this bad? There, full assist, 
in my mind alerted me. The estimated time until the eruption had suddenly shrunk. 30 seconds left. I shouted as quickly as I could. Use the spear, Iris. Dot. Iris looked puzzled for a moment but immediately looked at me and nodded. The spear was raised, and at the same time, she raised her voice. Her fimbia released a dazzling flash. I involuntarily closed my eyes. A strong wind blew. After the light passed, I slowly opened my eyelids. The volcano was covered in white snow. The roar of the volcano was gradually subsiding. Was it possible to stop the eruption? As if in response to my question, full assist, informed me. Fimbul's absolute freeze X was activated incompletely. Volcanic activity is still continuing, but the eruption has been averted for now. Does this mean that we were able to buy some time? Affirmative. The estimated time until the eruption was 7 minutes and 30 seconds. In order to reactivate Fimbul's absolute freeze X, 8 minutes and 45 seconds are needed. This is not good. We'll never make it in time. Iris had already raised Fimbul and started to reactivate absolute freeze X, but she seemed to sense the lack of time and her expression was grim. She was even hesitant to talk to me. I need other cards in my hand to stop the volcano. What can I do? I looked around. And suddenly, my eyes met Lily's. She seemed to have a hard time with the cold, and she was holding on to the Fenra coat I had lent her earlier, looking up at me. Um, Kusan, what's wrong? Dot I knows this scene. She said this and turned her gaze toward the volcano. The snow around the crater had already begun to melt. The estimated time until the eruption was 5 minutes and 13 seconds. I saw it in my dream. A pale spear, a snow-covered volcano. And then, and then Lily suddenly stopped talking. I'm sorry. I can't find the right words. No problem. Just tell me what it is, even if it's a little fuzzy. Dot I understand. Lily nodded and told the rest of the story. In my dream, a very large mass fell from the sky. A meteorite, I guess. I thought it hit a volcano, and then a golden light spread out. I don't know what happened after that. I woke up. I see. I nodded my head for a moment but it didn't make any sense at all. I would like to get a few more hints. If it was a meteorite, I have an idea what it might be. It was Letitia, who was right beside me listening to the conversation, who answered. She continued speaking while looking up at the sky. There is a unique ability of the arrogant dragon called, Falling Star. It summons the stars shining in the heavens and strikes them to the ground. Such is its power. In other words, does this mean an attack by dropping a meteorite? In a sense, it may be a unique ability befitting a world-destroying calamity. How about I summon a meteorite with, falling star, and smash it into the volcano? If the volcano itself is obliterated, there is no danger of eruption. It was a very Letitia-like idea, bold and forceful. It was interesting, to say the least. But it was too dangerous. If a meteorite hits the ground, the shockwave will cause earthquakes and tsunamis that would devastate Fort Port. That would make it completely pointless. The purpose of this mission is to protect the people of the city. After informing Letitia of this, I said, the idea of eliminating the existence of the volcano itself might be an option. Then, if we can't destroy the volcano, we can seal it up into a mountain. That's it. Eh? There was a flash of inspiration in my head. I have the creation skill. Why don't I just use the volcano as a material and make a new mountain out of it? Like when I restored the Zard Bridge, for example, or when I rebuilt the harbor at Fort Port. It may be a forced method, but I wonder. Yes, that's it. It is indeed forceful itself, but it is worth considering. In my head, full assist, answered. Its voice sounded as if it was smiling wryly. We will now construct the means to realize the creation of a new mountain. Please wait for a while. Oh. Please take care of it. I'm always indebted to, full assist. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're a strange one, talking with your skills. I think so too. But, it would be nice to at least express my gratitude, wouldn't it? Maybe. Dot construction is complete. This, creation, is expected to place a tremendous burden on the mental realm. In the worst case, you may lose your thoughts, feelings and become crippled. May I run the process? I took a deep breath. I might become crippled. I was indeed a little shaken by such a statement. But, I would feel terrible if I ran away from this place. I will regret it for the rest of my life. I don't want that. I would rather risk my life than abandon someone I could have saved. You have to do the process. Rebuild the volcano. Understood. Full assist. Compliments you on your courage and determination. We will now perform the installation of the information necessary for, 
creation. Immediately after, a flood of information flows into your mind. It lasted less than a few tenths of a second, and before I knew it, I fully understood what I was supposed to do. There are less than five minutes left until the eruption. Let's make this quick. Letitia, can I ask you to prepare the falling star? A. Eh? Add my words. Letitia raised a bewildered voice. It's no wonder. The idea of using their falling star was rejected just a few minutes ago. However, Letitia looked at me and immediately nodded. I understand. Dot you have your own ideas, don't you, Kusama? Yeah. When I give you the signal, summon the meteorite. Leave it to me. Foo foo. My arms are ringing. Letitia smiled wryly, and her right hand was covered with the radiance of a meteor. The wind swirled, and her long golden hair floated softly. The appearance was so dignified and beautiful that one could not help but gaze at it. But that's not the point now. I took my eyes off Letitia and headed for Iris. The area around her was filled with bluish-white particles. She was probably working up the magic power to activate the absolute freeze X. Iris, change of plan. Roger that. Dot you're going to reshape the mountain, aren't you? You got that right. I heard Ku's voice. Iris smiled and continued. I wonder what I can do to help. I need you to freeze the volcano at the same time as Letitia drops the meteor. I understand. If I freeze a part of the volcano, it might accelerate the eruption. But if you remake the mountain itself with creation, this should be no problem. That is the way it is. Please take care of it. I told Iris that, and finally, I went to Lily's place. Kusan. Do you have a role for me? Of course I do. Wait a minute. I answered Lily and opened their item box. A voice echoed in my head as I took out the Drissel bow. From now on, the forced interference process will be performed on the Drissel's bow, and the seal will be released. Please activate, limit break, limit break. It is a skill that I obtained right after the battle with the gluttonous dragon, and it allows me to raise my magical power capacity significantly temporarily. I concentrated my consciousness and thought about activating the skill. Com. At that moment, a warm golden light enveloped my entire body. This was the same phenomenon that occurred during the battles with the black dragon and the gluttonous dragon. Magic power filled the air. In terms of MP, the number kept rising. 500,000, 1 million, 2 million. In a matter of seconds, not only 10 million but 100 million, 1 billion, 1 trillion, and so on. The forced interference process is initiated. A golden light streamed into the bow. At the same time, my head ached. Was this the load on the mental realm? It felt as if my skull had cracked. Q. I involuntarily put my right hand on the side of my head. Kusan? Lily shouted in surprise. I shook my head and answered. I'm fine. Don't worry about it. But, trust me. I told her with a serious expression on my face. Lily was anxiously silent but then shook her head. Forced interference process. Successful. The drizzle bow is now unsealed and can be used at 25% output. The bow's status is shifted from anti-calamity to creation assistance. Drizzle's bow is not just a weapon to kill calamities. It can also function to assist in creation. Apparently, we will now execute the process of summoning the arrows. The golden light surrounding my body became even more bright. My headache becomes even more intense and my vision repeatedly brightens and darkens. It's like a broken TV set. Soon, a magic circle appears in the void. I put my right hand into it. Something hits my fingertip, so I grab it and pull it out. It was a golden arrow. It was different from the Calamity Killer arrow. It was covered with silver light. Then, what is this golden arrow? There, appraisal, is automatically activated, and information about the arrow flows in. It is called Dima's arrow. When there, God of War's Shrine Maiden, releases this, everything in the surrounding area can be used as material for, creation. Apparently, the power of Warden, the god of war, can make the very existence of all things fragile. But to be honest, I only understand it lightly. However, the word Yma was familiar to me. It is said that Odin, the supreme god, created the universe using Yma's body as the material. I knew that this world was like something similar to Norse mythology. I handed the bow and arrows to Lily while thinking about this. When the meteorite from Letitia falls, put your magic power into it and shoot the arrow! Exclamation mark. Behind my right eye, 
I felt something burst. My words were interrupted unexpectedly. Something trickles down my cheek. I wiped it with my right hand and found that it was covered with thick blood. It seemed that my eye was bleeding. It was probably a reaction to the summoning process. The headache continued at this moment. Frankly, it was so painful that I wanted to throw it all away. Somehow I managed to hold on to my consciousness as I continued to speak. I had already summoned the arrows. Lily should not be burdened. Dot thank you. Lily was looking up at me with an expression that looked as if she was about to cry. Don't worry. I'm okay. I patted Lily's head while putting on a strong smile. Well, the last thing I needed to do was to prepare myself. I opened their item box and took out the spirit ring and the twilight scroll. I put the ring on the middle finger of my right hand. Then, the scroll spread by itself and floated in the air. The connection with the twilight scroll has been established. We will now confirm the conditions. Creator God, Spirit, Dragon God, God of War, and Calamity. The role given to the twilight scroll is to unite the five great powers. Now it is about to be fulfilled. 1. Kukauzika has acquired, creation. Two. Kukauzika is in possession of the spirit ring. 3. We have confirmed the presence of, Dragon God's Shrine Maid, Iris Note Fafna at this place. 4. We have confirmed the presence of God of War's Shrine Maiden, Lily Luna Lunaria at this place. 5. We have confirmed the existence of a calamity cooperating with Kukauzika in this place. The name is Letitia Demetia, the brilliant and arrogant dragon. Since all conditions have been met, the performance limitation of, creation, is temporarily lifted. And then, suddenly, all the pain disappeared. My consciousness became clear. It was like a refreshing morning after a good night's sleep. My thoughts were clear. I wonder if the lifting of the restriction on, creation, had such an effect on my mind and body. I felt like I could do anything now. The time remaining before the eruption was, 56 seconds. With the time limit nearing, the volcano rumbled and the sea shook. Another earthquake came. But the remaining time did not decrease. The reason for this was given by, full assist. Thanks to Zurara and Tidal's continued adjustment of the control system, it seemed we were able to prevent further accidents. Thanks, you too. With a small smile on my face, I tell Letitia. Now, please. Very well. Letitia's, falling star, was activated. A huge magic circle appeared in the sky. Her, with a spirited shout. Letitia raised her right arm. A chain of light extended from her hand and was sucked into the magic circle. Dot I got it. Letitia muttered in a whisper and swung the right arm down. Yeah. Then, as if pulled by a chain of light extending from her right hand, a huge meteorite appeared from the magic circle. Its diameter probably exceeded a hundred meters. It was so majestic that it looked as if the sky was falling. The huge mass approached the volcano. At that moment, I shouted, Iris, Lily, leave it to me, dot leave it to me. Iris's fimbia released a blue flash, and the volcano was enveloped in ice and snow. At the same time, Ma's arrows were released from Lily's bow. The arrows were covered with a sparkling brilliance and became golden meteors. Everyone did a great job. Now it's my job. The volcano, the ice and snow, the meteorite, and Ma's arrows. The four things were the materials, and I activated. Creation. Uh, https colon slash slash nikes translation home dot files dot wordpress dot com slash two thousand and twenty two slash oh six slash oh 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 one two dot jpg. A dazzling flash of light bursts forth. Since the performance limitation of creation had been lifted, there was no longer any need to be touching the target. If I wish for it, everything will become a reality by mixing the volcano and the ice and snow. The eruption was suppressed. Here, I added meteorites to create a new source for the core of the mountain. The ground would also be rebuilt. Every step of the process was done in an instant. It is strange to say it myself, but it was truly an act of God. The golden flash that enveloped Mahara's island gradually faded and eventually disappeared completely. The mountain created by their creation was one size larger than the original volcano and occupied more than half of the island's area. All the magma became a mineral resource, and because the structure of the mountain changed and the crater itself had disappeared, the smoke plumes stopped. I couldn't hear the Earth's tremors anymore. All I could hear was the sound of the Exceed Cruiser's engine. For a moment, I looked in the direction of Fort Port. The danger to the city is now over. The damage was prevented, and there were no casualties. It's a happy ending. 
no complaints. It seems the production skill acquired in another world is the strongest. Volume 3 Chapter 15 Thanks to Sfcipher for the Kofia and this chapter, and also join our Patreon to get more chapters, enjoy. Ed, Blast Chapter 15 I explored the mine. Speaking of, creation, I was curious about the effects that it imparts and found that the mountain was endowed with infinitorix while the underground was endowed with magma calming s plus and vibration absorbing s plus respectively. Thinfinite or x is said to revive the ore inside the mountain after a certain period. It can be thought of as a place similar to a gathering point in an RPG. Magma calming s plus subsides underground magma preventing volcanoes from being formed. Vibration absorbing S plus is a measure against earthquakes. It completely absorbs any shaking, no matter what the cause. With these two things in place, the safety of Fort Port would not be threatened by a situation like this again. While thinking about this, the twilight scroll floating in the air spun itself up and returned to my hand. As I was storing it in my item box, a voice echoed in my head. Connection with the Twilight Scroll terminated. Creation. Well done. It was the best possible outcome. Thank you. It's thanks to, Full Assist S support. You're welcome. I'm so glad things turned out this way for everyone. I heard I might become crippled. How's it going over there? Dot. Are you okay? My apologies. This system is extremely overloaded and will require some cooldown time. May I enter into safe mode with remaining functionality left at a minimum? Yes, that's fine. Have a good rest. Thank you very much. Well then, I will see you again. With those words, I felt as if something was leaving me. Reboot in safe mode. The voice that echoed in my head had a completely different impression from the one I had just heard. The sound was mechanical and indifferent to all intents and purposes, as for me, I'm going to miss, full assist, but this time, full assist, did a great job. First of all, let's have them take a good rest in safe mode. As I think about this, the inorganic voice tells me, creation S level has reached 25. The recipes will be increased. The original skill level was 17, so that's an increase of 8 levels at once. A new skill, material substitution I has been unlocked. Oops. It seems that a skill has been added. What in the world would be the effect? Dot I see. It seems that, material substitution I, is a skill that when performing, creation, with a recipe that has been performed before, one of the required materials can be substituted at the cost of magic power. For example, the recipe for flying potion is flying mushroom x1 plus wet mushroom x1. But if you have flying mushroom, you don't need to prepare wet mushroom. It can be substituted by consuming magic power. This is a very useful skill. The other point of concern is the number of material substitution I, perhaps, material substitution 2, or, material substitution 3, will be added in the future. As I was thinking about this, the strength left my legs. It must be a reaction to the creation. I just did. Oops. I almost fell down. And then Iris lent me her shoulder from the left. Ku, can you stand up? Dot honestly, it's tough right now. Then lean on me. I'm sorry. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Iris replied and turned her caring gaze towards me. Is there anything that hurts? It seemed to be quite painful when you activated the skill, though. It was definitely hard until I activated it. But now I'm just tired. Don't worry about it. As I was answering like that. Lily came over to me. Lily also looked anxious. Kusan, is your right eye okay? Yeah. I can see fine. I answered while checking the vision of my right eye. I remember when I summoned my Zero, it suddenly started bleeding. Lily must have been in a state of shock since she was right up close and personal with the scene. Dot I'm kind of sorry about that. As I was thinking about this, Lily looked at me and bowed her head. Thank you very much for your help this time. What does she mean? I can't think of any reason why Lily would thank me. As I tilted my head, Lily continued. Activating the bow and summoning the arrows should really be my work. But this time, Kusan did it all for me. Dot it's hard when someone else has to do the hard work for you. That's why we all need to help each other. Wouldn't you agree? It was the fresh voice of Letitia that blew away the damp atmosphere. If I were to use an analogy, it would be like a cool summer breeze. It was bright, cool, and comfortable. When I looked at Letitia, she looked at me for a moment, nodded her head, and brushed her golden hair back with her right hand. She then turned her gaze toward Mahara's island and, with gestures that sounded like a scene from a vaudeville play, 
raised her voice in a high pitch. Ladies and gentlemen, please look over there. Don't you think that mine, created with my meteorite, Iris's ice and snow, Lily's arrows, and Kusama's creation? is a marvelous work of art. It shines like a jewel in the sunlight. That's a lot of tension. Letitia is probably trying to change the atmosphere of the place in her own way. I agree with her. I appreciate the concern for my body. But right now I'd rather rejoice in the success of the creation. It was wonderful, everyone. I'm so proud of you. Dest's voice came out as if he was taking advantage of Letitia's words. I want to contribute to Master in ways other than just moving around. Dest paused as he said this raising his arms in the air with a clang. I understand. I'll keep that in mind. I nodded with a wry smile and turned to the others. This time, it worked out well because of you guys. I really thank you. It was pretty close. But I'm glad we got it done in time. Iris breathes a sigh of relief. But I didn't expect ice and snow to be used as material for creation. That's the same for me. Letitia nodded her head. I was really surprised because I thought that their falling star was a power for destruction. Kusama is totally out of the ordinary, or rather, out of the norm in every way. Really, it's an amazing power. Lily muttered with a sincere look on her face. Now we don't have to worry about eruptions, and Fort Port will be fine, right? Yes, it should be. I nodded at Lily's words. When looking up at the sky, the clouds around the island have disappeared. Perhaps they were involved in creation and consumed as material. That's a hell of a lot of power. Although it was my own doing, I still can't help but be surprised. With the sun shining in from the south, brightly illuminating the area around the ship, we congratulate each other on our good luck and decide to head back to the island. The Exceed cruiser passed through a cave under the cliff and through a gate at the back into a dock inside the ruins. There we found Zurara and Tidal. When I explained how I had stopped the volcano, they rolled their eyes in amazement. Master San, you are becoming more and more like a god. Kudono is truly out of the ordinary. I don't think I could win against you even if I gave it my all. Tidal sighed in admiration, then quickly tightened his expression and announced. I am truly grateful to you. Without you, the volcano would have erupted, and Fort Port would have been destroyed by the earthquake and tsunami. I will never forget this debt of gratitude I owe you for protecting my hometown. If there is anything I can do for you, Please feel free to talk to me. He held out his right hand to me. I responded with my right hand. At that moment, an inorganic voice echoed in my head. The contract with Far Away Lazy Dragon has been concluded. From now on, it will be possible to summon it using their calamity summoning. What did it say? When I was puzzled by the unexpected announcement, Tidal shouted, Ho ho ho. It seems you can now summon me with the calamity summoning. Do you know about it? I sort of do. Tidal replied with a wry smile. If the next time the gluttonous dragon appears, call me with calamity summoning. By using this skill, I will be able to borrow some of Kudono's magic power. But I can still fight with all my might for three minutes or so. Besides, my unique ability is like a natural enemy to that dragon. That's a good thing. We will have the possibility to fight the gluttonous dragon again. And when we do, I will rely on Tidal to help me out. As I nodded to myself, Letitia muttered right beside me. It's strange. What's wrong? There, summoning calamity, is a skill that allows you to follow a defeated calamity, but it should not have a function that requires you to make a contract with it. Do I remember wrong? No, no, your memory is correct, Letitia Dono. Perhaps the skill changed to match the way Kudono wanted it to be. Tidal then turned his gaze toward me. I wonder if you have learned anything about this, too, Kudono. In your travels so far, there must have been several occasions when your skills have evolved. Dot I see. I nod. For example, in the case of creation, originally, only the items in my item box could be used as materials. However, through the level up, Objects that touch the hand can also be used as materials. In addition, I just acquired a supplementary skill called, Material Substitution I. Full Assist, also became more talkative and made spontaneous suggestions compared to when I first arrived in this other world. I guess you could say this is evolution, too. As I agreed with him, Tidal continued. Changing, evolving or growing things that are related to you. That may be your unique ability. This inherent ability sounds like a calamity. When I shrugged my shoulders, Tidal said in a joking tone. There, transmigrator, 
and the Calamity are both beings called in from outside the world. In that sense, they are similar. Kakakaka. After that, we decided to head to the newly created mine in the mountains. The ruin still had a magic circle for teleportation, allowing us to move anywhere on the island. We used it to warp to the front of the mine. The entrance to the mine is a long rectangle, about 10 meters high and 20 meters wide. It's big. It looks easy to get in and out. It would also be easy to pull the trolley tracks through. We entered the mine with such conversation. Inside the mine, a cool breeze was blowing and it was quite comfortable. Looking at the ceiling, I saw that there were orange ores buried between the rock walls, which served as a source of light and illuminated the interior of the mine. After walking for about a minute, I found a place that looked like a large hall. It was a space of 50 meters square, from which a number of wider corridors extended. Each passageway contained various deposits of ore in abundant quantities. Gold, silver, copper, lead, tin, iron, chrome, coal and even or more. Every kind of mineral that exists in the world is here. It's like a museum in the shape of a mine. Tidal sighed in admiration. No other mountain in the world has so many minerals to be found. Creation, is truly a tremendous force. Master San, this is amazing. Zurara shouted cheerfully and jumped up and down on the spot. Before I knew it, he was wearing a yellow safety helmet on his head and holding a pickaxe in his right hand. I'm a lots of minerals slime. I dig, dig and dig for minerals. Do you have anything you want? Well then, can I ask you to gather up some orichal camores for me? Yes, leave it to me. Zurara headed for the ore deposit of orichal camore full of enthusiasm. The reason why I asked him to collect the orichal camore was because I had new recipe in my mind after my creation was leveled up. Currently, an ancient giant battleship the orichal Cam rocks is docked at the port of Fort Port. Unfortunately, the Orichilcum rocks is not in perfect condition. The reason lies with Letitia and me. When we fought the pirates, we went on a rampage without restraint. All of the magic laser turrets on the deck had been reduced to scrap, and the internal structure was damaged here and there. It would be extremely dangerous to let the ship sail long distances in this condition. However, it was noted that if I collect Orichilcum more and use creation, together with Orichilcum rocks, it was possible to rebuild it as a large luxury cruise ship. This would be very convenient, as we would no longer need to wait for a ship bound for the royal capital. Do your best, Zurara. Our journey depends on your pickaxe wielding skills. Thump thump thump. Clank clang. That sounds great. Lily gulped. There was a tremendous, violent metallic sound coming from the passageway where Zurara had headed. We then spent the next 30 minutes exploring the mine and returned to the hall or something like it. Then, a huge shadow appeared from one of the corridors. Master San, I'm back. I mind a lot. It was a blue, round, and plump creature. Zurara. However, his size had swelled to about five or even ten times his original size. He was enormous. Zurara, you've grown so much in the little time I've been away from you. It's too rapid for a growth spurt. Iris and Letitia muttered such things with expressions of surprise on their faces. What in the world is going on, Zurara? Well, let's see. I brought you the Orichel Kamor. I'll get it out now. Zurara opened his mouth wide as he said this. Then, a golden rock popped out of it with great force. According to the results of the appraisal, all of them were Orichel Kamor. I put them all into my item box. The amount of the ore collected was more than 10 tons, which was already enough for creation. Phew, that's all. Zurara, who had spat out all of the rough orichalcum, smiled a dazzling smile. Iris, who had been watching the scene, rolled her eyes and asked, Zurara-chan, didn't you exhaust all of the rough orichalcum in this mine? No, there was still more. Don't worry. At Zurara's remark, Tidal let out a groan of what? The Orichel Camor is a very rare metal. It was mined out in ancient civilizations, and there is little left now. If anyone else knew about this mine, it would turn the world upside down. Moreover, in this mine, all minerals are replenished at regular intervals. After all, comma Infinitorux is granted to this mine. When I explained this to Tidal, he was so astonished that he lost his words. Letitia spoke up instead. You should be very careful when handling the mine. It could trigger big trouble. Dot seems like a lot of trouble for a private individual to own. I mean, is this island the territory of some noble family? I can't seem to get enough information. As I was thinking about this, Iris called out to me. Hey, 
Ku. In the meantime, why don't you talk to the Adventurers Guild? Or better yet, talk to Milia. I'm sure she won't do anything that would be detrimental to you. Dot indeed. I have a feeling that she would be rather proactive and take our side. If the Adventurers Guild's response is not good enough, then I can take the matter to Count Maylard. If that doesn't work, I'll talk to the God of War religion through Lily. Since I am a transmigrator and a wielder of a divine weapon, I should not be treated so carelessly. It's reassuring to know that there are second and third options. After the discussion about the future of the mine, we decided to return to the city of Fort Port. Tidal was staying on the island, apparently. I'll keep an eye on things until a decision is made on how the mine is going to be handled. If I see any suspicious people approaching, I will contact you through their calamity summoning. Dot like this. Tidal lightly closed his eyes after saying that. Then, the back of my left hand became warm, and a crest that looked like a frontal image of a dragon's face floated in the air. The dragon's expression was out of breath and it looked very sleepy. When I summoned the black dragon, the crest had sharpened eyes. The design might be different depending on the corresponding dragon. I understand. Let me know if you need anything at any time. Yes, I am not very strong. I would appreciate it if you could come as soon as possible. I'll see you later. Yeah, I'll see you soon. Grandpa Tidal, take care. Well, excuse us. Please take care of yourself. We boarded the Exceed cruiser with Tidal seeing us off. When the boat left the island, Lily muttered something to herself. Dot I'm starving. Come to think of it, we hadn't had lunch yet. I checked the wall clock in the cabin and found that it was around 2 p.m. No wonder she was hungry. Well, that must make you hungry, right? Iris nodded in agreement and said, Hey, Ku. We have two hours to get to Fort Port. So why don't we go out for dinner and launch the ship? I agree. We have a lot of food in my item box, and we can have a small party. It's been a hard day's work this time. We need to spend some time working on each other. It seems the production skill acquired in another world is the strongest. Volume 3 Epilogue Thanks to Cypher for the Kofia and this chapter, and also join our party on to get more chapters. Enjoy. Ed. Blast. Epilogue. I return to Fort Port. And then, the flash of light when I used, creation, against the volcano was huge and could be seen from the distant city of Fort Port. The residents who witnessed the light were greatly disturbed. What in the world is going on? Don't tell me there's a dragon out there, like in Un and Surya. It's a disaster. W we have to get out of here. Anxiety led to panic in the city. The first to respond was Milia of the Adventurers Guild. Everyone, it's alright. Kukazakusan, the Dragon Slayer is on his way to that place. I am sure he will solve everything. She called out to the people of the city, and by mobilizing all the adventurers and staff with the calm skill, she was able to suppress the panic. I was told such a story by branch manager Jess. We were in the common room of the Fort Port branch. After returning to the city, we headed for the adventurers guild to make a report. Milia was currently busy with urgent work, so we decided to wait until she was finished while talking with Branch manager Jess. Milia-san seems to have a lot of trust in Kusan. Otherwise, she wouldn't have called out to you like that in front of so many people. Dot I see. Are you embarrassed? Oh, yes. That's true, but I didn't think that even the branch manager Jess would point it out to me. Ku usually has a calm face, but at times like this, his emotions really come out. Iris giggled on my left. Then, Letitia took advantage of this and said. Fufu. I think it's adorable that Kusama has that kind of expression. Master San, you're cute, aren't you? Well, I think it's nice, too. Wait a minute. Am I not under concentrated fire from all directions? What kind of face should I make in a situation like this? While I was wondering, Milia eventually came into the common room. Sorry, I'm late. Kusan, thank you for your hard work. Ah. You too. Did you finish your work? Of course I am. I've been carefully taking care of it with all my might in order to listen to Kusan's story. What kind of strange words are coming out of her mouth? Take care of it carefully. I don't know what it means, though. Milia is competent, and I'm sure she cut corners where she should have, worked carefully where she should have, and got the job done to the point. Once Milia and branch manager Jess were together, I began to report on the events on Mahara's island. However, I would keep the fact that Tidal was a calamity under wraps and refer to him as a personal researcher of ancient civilizations. Otherwise, the story would get complicated. When I finally explained that, creation, 
had created the mine and the effect of Thinfinite or Exporth Milia and branch manager Jess were immensely impressed. A moment of silence passed for a while, and eventually, Milia came to herself and opened her mouth. The light on Mahara's island was caused by Kusan after all. I heard the city was in an uproar. I'm sorry. No, no, don't worry about it. I mean, thank you for protecting Fort Port. If the eruption had happened, I am sure the earthquake and tsunami would have caused a lot of trouble. Isn't that right? Branch manager Jess. Yes, you are right, Milia San. Jess nodded while holding the bridge of her glasses with the right index finger. The lenses of both his eyes shone brightly. I am very grateful to you for saving the city from the crisis not only once but twice. I can't thank you enough, Kusan. Dot I don't mean to say this as a thank you, but I will do my utmost to make sure the mine will benefit you. The branch manager, Jess, told me this and then turned his attention to Milia. Since Mahara's island is under the jurisdiction of Count Maillard, we need to talk to him and then to His Majesty the King, don't we? Right. Sir, leave the negotiations to me. I will ensure that the Adventurers Guild will be in charge of the mine itself and that the profits from the mine will go right into Kusan's pocket. Milia stood up from the sofa and tapped her own chest with a reassuring thump. This seems like a safe thing to entrust her with. The next day was a bit more hectic. The Adventurers Guild had decided to conduct another survey of Mahara's island and I had to head for the island with Milia and the guild staff. When the staff members entered the island's mines, they were amazed at the abundance of ore stored there. If we had this much gold and silver, we could probably play and live with it for the rest of our lives. So there really is such a thing as rough or right Ilkham, huh? A, no matter how much you mine, it will be restored to its original state after a certain period. That's amazing. Fortunately, no insolent person tried to steal the ore from the mine and the reservoir proceeded peacefully. On the last day of the re-examination, branch manager Jess came to Mahara's island, but at that time, Tidal had a somewhat sad expression on his face. What was going on? As I tilted my head, Tidal whispered to me. Jess's grandfather and grandmother were childhood friends of mine. Dot if I hadn't been a calamity, I'd have had a different life. It was the evening of four days later when the resurvey of the island was completed. It seemed that a ship bound for the royal capital was still unlikely to be available. It would be better to rebuild the Orichilcum rocks into a large passenger ship with creation, after all. I will try that tomorrow. For dinner that night, we decided to go to Orchid Fragrant Restaurant and have a seaboat paella. I entered the restaurant with Iris, Lily, Zurara, and Letitia. The table we were shown to was on the second floor as before, overlooking the stage on the first floor. Today, too, a chef was cooking on the stage, lifting a huge frying pan. He's always so dynamic. It looks like a lot of work. But I guess cook can do the same thing. Dot maybe. When wearing armored bear armor, it is possible to lift the huge frying pan with one hand since it has monstrous strength S+. Plus. When it comes to cooking, there's also there dexterity. While I was thinking about this, the food arrived. What it was ordered this time was the Dragon Slayer style sea boat paella. I ordered it because I was intrigued by a dish on the menu that bore my alias. The dish is based on the so-called ordinary sea boat paella. Yellow rice colored with saffron is placed in a vessel resembling a ship, and seafood such as shrimp, squid, octopus, etc., are scattered on the rice. The dish is also topped with crispy roasted on local chicken and tender stewed to beef, and a vegetable hotep stew is served in a separate bowl. Hotep is a traditional Sriya dish, a soup similar to pot of in French cuisine. Dot that's a hell of a lot of food. I couldn't help but let the words escape my mouth. I wondered if we could eat all of it, or rather, which part of it is the dragon slayer style. As I was wondering, Letitia, who was sitting across the table from me, said, on chicken, to beef and Surya's Hotep. All of them are specialties of the cities that Kusama has visited so far. So it's the Dragon Slayer style. Lily nodded and brought the crispy roasted un chicken to her mouth. It is delicious. Yay, I'll take it. Munch, munch. As usual, Zurara is eating at a tremendous rate. For a little guy, he's the biggest eater at the party, isn't he? Dot I wonder if slimes can get fat from eating too much. When he was carrying the Orichil Kamor. He was about ten times the size of the original. But when he spit it out, he was back to his normal size. The technology of the ancient civilization is a mystery. After finishing our meal, we all decided to return to the inn. Oh, 
Kusama, you may go out for a drink with Iris Sama if you like. Letitia whispered to me teasingly. I'm rooting for the two of you. Come on. Please don't be shy. Dot what in the world are you talking about? Well, well, it's kind of a nice thing to say, isn't it? Letitia poked me in the side with her left hand. Then she declared, Lily Sama, Zurara Sama, we're racing to the inn. And then she ran up the hill in a very energetic manner. Lily and Zurara followed behind her, leaving Iris and me alone. Dot now what? Dot what shall we do? The two of us looked at each other. Honestly, I'd like to take a good night's rest at the inn. I agree with you. I've been working a lot recently, and I'd like to have some time to do nothing at all. Shall we go home then? Yes, yes, let's do that. Iris nodded with a smile on her face and brushed her hair with her right hand. Then she opened her mouth, looking a little more relaxed. Hey, Ku. What is it? I forgot to tell you. Thanks for the spear. You mean the fimbul? Yeah. I was happy to be able to help you. In a way other than as a shield this time. I'm the one who should be thanking you. Iris was there to stop the eruption from happening. I hope I did a little good for you. Of course you did. I answered shortly, and then, on a whim, I asked the question. What are you going to do when this is all over? Dot a. Iris raised her voice as if she were confused. She repeatedly blinked while looking at me. What do you mean? Iris often says you want to repay me, right? That's right. Ku has helped me a lot after all. So, when you're done repaying all the favors, what then? As I asked this question, I felt the ambiguity of the relationship connecting Iris and me. Lily, for example, has been instructed by the god of war religion to accompany me. The composition of the transmigrator, and their god of war's shrine maiden, who accompany together is one clear relationship. However, Iris has not received such instructions from the dragon folk's land, and her role as a Dragon God's Shrine Maiden, has long since ended when she restored the Dragon God's shield. I wonder if Iris will just disappear in a huff once she finishes returning all the favors. For some reason, the thought of that possibility gives me a tightening sensation in my chest. I peeked at her with a sideways glance. Iris noticed my glance and opened her mouth. Dot what about Ku? Iris continued to speak as if she was looking for my reaction. Even if the favor is done. I think I'll still be with you. Dot if it's not too much trouble for you, Ku. There is no way that it would be trouble. Iris is. Iris is an important friend of mine. Normally, I would have told her that. But tonight, I had a strange feeling of discomfort. Without realizing it, I had my eyes fixed on the back of my left hand. It was the spot where I had touched Iris's hand the other night. The temperature at that moment was strangely nostalgic. I don't know why I feel that way. But I'm going to rephrase my answer from earlier. I care about Iris. It doesn't matter how much you owe me. Dot you mean you don't mind me being with you? Yes. I look into her crimson eyes and tell her. I want you to stay with me as long as you don't mind, Iris. Dot yeah. Phew. Iris loosened up her expression. She sighed in relief and then said. Thank you. I can stay here, right? Of course, you can. Iris took a step or two ahead of me and turned around to look back at me. The red hair was dancing in the wind. https colon slash slash nikes translation home dot files dot wordpress dot com slash two thousand and twenty two slash oh six slash oh 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 one eight dot jpg. I also think of you more than anything else. Her face was colored with a very happy smile, and for a few seconds, I was lost in admiration. If I could stop time, I would take this one moment and make it an eternity. That's what I suddenly thought. After returning to the inn, I decided to head for the open air bath on the top floor. What about you, Zurara? Do you want to go with me? I'm a sleepy slime, Supi. I. Zurara seemed to have succumbed to sleepiness and began to sleep on the bed. It would be pitiful to force him to wake up, so let's go alone. I prepared myself and quietly left the room. I walked up the stairs to the fifth floor. There was a waiting lobby and separate men's and women's changing rooms. Of course. I entered the men's locker room. After taking off my clothes and washing my body in the shower room, I walked through the door to the open air bath. Oh, the view from the outdoor bath was quite a sight. You can see the harbor town below, illuminated by the orange magic lights. The sea reflected the moonlight and glistened, and it looked as if a silvery white road stretched out from beyond the horizon. Dot a shooting star. I looked up at the sky and saw a blue meteor streaking through the stars. If you say your wish three times before the shooting star disappears, your wish will come true. I remember hearing such a saying when I was a child, 
but the shooting star disappeared before I could think of what I wished for, very impatient. It's just like Letitia. I think to myself as I soak in the outdoor bath. Letitia Demetia. She is a beautiful woman with long golden hair and was originally the second princess of a northern snow country. However, when her own brother poisoned her food, she regained her memory as a calamity the brilliant and arrogant dragon. However, Letitia does not intend to destroy the world as a calamity and her actions are more aptly described as on the side of justice. She not only exterminated pirates but also actively lent a hand in stopping a volcanic eruption. The reason she is on this journey is to find her younger brother, the gleaming greedy dragon. He has a strong sense of responsibility and is a good-natured person who cannot abandon others in need. He is a greedy who tries to save and protect everything that is related to him. It's hard to believe he's a stranger. The greedy dragon's way of being is a bit sympathetic, but aside from that, it seems that this calamity is also reborn as a human being. Letitia said she has an idea of where he is. But I wonder where on earth he is. I'd like to meet him at least once. When my body was warm, I left the open air bath. I put on my clothes in the changing room and went out to the waiting lobby. Letitia was right there. Her white skin was slightly tinted with vermilion as if she had just finished taking a bath. Oh, Kusama, what a coincidence. Didn't you and Iris go out for a drink? We decided not to go out for a drink today. We talked about taking it easy at the inn once in a while. I see, so that's how it is. That makes sense. Sorry. You had to go out of your way to be so considerate. No, no, number. I did it on my own. Letitia smiled gently with Fufu. Perhaps because she had just finished bathing, her long golden hair was shinier than usual, and her expression was somewhat mature. Although I am older than her, I thought to myself, if I had an older sister, she might look like this. An older sister, huh? It's a good opportunity for me to ask her. By the way, don't you have to see your brother? I thought you said you had an idea where he was. Right. Letitia said this, thought for a while, and then glanced around. In the lobby of the waiting area, there are other guests, though only about three or four. Kusama, why don't we change the place? Dot I would like to talk about something that I don't really want people to hear. I understand. Where do you want to go? Letitia answered, it's cooler today. How about the observation deck next to the inn? I had no problem with that. Letitia and I went down the stairs, through the lobby, and out the front door. There is no curfew at the inn, and it seems that people can come and go anytime they want, 24 hours a day. With our backs to the building, we headed to the right, where we found an observation deck on a wooden deck. The night breeze, impregnated with the scent of the sea, is pleasant. Fortunately, there were no other people around. It was just the two of us. Now, let's talk about the whereabouts of my brother, the greedy dragon. Letitia said, leaning her back against the railing of the observation deck. I have not yet finished thinking about this, so please forgive me if I speak in a roundabout way. Dot Kusama. Do you have the Twilight Scroll? Is this it? I took out the Twilight Scroll from my item box and tilted my head inwardly. What does this scroll have to do with the greedy dragon? Well, it doesn't matter. First, let's hear what Letitia has to say. The Twilight Scroll is a tool to unite the five powers. The Creator God, the God of War, the Dragon God, the Spirit, and the Calamity. The exception is the Creator God since Kushama possesses the creation ability, but the scrolls depict the God of War, the Dragon God, and the Spirit. A Dragon God who blows a horn, a dragon with a shield, and a spirit ring. Right? I answer as I unfold the scroll. Well, the only thing missing is the picture that means calamity, right? Yes. There are no pictures that indicate calamities in general. By the way, Letitia squinted her eyes and pointed to the magic circle drawn in the center of the scroll. The outline of the circle is a combination of a circle and a triangle. Do you know what this magic circle means, Kusama? Meaning? Please look here. When Letitia raised her left hand, a magic circle appeared in the sky. The outline is blurred, so it is hard to tell what kind of figure it is. As I mentioned before, I borrowed some of my abilities from my brother, the greedy dragon. The name is, Storage, and by creating my own warehouse outside the world, I have achieved what may be called an, item box, with unlimited capacity. By the way, Letitia continued. I'm going to unmask the magic circle now. Dot do you recognize this shape? Poof. The outline of the magic circle that had been floating in the void became clear. It is made up of a combination of circles and triangles, 
exactly the same thing that is depicted on the Twilight Scroll. The circle is the symbol of order, and the triangle is the symbol of power. The two dragons, the arrogant dragon and the greedy dragon are the emblems of us. The sister and the brother. Dot wait a minute. I couldn't help but open my mouth. According to Letitia's story, the Twilight Scroll also contains a picture that means a calamity. So far, I understood. However, there is one thing that is still bothering me. I activated the item box. A magic circle appears around my right hand. The magic circle was a combination of a circle and a triangle, and it matched Letitia's. No way. Letitia nodded her head as if she had guessed what I was thinking. Just after Kusama created the mine, Tidal Sama said this, didn't he? Changing, evolving, or growing the things that are related to you. That may be the unique ability of Kudono. In fact, there is the exact same ability that is unique to the greedy dragon, awakening the power to cause out of the box change, evolution, or growth. Dot of course, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Dot yeah, out of the norm is kind of synonymous with me, and there are quite a few things that come to mind, such as the level increases that continue even beyond three digits and the expanded functionality of creation, and summoning calamity. As I was reflecting on the events to date, Letitia said, there are other reasons, but to be honest, I had been thinking maybe ever since I heard the rumors about Kusama. That is one of the reasons I agreed to accompany you on your journey. Dot have you come to a conclusion? Yes. Letitia smiled nostalgically yet affectionately. You are very kind, Kusama. You can't abandon people in need, and you try to save and protect everything and everyone in sight. It's so wonderful, Dot even though you were missing the memory of being a calamity, you were still you. Weren't you? Letitia told me. You are Kukazuka, the calamity called from outside this world, the guardian of all life, the natural enemy of all life, a calamity that kills calamities. The endless evolution and growth that eats God, reaches God, and eventually surpasses God the gleaming greedy dragon. And my precious little brother, 